Welcome to APEC. It's January 20th, and I am your moderator, Tim Ventura. I want to thank everybody for joining us on today's call, along with everybody watching us on YouTube. In today's session, Kurt Zeller presents on space-time engineering. Curtis Horn discusses the sachs dirac matter field equations. Christopher Mailer describes his research into a quantum-based warp core and we are expecting John Brandenburg to present his revised model of the nuclear holocaust on Mars. He may or may not be able to attend, so we're not sure about John, but we are hoping that he will be able to be here with us. Also, we're going to be hearing updates from our lab partners and finishing off the event with an open discussion by conference attendees. I am really excited. 2024 is starting out amazing. We have research going on, especially with our lab teams. Everything is moving forward. There is so much work being done. So many results are being produced. It is just incredibly exciting and gratifying to see. So let, let me congratulate everybody in our community. A couple of quick updates before we begin. Today's event uses StreamYard. We're broadcasting through the Alt Propulsion YouTube channel. We're also rebroadcasting on the Alien Science channel. Check us out. You can visit um, altpropulsion.com to see our channel. Visit alienscientist.com to visit that one. You can ask questions using the live chat feature on the right-hand side of the page, and we will try and ask them to our presenters, depending on time constraints. Uh, you can always view replays of this, details and speaker info on our website at altpropulsion.com. So I want to get into our first presenter. I am pleased and honored to introduce you to Kurt Zeller, who's going to be talking about space-time engineering. Essentially, the gravitational electromagnetic analogy postulates that our gravitational field is composed of two components, a, gra a gravitoelectric field and a gra gravitomagnetic field. And so he is going to be discussing those as well as the potential astronomical implications of them. So without any further ado, I'm going to bring Kurt on. There we go. Welcome, right. sir. Thank you, Tim. Welcome, to, welcome to APEC. Yeah, well, thank you. It is a pleasure and an honor to have you with me. Uh, let me put up your slide deck if I can. There we All go. Right. And you should be able to navigate that yourself. So what I'm going to do is mute myself out. I will be here if you have any questions or anything like that. And uh, I would say take it away, sir. All right. Thank you. Yeah, excited to be here. Uh, excited to talk. I've got... Um, not that many slides, so we'll see. Uh, I'll try to slow down, take it slow. Uh, some of the objectives here, um, you know, I really just want to provide a top level view of this gravitomagnetism. Um, you know, frame dragging is another name for it. Uh, we'll talk about some of the experimental anomalies surrounding that might be related to this effect, uh, propose potentially some next steps um, for an experiment. And my idea here is really to stimulate discussion, you know, figure out is this idea worth pursuing? Uh, you know, I'm looking for honest feedback. And so I don't think this is going to take the full hour. I'm hoping maybe 30 minutes, maybe 40 minutes, and maybe we'll save the rest for some open discussion and uh, you guys can give me some honest feedback. Um, so an outline of the, the talk, you know, I'll start with it about me um, and just kind of how I got into this topic and, and what my career is in, uh, sort of the perspective that I'm coming to the table with. Uh, I'll talk about motivation, which I think is probably the same for many people uh, that are, um, uh, in this in this community, uh, UFOs. We'll talk about obviously gravitational magnetism, the evidence, potential implications, um, and then sort of the fundamental theory that I'm getting at, which is not new. Most of this stuff is not new, but perhaps I'm putting a new perspective on it, uh, coming from an, a microwave engineering background, and um, some of the relevant experimental anomalies that might be hinting at the um, uh, the, the fundamental phenomenon. And then uh, we'll have some discussion. All right, so about me, EM drive at Cal Poly. So I studied aerospace engineering at Cal Poly Slow um, from 2012 to 2016. And I, you know, I was studying rocket science and I got pretty fed up with it, you know, because you're not going to get to other star systems with rockets. I think that's pretty obvious. Um, so NASA at the time, NASA Eagle Works, was testing this uh, asymmetric resonant cavity. And if you're not familiar, it's this frustum shaped, um, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but you've got this frustum shaped um 
uh, our conical shaped copper cavity where you're putting microwaves in, they're resonating. And uh, the idea was that you're pushing off the fabric of space time or perhaps emitting some sort of quantum vacuum plasma. Uh, you know, Harold White and um, a couple others were, Paul March were working on this. And, um, you know, they're getting results and they couldn't explain them. And so as an undergrad, I um, got really interested in the topic. I participated a lot in the NASA uh, Space Forum, uh, which I, I know a lot of the people in this community also were around there at that time and maybe still are today. Um, so I taught myself how to do, you know, electromagnetic simulations and use, using EM Pro, sort of a, a free software for students. Um, I, I took apart a lot of microwave oven magnetrons and I took out one of the antennas, basically made a homemade magnetron antenna. We raised a little SMA port to a magnetron antenna and uh, we're able to hook that up to a VNA to uh, a ve vector network analyzer to basically measure the resonance of this tunable cylindrical cavity. So you see in the middle here, we've got this cylindrical resonant cavity. We made it asymmetric by using like a, a dielectric loading. So instead of having the shape be a conical shape, which is really hard to tune. We made a cylindrical shape and we're able to tune that um, using a plunger, basically. And uh, you know, this is funded by the university. We got a small grant to do this, me and a, another student, uh, a friend of mine. And, um, you know, we were able to borrow a lot of equipment from the university. And uh, we used a laser position sensing detector to basically reflect off of a mirror. And uh, the, all in all, it came out to a thrust stand that could detect about two millinewtons reliably. You can see on the oscilloscope here, we've got that that green kind of oscillation is actually just noise uh, on the order of, I think, less than a millinewton or so. Um, and so, yeah, so we could reliably detect about two millinewtons. And uh, but, you know, it's well the surprise here. The experimental outcome, thermal expansion of the leads was the problem. We don't have an onboard power supply. We're plugging this in externally. We thought this pendulum, maybe we could orient the wires so that we don't have that issue. But basically, every time we fired it up, whether it was on resonance, whether it was off resonance, didn't actually uh, have the effect that we were going for. We couldn't isolate the effect that we wanted to see. So could not see the anomalous thrust, but um, that turned me from a microwave engineer or an aerospace engineer into a microwave engineer. Uh, so that led to my first career um, move, which was um, doing microwave plasma reactors. So this is kind of just uh, a new technology to basically convert natural gas, methane, into carbon and hydrogen, which has a lot of applications. You can make different types of carbons. You can make the carbon more graphitic. You can make the carbon more like graphene. Um, right now, we actually have a pilot that's uh, deployed in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And um, you know, we're working to scale the technology and deploy it in other applications. And um, so that's all of this to say is, you know, this is my kind of real career. This is where I'm coming from uh, when I when I present this gravitomagnetism stuff. Um, I also had a few years working at General Atomics doing nuclear fusion. Got to visit ITER in 2022, which is pretty amazing. The scale of that place is uh, mind boggling. But, um, you know, at, at General Atomics, I got very experienced with COMSOL multiphysics, which I'll talk about a little bit more later and uh, designed a lot of new electron cyclotron heating equipment, which is basically really high power microwaves at really high frequency. Um, and while I was at General Atomics, they had an open pitch fest. So they invited anybody to come out, out with their wild ideas and uh, they said that they would fund somebody. And um, so I worked really hard to put together a pitch for what I thought would be the best theory for anti-gravity or you know, space-time engineering. And um, so that's kind of where this presentation sort of was born. And I've, I've done a little bit of refinement to present to you today. But um, yeah, I, did, I got runner up in the competition, did not win, unfortunately. I think they thought it was a little bit too out there, even though that's what they wanted. But, you know, that's how it goes. Um, so motivation, uh, you know, unidentified aerial phenomenon. I think that we're all on the same page here. Um, you know, this is straight from the DIA report, uh, director of national or DNI report that basically says, you know, these things have appeared to demonstrate advanced technology. They move at considerable speed without discernible means of propulsion, you know, no thermal signature on these IR videos. Um, you know, these things are moving, you know, we've got pilot witnesses talking about, you know, craft moving at 90 degree angles, pulling massive amounts of G's accelerating instantaneously. Uh, all of these are, con are consistent, <clears throat> excuse me with space-time engineering. 
i.e. gravity field modification. Uh, so some sort of space-time warping is going on. I think there's pro uh, you know, ample evidence that this is a real thing. The question is, how do you do it? Um, and so that's been my real, I don't know, hobby, passion for a long time. And yeah, so let's talk about sort of the theory about how that could work. So uh, it kind of comes back to frame dragging, which is the same thing as gravito magnetism. So this goes back to Einstein's time, you know, lens and theory derived frame dragging from general relativity. And it took us until about 2004 to actually measure this with a high degree of certainty. And um, so, you know, I think it was Gravity Probe B and, and uh, a couple other satellites, as well as now we've got quasar measurements that are measuring this effect. And basically what this says is that the curvature of space time depends on mass and velocity components. So it's not just your static rest mass. It's also the movement of that mass relative to other mass. So the angular momentum vector. Uh, creates a warping of space-time that is similar or uh, similar to um, the magnetic field created uh, when an electric charge moves through space. Um, some of the differences is you've got a negative sign. So instead of like charges attracting each other, um, or, or sorry, instead of like charges repelling each other, like you do in, uh, you know, with, when you have two electrons, you've got like charges attracting each other and that charge is now mass. And, um, and obviously we've got this gravito magnetic field, which is orders of magnitude um, smaller than G. And so that's the big challenge here is, okay, so we've measured this effect. The problem is it's tiny, you know, that's why it took us so long to actually reliably measure it. And if that's the case, how could we possibly use this to do anything useful? Um, so, Oh, wow, something's got blown out of proportion here. All right, so on the left here, we've got electromagnetism, which everybody should be familiar with, you know, Maxwell's equations. Uh, you've got your Lorentz force. So when you've got current moving through a wire, it creates a magnetic field, according to the right-hand rule. Um, and you know, you've got an electromagnetic impedance of free space. So when you design an antenna, it needs to be able to radiate properly to its environment. Um, and so the analogy suggests that gravitation um, acts in the same way. You know, you've got gravito electromagnetism is basically saying that your gravito electric field is just like your Newtonian gravity and your gravito magnetic field is your weak component of gravity. And it's not the same force as a magnetic field. It is uh, just an analogous uh, analogy. So um, you, that it, within the analogy, you should have a gravito magnetic Lorentz force. You should have a gravito magnetic pointing vector. You should have um, gravito magnetic impedance of free space. And I'll come back to that in a bit. But uh, basically, this gravito magnetic field comes from angular momentum. So, uh, you know, at every scale, if anything has angular momentum, it is going to create a gravito magnetic field. And this is actually according to the left hand rule, which I find kind of intuitively satisfying that this would be the, uh, the relationship between, you know, mass sort of interpreting it as a charge and looking at it uh, with respect to electromagnetism. But of course, I'm going to say that as the microwave engineer. Um, it seems very, uh, it seems like a nice way to, uh, to, to formulate everything. Okay. So, uh, you know, I, I talked in the intro, I, I, you know, I did mention that I wanted to look at astronomical implications or cosmological implications, but, you know, in doing some more research and preparation for this talk, I was actually a little bit stumped. Uh, you know, there are a few papers out there that suggest, uh, you know, like this one from Ludwig, who says that, hey, if we include gravito magnetic equations in our galactic rotation calculations, we can potentially explain some of these dark matter um, observations. So instead of these anom this anomalous galactic rotation being responsible or being caused by dark matter, you know, this invisible stuff that we can't measure that's distributed very specifically throughout most galaxies, but not all, um, you know, maybe that is actually the movement of the galaxy itself that is pulling the galaxy together. And we don't need any dark matter, you know, um, uh, sort of correction factor to include. Um, but then I dug into a little bit further and I found examples that refute this idea, like NGC 1277 is a rel relic galaxy in the Perseus cluster. It's dark matter deficient, you know, what, much less than you would expect and um, compared to most galaxies, but it's also a very fast rotator. So that kind of threw a wrench into this idea. 
And I'd say maybe there's something there. And I'm not a cosmologist. I'm not an astrophysicist. So, you know, this is just me reading a bunch of scientific papers, trying to figure out what's going on. Um, and my conclusion here is there is no conclusion to be made yet. So Gravita magnetic interpretation might be a partial explanation for dark matter, or it might it probably does affect galactic rotation. It probably does affect the movement of stars. But uh, I think that saying that dark matter is fully explained by this is probably a bit presumptuous. So I think there's uh, interesting research to be done here. And I hope that more people look into this because I think that there's probably something there that we're missing. Um, so then it comes down to what about uh, at the quantum level? So if we can, if we say that gra the gravitational field can be affected by gravitomagnetic induction. So if we can change an angular momentum, then we can uh, you know, create a gravitational field. Uh, well, why don't we look at the quantum level? A material, you know, if you think about it, has intrinsic angular momentum in the form of quantum spin. You know, every atom in any given material has a quantum spin number, unless that spin number is zero. Uh, but, uh, or not, I, I feel like uh, I, could, I could be wrong here. That might not actually be zero. But anyway, um, you know, it's different different atoms and different isotopes have different spin numbers that are sort of ground state. Um, and so um, really the idea is that not all vectors within a material are aligned. And if they are, they're not changing in time. And so if you could align all of the atomic uh, angular momentum vectors within a lattice across an entire material, and you could drive a time rate of spin or a time rate of change of that atomic spin number, and then you could also consider the macroscopic emission of gravitons or gravitational waves from that material that is matched to the ambient you know, impedance of free space, then potentially you could uh, leverage this effect to produce an appreciable field. Um, and you know, I think that last point, uh, that, electromagnetic, that we need some sort of gravitational antenna is perhaps the interpretation that a lot of people uh, that I haven't seen out there except for only a few papers. Um, so I've only found a couple of examples where people even attempted to simulate a gravita magnetic field and it's never, you know, at a smaller scale, it's always like a black hole or something like that. Um, so as you can see the example here, but, um, you know, what would a structure look like that could interface with the, you know, we're basically live, living in a capacitor, if you think about it from the electromagnetic analogy perspective, or the, you know, Earth is like a capacitor. And um, how, how do you create uh, an, a, a, gra a gravitomagnetic oscillation that will interface with that capacitor to cancel off the fields um, that you're subject to? Um, so that's kind of the essence of the theory. Uh, one of the big questions is, is the, does the order of magnitude kind of math check out? So you could look at the gravitomagnetic field at the center of a spinning disk, you know, a macroscopic spinning disk. Um, let's say a one kilogram mass, you know, is orbiting at a 0.1 meter radius at one megahertz, so ridiculously fast speed. The gravitomagnetic field you could create is 10 to the minus 18, so like tiny very, you know, no, you, nothing you could do with that. And then you need to be able to change that angular momentum uh, with time. And so the, you know, obviously you've got, you've got G's that you, your material is going to experience. And so that's just not really uh, a viable idea. Um, the micros macroscopic angular momentum of a spinning disk is just not enough. Uh, but if we assume, as the big assumption here, that quantum spin and classical angular momentum are equivalent, then, okay, maybe we're onto something. So let's think about bismuth 209. And I don't pick bismuth 209 out of the blue. You know, I've done a lot of reading in the UFO lore and bismuth seems to come up a lot. I'm not sure if there's anything really there, but you know, it seems like a great candidate for this theory because it has a very high ground state spin. And so uh, you could think of a one kilogram mass has an angular intrinsic angular momentum on the order of 10 to the minus 10th joule seconds. Um, you could calculate its you know, moment of inertia. You could think about each atom having some radius spinning around some center axis. Um, and then you could figure out what that, what that orbital frequency is, which is ridiculously high. Um, so you could think of, hey, each atom is actually has a, an associated gravitomagnetic field associated with it. Um, so if you had every atom within a one kilogram material aligned, you would have actually a reasonable sized gravitomagnetic field. And if you could change that with time, 
that suggests that you could create a uh, gravitoelectric, aka gravitational field. Um, and over here, we've got you know the cartoon illustration of bismuth 209 sort of orbit wobbling around some center axis. And um, you know this, this this idea that you could use quantum angular momentum to affect the gravitational field is not new. This isn't something I came up with on my own. Uh, this is, you know, a lot of people have suggested a link between superconductivity and gravitation. Um, I think one of the most prominent in there is, is uh, Ning Li, Douglas Tor had a series of experiments back in papers back in the 90s. Um, you know, I took this quote directly out of that because it's really the essence of the theory. Coherent alignment of lattice ions spins will generate a detectable gravitomagnetic field and in the presence of a time-dependent applied in the pre and in the presence of a time-dependent applied magnetic vector potential, a detectable gravito electric field. Um, and you know they've got this really big derivation that basically says you know when you align all of the uh, angular momentum vectors of these lattice ions, or you can think of the nuclei, you know nucleons of a material have the same alignment of angular momentum vectors. Uh, you're basically, you could think of it as changing the gravitomagnetic permeability of that material. Whereas, you know, when you have a magnetic material, you've got alignment of uh, electron spin. You know, a magnetic material has all these electrons that are oriented in the same direction with their spin. But a gravitomagnetic material has all of the nucleons uh, with their alignment of spin. And so, um, you know, there, this, this derivation is not without criticism. There are a lot of assumptions that go into it. This paper, you know, is one criticism. Uh, I wouldn't claim to really have the mathematics or physics background to uh, to, to stand on either one of these, but it seems like this might be <clears throat> an area worth uh, further investigation. Uh, at the same time, Lee had an experiment in 1997 that was inconclusive, and so that didn't really lend much screens to there. But then I know the story goes on. Lee was given some grant from I think DARPA and kind of went dark. And so we don't really know what happened to her research. Um, we don't really know if there was actually anything there. Uh, you could go on and talk about the pod Kletnov experiments, which is a bit of a rabbit hole, so I'm not gonna really dive into that. But you know, basically spinning superconductors, emitting gravitational fields, or causing a gravitational anomaly. Um, I actually had a professor in college that uh, tried to replicate that experiment like many years ago when pod Kletnov first introduced this idea. And he was not very keen on, uh, he was actually the same professor that helped me with the EM drive. And he was not very keen on Pod Kletnov because of his reluctance to help them replicate the, um, uh, the actual aspects of the superconducting disk. I guess Pod Kletnov was a little bit shaky on some of those details, but that's just word of mouth. I don't really know. Um, and then you've got Martin Tajmar, who's done a lot of great work in this field, uh, you know, did, um, I think gravitomagnetic detection of a London moment or something to that effect, basically induced acceleration fields on the order of micrograms that were correlated with the angular acceleration of a, of a superconductor. Um, you've got the Ni niobium cooper pair mass anomaly from Tate, uh, which is another interesting, like very thin film superconductor uh, measuring the, um, the mass of that, of, of what they would expect the niobium cooper pairs to be versus what they measured. And uh, there was some sort of, there was quite a, a large deviation there. Um, and then you've got other sort of maybe related papers, enhanced induction into distant coils, um, you know, things that seem like they might be related, but I'm not actually sure. Um, so basically what I'm trying to say here is that the idea that I'm presenting here isn't new, uh, but it seems like we're missing something. It seems like there's, you know, we're, we're missing a little replication. Um, and perhaps that's because, uh, the way that we're thinking about it is incomplete. And I think my sort of thesis here is maybe that that thing that we're missing is kind of the impedance matching to free space. You know, we, we need to think of this as a gravitomagnetic antenna that is emitting a field that needs to interact with the field around it. Um, you know, I can, I can imagine designing a very poor antenna and, you know, exciting electrons in the right way, but actually reflecting all of that electromagnetic energy back to source because I didn't design it correctly to impedance match to free space. And so you could probably do the same thing with a gravitational antenna. Um, and so that's kind of what we're getting at here. Um, I tossed this slide in here. Yeah, I think uh, properties is type two superconductors. This is kind of what I think is the, 
the best uh, avenue or the, to, the best avenue to actually engineer this effect. So if you wanted to align the angular momentum of all, all, all these um, lattice ions, as Ning Li says, um, you, you probably need to look at superconductors because you can achieve coherent phase of all of the atoms in a material. You can also drive uh, what they call Abrikasov vortices, which is like little supercurrents that are spinning around in circles. And um, you know these supercurrents can be uh, on the order of tens of nano, or uh, they, they can be on the order of tens of atoms in diameter to you know, uh, you know fifty atoms in diameter. And so perhaps you could imagine stimulating a pretty large percentage of the atoms uh, using this uh, supercurrent, basically driving that angular momentum up and down. Um, and so uh, there are some papers that suggest the Meissner effect requires this linear combination of magnetic and curvature magnetic potential to vanish. Um, there, and there are other papers that suggest a transient gravitational fluctuation should be detectable, uh, which kind of derives this from, you know, Ginsburg Landau equations and a lot of fancy math. Um, basically, this slide is trying to say, hey, this coherence of lattice ion angular momentum uh, could increase your gravita magnetic permeability. Um, perhaps we need to look at superconductors in this uh, kind of vortex regime. Um, and perhaps those superconducting materials in the vortex regime need to be made of uh, atoms and or isotopes that have the uh, kind of spin characteristics that, you know, a large ground state spin that can be enhanced, that can be throttled up and down. Um, so recently, and I actually discovered this was um, pre uh, preparing this presentation for, for this talk here, is uh, Tajmar published a paper last year that um, anomalous force measurements from a Cooper pair, which was a null result, unfortunately, um, you know, he, he basically put a supercurrent through a high temperature superconductor within a cryostat in a vacuum chamber. Uh, he's got a setup that can measure on the order of 100 nanonewtons. So that is the best resolution I've ever seen for a thrust stand. Um, and it seems very well characterized and very well put together. He's got an onboard battery system. He's got the ability to apply you know, decently high magnetic fields. Unfortunately, he did not observe a thrust with his, um, with his experiment, but you know, maybe there are some reasons that it didn't work. I mean, he had a DC electronic stimulation. He didn't have a time rate of change of the nuclear spin. He's just pushing current through. Um, he's got potentially a lack, lack of gravita magnetic impedance matching to the surroundings. Um, he's got a large thickness of superconductor, which, you know, I've seen a lot of places, uh, the Tate Cooper pair mass anomaly had a very thin superconductor on the order of microns. Um, we've also got other observations or other papers that talk about, um, the thickness being uh, very important to, um, seeing this effect. So this paper specifically says that um, if, you, if you generalize the Ginsburg-Landau equations with the gravito electric and gravito magnetic components, um, and you look at uh, the, the, uh, the situation where you're close to the second critical magnetic field, so you're in that vortex regime, and you've got a maximum coherence length, you can run the math. This is a paper study. Um, and you can say, hey, well, uh, we could potentially predict a transient um, fluctuation in gravitational field. And so the, basically the conclusion of this paper is that you would want to ma minimize the thickness of your superconductor to find a larger effect, but for a shorter time. And so then you would imagine that you would need to oscillate this effect uh, to, or pulse, or, you know, continue to um, stimulate so that you could see the effects at steady state. Um, or maybe you design your setup so that you can detect that, you know, very quick pulse. Um, so all of this to say, uh, oh, and then we've also got this meta material of extraterrestrial origin, which I find kind of interesting because, you know, we've got this, uh, well, it's claimed to be an atomically engineered material from To The Stars Academy, you know, Tom DeLonge and many others, um, which is pretty interesting. Uh, we've got micron thick alternating layers of bismuth and magnesium. So there's bismuth again. Um, we've got magnesium positive ions that are enhanced 60 times more than typical. An article from uh, Linda Howe. I didn't um, find like a any kind of study article or or I don't know scientific paper backing that claim up. So that'd be cool to see data from that. Um, same as the next one, material acts as a waveguide at terahertz frequencies. That was uh, from To the Stars Academy website. They kind of just threw that in there and didn't have any kind of source. And I thought, hey, that's kind of 
like a big deal. If you can make a waveguide out of magnesium zinc, uh, that would be, that's worth, you know, a, a publishing. Um, you know, as me coming from the microwave engineering side, looking at, you know, electron cyclotron resonance um, waveguides, you know, high frequency waveguides for fusion. Um, you know, I know waveguides pretty well, and I couldn't find anything related to magnesium zinc waveguides at terahertz frequencies. That would be pretty cool. Um, you can imagine that maybe, uh, so, oh, so I put together a little simple console model just to illustrate a terahertz waveguide, and it's on the right order of magnitude when it's air filled. So you can imagine if your magnesium zinc was somehow a dielectric, which I'm not sure how that works, uh, but if that if that had a dial high dielectric constant, then those weight those those dimensions would shrink, and you'd be on the order of you know tens, hundreds of microns. Um, and I guess this is maybe if, if this is related to a warp drive at all, this this material, this claim, then maybe the size scale of the atomic vortical oscillations is an important aspect of it. Um, I'm not sure, but I found this kind of interesting. Possibly related, possibly not. Um, so I'm not sure how things got highlighted. I wasn't intended to all be highlighted, but anyway. Um, so yeah, so I think the proposed next steps, I think Dr. Tajmar has like a state of the art test apparatus and just needs a better test article. Um, you know, he's got the, the nano Newton resolution thrust stand. He's got the ability to put cryogenics, you know, bring your, your superconductor down to cryogenic temperatures. He's got the ability to apply high magnetic field strengths. Um, all of the ingredients that you need to actually test this effect, uh, you know, he's got, he, we, we really just need to design the right test article. So maybe that requires proper selection of the superconducting material, considering the elemental and isotopic composition. Um, you know, looking at that ground state nuclear spin, um, thinking about the microscopic lattice structure alignment. So if you've got, you know, grain boundaries in your material and some of your material is oriented this way and some is that way, it's likely uh, not going to be a good emitter of gravitational waves. Um, <laughs> uh, test article excitation, you know, magnetic stimulation. So, you know, what what kind of magnetic stimulation, what what time rate of change do you need in the um, uh, in the RF excitation? Do you, um, you know, what, what regime of the type two superconductor do you want? Do you want actually that transition region right between type one and type two superconducting phases. Um, and, you know, it's probably something to be said about the penetration depth uh, and also the thickness of your material. So as you know, my, the Meissner effect, you know, magnetic fields within the material, within the superconducting bulk will cancel out and you have some penetration depth. So that's probably something to uh, keep in mind. Um, and then there's the test article macroscopic characteristics. So, you know, you need to design a gravitational antenna, some sort of radiation pattern, something that's going to couple outside of the body itself. Um, and so, you know, I've been able to get gravitational acceleration of a moon earth system and COMSOL, you know, uh, using like the partial differential equation solver. I haven't figured out how to do the gravitomagnetic side of things. And that's kind of been on my to-do list for a while. I haven't figured it out yet, but uh, being a COMSOL guy, it's a fun little side project for me. So I think I'll, I'll get there eventually. But um, for now, that is that is my talk. Thank you. Kurt, thank you. Thank you, man. You know what? Let me bring everybody in here. We need to give you an enormous applause. I'm going to pop everybody onto the stage here. Let me take down your slide deck. Now, you had you actually had another slide deck. Did you have more to do there? I'm going to add everybody in. We need to give... Uh, let me see. Let's give Kurt Zeller an enormous, enormous applause. I have a couple of folks who don't have their cameras on. Hang on. Let's get SoCal in there. Mark, or I, I haven't seen you clap. Mark is co-hosting with me. You look tired. Okay. So. Yeah. Should we, should we do Q and A? Do you want to do Q and A? I have a question. Uh, that was interesting. That was that was amazing. So I have a few questions. If I could uh, um, present those. Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, we, we've got okay. we have some time. So, yeah, go for it, Alex. So my first initial question is, um, I'm sorry. 
what what was your name? Because I came in a little late. I, I just want to make sure I'm addressing you correctly. Oh, respectfully. Kurt Zeller. Uh, you just call me okay. Kurt. So, Kurt. Okay. So I was curious, from a perspective of, I know a lot of PhDs who specialize in vocabulary used in um various disciplines, and I'm curious how you define gravitomagnetic versus electromagnetic. Is it just the fact that it's intertwined with gravity um, and you're just expanding on that? Um, because I'm just, I'm just a little curious how you define that. Equation, I'm not trying right? to, to rub you the wrong way or anything. Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. So gravitomagnetic- the Q with an M when the- Well, the more equation. just the vocabulary. Um, yeah. So we're looking at this as four fundamental forces. You've got electric, magnetic. Yeah, exactly. So I'm, I'm just curious about that. Gravitomagnetic. So you can think of the gra gravitomagnetic as really just an attempt to uh, make that link that, oh, hey, if electric charge moving causes a magnetic field, mass charge moving causes a gravitomagnetic field. So it's really just building on the analogy. That's a great that explanation. Sense? And I think you'll see <clears throat> when we present the metamaterials we have, it does align with a lot of the interesting technical details um, of the unknown material you were speaking of. And not only that, but it is very well known that, oh, well, not, not very well known actually, but you can do calculations with uh, non-Euclidean math, which is what we've been doing with the metamaterials, which clearly shows what you said, the vectors um, affecting space time, dark matter, dark energy, energy, gravity, um and uh the relativity uh, and uh i think there's one more i woke up a couple hours ago but those are all gonna connect with each other they're all gonna <clears throat> have interplay between the vectors where you can clearly see if you have non-euclidean math where it factors in the fourth dimension how gravity is affecting things like time how it's affecting things like em dark matter and a lot um, you know, electromagnetic energy. And I would love to give you some of those equations because it's really easy. You just, you put in the parameters for whatever measurements you got on EM. It'll directly show, you know, how, how that's affecting time, how that's affecting every other gravity affecting constant, which is <clears throat> very clearly able to be defined based off of the things you were saying. So I'd like to talk to you after. That's very interesting. And the stuff you said based on the actual hard materials engineering is very accurate. And I was kind of freaking out on the backstage thing because you did fantastic and, and are going definitely in the right direction. Cool. Thank you. Yeah, I'm going to drop my email in the chat. So feel free to reach out. Um, I'd love to engage in, in more discussion on this. Will do. Awesome. Will do. Thanks, Alex. Uh, so let me see. Does anybody else have questions? You guys have questions for Kurt? Mark, go for it, sir. Okay, Kurt. Um, great presentation. Have you heard of the Alzheimer experiment? Dynamic nuclear orientation? I'm sorry. I'm having a hard time hearing you. Can you get closer to the um, microphone? Uh, have you heard of the Alzheimer experiment with dynamic nuclear orientation? I think I've heard of it. I haven't really looked into it. Alzafon? Yeah, Frederick Alzafon, he, he describes a process called dynamic nuclear orientation, basically orienting subatomic uh, particle spins. I have heard I, of them. I actually was in touch with them, trying to do an experiment with them in collaboration with General Atomics, but it, that kind of fell through. They wanted money, and General Atomics didn't want to pay anything. <laughs> oh, okay. Yes, I actually been replicating it for the past couple of years. We got some oh, positive really? results over the past weekend and um in the process of getting those positive results i left the machine the traveling wave tube amplifier on for a bit too long and i think i fried it so uh, i'm wondering if, if if you have any um if you could be of any help with traveling wave tube amplifiers i can't say i have any direct experience but uh maybe i don't know Feel free to reach out. I'm definitely, you know, available to, to pitch in and maybe just at least lend some some feedback or connections. I have a lot of connections that people do that do RF source development at General Atomics, who one of them did his PhD actually creating a, something similar to a traveling wave tube. So maybe I could pick, pick his brain a little bit and, um, and help you fix it or, or diagnose. Uh, 
Well, and Kurt, if if I could interject, so uh, Mark has been showing me uh, over the last few weeks. He has he's using LabVIEW to track this, and during the lab time, maybe he can put some of that up. He's he's getting some pretty amazing results. I mean, I'm going into 2024. I'm really pumped up. I know, like that's like kind of my job, right? I'm cheerleading, but I mean, I I mean it. I'm seriously pumped up about this stuff. So. Um, Mark, do you think you might be able to do that during lab time? Show folks some of the like, um, lab use. Yeah, stuff, pro or? probably in a couple hours from now. I got a couple, I got some stuff to do, but at like seven p.m. Eastern, I should yeah. be at the lab to give you guys yeah. an update. Yeah, this is it. This is it, it, this year is exciting. It is exciting, and it's not. It's not like it's coming from nowhere. This is like what I'm seeing is people have been doing. They've been buckled down. They've been doing hard work and it's moving forward and we're starting to see results. Right. And like, you know, like Drew and Charlie Bueller, they did that presentation. You know, this is years of work for them, but it is paying off and it's generating results and it's just amazing. So. Yeah, this came out of the pandemic. And so we've just all been buckled down at home and the lockdowns and, and all us nerds had nothing better to do. So. Yeah. Well, let me see. Uh, do, does anybody else have? Yeah. yeah, go for it, um, man. So, and I should have written this down. Um, I had one question about this. Uh, so, terahertz metamaterials might be one way to do some of this stuff. Uh, these, these layered um, nanomaterials of different uh, varying uh, lengths. But what about um, the idea of uh, a quasi crystal? Because uh, you could have eight-dimensional quasi-crystals with eight-fold symmetry, and they have hyper-dimensional symmetries. Um, so there was a question about, you know, interdimensionalism, and uh, if the, you know, I was just trying to think of anything physical that we could actually use to experiment with to test some of these hypotheses. And I remembered that, you know, Ed Fouché a long time ago had said um, that quasi-crystals were the trick to how the alien saucers work uh, which take it for what it's worth uh, but you know there are some interesting optical properties of quasi crystals as well uh, but I just uh, I wonder I wonder about this um, this material and if uh, indeed you said about the chamber that Tajmar has over at the European Space Agency <clears throat> what about what if we could get in touch with Gary Nolan and get that piece of material over to Tajmar to test in that facility. Thank you. Yeah, it's an interesting idea. Um, I'm not very familiar with quasi crystals or, or eight fold symmetry, so um, I'd have to look into that. But um, and I think Tajmar is is uh, located in Dresden, so I'm not sure if he's associated with ESA at all. But um, yeah, I think you know I've I've spoken with Tajmar personally before, and he's very receptive to you know people. That are interested in working with them, collaborators, and so I think that if we had a compelling enough design for something, he would probably be willing to test it. And and especially given the amount of work he's put into the test apparatus and the tone in his paper being a little bit disappointed that he didn't see anything, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if he would be open to a new test article. Right. Can I um, comment on that? Quick, I have a. So what my question would be, I well, the way I look at higher dimensional math, which is the thing I'm very familiar with, is observed, um, like like relative measurements might not have any effect on how an actual higher dimensional structure or, or anything like that would operate. I'm just curious how you correlate or how you would correlate when engineering the expected results versus the relative results of perception and, and, and how that's affecting it. Because you could seem as though you were mimicking um, higher dimensions as, as I'm sorry, uh, what's this guy? Jimmy Rice said above me, with the engineering patterns, like the geometry of, of, of and I'm just kind of like lattices and stuff can clearly mimic multiple dimensions, but how do you know that's translating to what it is in reality is what I'm curious about. But that's been a huge engineering solve for me, accounting for the fact that those things are imperceptible and I may just be accounting for what I can see and what I can measure. Um, so I'm just kind of curious about that. Because 
even though the structure of the crystals could possibly relate to what you're talking about, higher dimensional structures or whatever, how do you know that it's actually relating to that while accounting for relativity and perception and stuff? Because it, you could do that with energy outputs. You could do that with the, the measurements you're getting. But without being able to account for that, it seems fruitless to me. Because the humans have limitations in that. Um, but I'm just curious. I'm not trying to like put you on the spot. I'm just curious how you account for the fact that there are imperceptible measurements as well that cannot be accounted for. Um, is it like what? What would you do about that? Um, I'm not. I'm not sure to be honest with you. Um, uh, imperceptible measurements don't sound like uh, an outcome that's worth uh, pursuing because if it's imperceptible, then what use is it to us? Um, so I would say that you're just figuring out how to make it perceptible um, exactly. because um, even though you can't perceive them, they're still constants. You know that like uh, gravity-wise and dimensionally, they're like I think the main engineering solve would be figuring out how to account for the fact you can't perceive a lot of those things. And like I said, I'm not trying to call you out. I'm just curious about how that process would be worked towards or, or anything. Because things with dark matter, we can use the interplay between how it's affecting gravity and how it's affecting time to get the measurements on what, you know, that dark matter, which we're still not even sure of, is likely doing. So how, what's the equivalent of that um, with what you're doing? Not sure. I'm not sure I have a good answer for that. Yeah. Well, no, no, that's, a, that's an honest and good answer. So, sorry, I was okay. just curious. Go ahead. Yeah. L let let me go. Like yeah, let me go to Curtis Horn. Curtis, Curtis had a question. Curtis, go for it, sir. Hey there, Kurt. Hey guys. Um, so I noticed you're you're using Comsol, and uh, my question was: Were you trying to um, figure out if there'd be a uh, a response a uh, um, or 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 a thrust with the console model, or were you just using that to kind of uh, get a, a understanding of the material? Yeah, so I think one of you know one of the core theories or, or core components of my theory is that you kind of need uh, this gravitational antenna. So, and in console, you can arbitrarily change material properties. So if you can Im Im input these gravitomagnetic equations into console, they look just like Maxwell's equations and Comsol is great at solving Maxwell's equations. So uh, really you're just then changing material properties to be whatever you want. And if you you know could imagine the gravitomagnetic permeability of your material arbitrarily changing, then you could say, oh, well, if I design my material to be this shape, uh, it might have this radiation pattern, which might cancel off, you know, the DC static uh, uh, gravitoelectric or gravitational field of earth. Um, and maybe that's a component that a lot of experiments have kind of neglected, you know, they're just trying to stimulate uh, an atomic lattice coherence and some sort of oscillation, but they're kind of missing that radiation pattern. Um, so that would be my goal of the COMSOL modeling. That's not even close to what I've actually done. You know, I've, I basically put in gravitational fields and that's, that's about it. So my experience with COMSOL is really the electromagnetic side, thermal, CFD, uh, electrostatics, particle tracking, um, that kind of stuff. And I'm also a good resource if anybody has a console model that, you know, I'm pretty quick with it. So if you ever need something, um, you know, I can't offer my services extensively, but uh, I'm usually pretty open to collaboration um, with others. What about for payment? For payment? Because that sounds useful. That's a good um, skill. It's not my console license. It is my employer, and that is the startup company. And so I would have to, uh, mm -hmm. I would have to talk to him, um, but it's certainly a possibility. Cool. Okay. Yeah, I definitely have some stuff we might need to talk about. So. Cool. Yeah. Feel free to reach out mm -hmm. via email. Yeah. Yeah. The reason I asked that is that, um, as you know, console it, it's uh, going to use the equations that are in there, and so if you're just using the standard formulation of things, you're not going to find. Um, <laughs> you're not going to find what uh, what we're looking for. You have to put something. Uh, so it sounds like the basis of what you're putting in is the gravitomagnetic um, theory. 
Is that correct? That is, yeah, that's what I'm going for. Okay. Um, a follow-up question I had was about, uh, um, in terms of like a, a replication, um, later on in my talk, I'm going to go over um, what we're doing in the mock effect drive at, near the end, or maybe at the at the lab update, I'm not sure when. But, um, you know, it's looking like we're going to need um, a, another another uh, third-party test because uh, things are things are looking good. So I'll... Yeah, if you know if you know somebody that uh, has a lab that can do uh, a really small forces, although we're getting bigger than nano newtons, we're definitely bigger than that. But uh, yeah, I might be interested in that as well. Yeah, I would encourage you to reach out directly to Dr. Dajmar. You know, I'm not it's like I'm like close friends with him. I've spoken to him once before, so um, I know he's a friendly guy, and I know he's really involved in this topic. And so I think you know if if you've got good results, he'd probably be interested in in collaborating. All right, thanks. Awesome. Uh, let me see. So does any, oh, Dan, go for it, sir. So just to, <clears throat> for, to if I'm understanding your um, magneto -gravit gravitics, we're just dumbing down really simply, like looking at the stress energy tensor, are you just like, um, like say like modifying the the like the momentum the momentum flux and the momentum density in your stress energy density to adjust your gra gravitational fields is that basically yeah, what's going on yeah. okay thank you sure awesome awesome yeah I, I got a question Jared, Tim go for it sir uh so first uh, a comment and then a question so the comment first about arts parts that bismuth thing. Um, if you look at science.gov or apps.dtick.mil for all the military documents, uh, there is a bunch of good resources of research out there based on bismuth magnesium, and especially okay. bismuth sil silver, because silver is another component in arts parts that's not often talked about. Um, in Linda Moulton Howe's book, she, uh, she has like, I don't know, 10 or 15 pages about the analysis that was done back in the 90s on it. And you can see some of the stuff that's in there. Wow. Okay. Um, well, what's anyways, uh, I can probably look it up. It's fine. Yeah, you, you can look it up. I'm I'm sorry, I can't remember the name of it off offhand, but it's from like the mid nineties. Okay. Um, anyways, so the the important thing though about the bismuth silver stuff and the bills bismuth zinc and the bismuth magnesium stuff is that bismuth uh, is able to convert uh, heat or IR um into energy right it's an energy conversion thing um additionally uh bismuth has negative susceptibility which is useful because if you have negative susceptibility now you got negative permeability now you got negative you know you got something to push off of basically um so just comment on the business stuff um there is good good reading material out there there's at least i don't know a dozen different papers some of them are from the 60s and some of them are from the 80s. That's the two uh, decades that you should be looking in. Um, so anyway, that's the bismuth thing. The the other thing, at the very beginning, you had a, a really interesting thing with your calculation about the, the 10 to the minus 18 um, second squared over meters kilograms um, for the Gravito uh, magnetic moment or something like that. Um, but that is comparing it to the permeability of free space or the permittivity of free space, right? The 377 ohm. Uh, but that is not necessarily a constant. We take it for granted that it's constant because we say as long as epsilon and mu never change, then you're totally good to go. But that's not the case because as we see with many of these craft, the uh, surfaces of these craft are emitting very strong magnetic and very strong electric fields. Uh, sometimes they can even get close to like Schwinger limit level stuff, right? So now you're starting to to alter those those uh, indices, which I think is just something you should consider as you look forward into this. Is if you're using materials, so rather than impedance of free space, you have the impedance of materials, or if you're altering the impedance of free space. Either of those two cases are are cases that should be considered when you're looking at your gravito magnetic calculations. Okay, yeah, that's a great comment. Um... Uh, yeah, I'll definitely have to look into that a little further. Awesome. Well, so let me see. It's 12.55. We got about five minutes left, but yeah, Curtis is next, so we could go right to his. Does anybody have any final questions? 
Ah, uh, Christopher, go for it, sir. Let me unmute you. Uh, there we go. Okay. I just wanted to really um, support you. Thank you. Nanomaterials. Ah. Nanomaterials. The multi layered. I do use magnesium as well as zinc and these, as well as other materials like um, these metal materials, which are body armor and radiation shielding. And I'm generating time distortions physically from my warp core using gravity. So there are gravity interactions within the warp field and they trigger a temporal distortion in more than one place around, around space. I just thought, you know, support you along the path you're on. You know, that it's a different direction to one I'm taking, but at the same time, time and gravity are um, key components within um, achieving tic tac performance. That's about the nicest way I could say it. I'm also, you know, on the other side of the energy field, the work field, I'm generating the same distortions that you see at a corona around that walk shaft. They're there. But you've got a long way to go. Yeah. Just keep going. Yeah, fascinating. I didn't want to ask you a question because every year I was I just wanted to give you a bit more support. I no, appreciate that. Thank you very much. And, and Christopher is going to be actually, he's going to be presenting after Curtis and then Alex is going to be assisting him as well. So again, we, we have, this is, this is exciting. This is going to be a very exciting event. Kurt, thank you so much. It, it is truly an honor to have you with us today. It's wonderful to have you present. If you want to come back and do more, we'd love to have you. Um, and let me see, Curtis, do you, do you want to go? And Curtis is up next. Yeah, I'm, so. I'm ready. Uh, just real quick, Kurt, I have a quick question. Do you know if there's any uh, open source uh, software that, that can be used besides console that's multi-physics? Uh, multi-physics? Not off the top of my head. I know open foam is, is a good sort of uh, software, but I'm not familiar with it. I've just heard it tossed around before. Yeah, okay. But yeah, thank you, everyone. I appreciate the feedback. And yeah. Um, yeah, looking forward to participating in this community a bit more. Yeah, well, Kurt, thank you as well. It's wonderful to have you here. It's wonderful to have you cover this material. And I would say this is absolutely the time. I mean, I've, it, I, I've been in this topic for a long, long time. And what I'm seeing right now, and I'm, I'm sure like Jeremy and probably everyone here would agree with me, but it just seems like things are surging forward right now. And it's really exciting. So. Very cool. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Uh, so let me take everyone. Oh, before we do that, let's give Kurt one more applause, sir. Thank you yet again. Thank you yet again. And, uh, let me see. And I will put your presentation up on the page and people, again, they can see this in replay on the website. So I'm going to take everyone out except Mr. Curtis Horn, and he will do his in just a second here. Okay. And let me see. Uh, so, Curtis, thank you, sir. And you're going to be talking about the Sachs Dirac matter field equations. And basically, right. these are so Mendel Sachs and Paul Dirac worked on these. And these are particle antiparticle pairs and quaternion uh, EM. That's kind of what you're going to be going over there. Um, as well as, if I understand correctly, how those relate to propulsion and potentially uh, Woodward's work with the Mega Drive as well, right? Yeah, I'm going to cover at the end. I'll have I, ha I have a lab update um, to give and a couple slides, so I'll cover that as well. Awesome. Okay, so let me put your slideshow up, and you should be able to go back and forward on this one because you did the upload for it. So we're right we're good there. And thank you yet again. Thank you. And I'm gonna sure. I'll be here. I'm just gonna disappear from view so that you can proceed. Okay, sounds good. So yeah, so the title of this uh, presentation is the, the Ma Sachs matter fields or how I learned to stop worrying about how to interpret quantum mechanics. So it's a little kind of homage to the presentation that I think is going to happen later uh, about what happened on Mars potentially. So anyway, so I figured uh, so I'd do something fun. Um, so I got I have a, quite a few slides to go through. So basically, in my previous talk, I covered uh, Sachs's theory uh, at the big picture. Uh, because it's a unification, field, uh, unified field theory, it, there's a lot of ground to cover. There's uh, the unification of E&M and gravity 
and um, and inertial matter. And so, you know, I went really quickly. This time, I'm going to more focus on the kind of uh, the details of the interface between qu quantum and, and um, general relativity, um, which has to do with uh, quantum. If, if you're uh, uh, get, uh, wondering why I'm talking about quantum mechanics here is that quantum mechanics uh, foundationally has to do with uh, the inertial matter and, and what uh, what matter really is, right? So so this this is where um, I'm going to go slower in the development. I'm going to uh, cover more or less, uh, you know, what I did in like maybe one slide and several here. So I'm going to kind of walk people through so they can, you know, hopefully with this talk, people can get more of a intuitive understanding or, uh, you know, understanding the justifications and uh, the route and the different thinking, uh, a different path that that is taken here. So um, now, and and as we go, go through this, um, you know, we'll, we'll again dive into, you know, where inertia comes from and what might be happening and the potential for, you know, manipulating that uh, with technology. So, um, you know, the, the, the big, the big uh, motivation here, I, I mean, the big thing that's obvious that, that people have talked about for uh, maybe a hundred years <laughs> is, uh, you know, quantum, quantum mechanics and general relativity are incompatible, right? So we're trying to make progress in physics, but um, fundamentally you have two theories that are highly successful. I mean, you can argue which one has the most accurate prediction um, and they both have like really, you know, astounding numbers uh, um, tend to the, you know, what pick, pick the number, I, you know, 15 or whatever it is. I don't know, some, some number of decimal placements places, but that's not really what, you know, what comes down to how you select what's fundamental, but both are very successful, right? Um, so it's really hard to say, okay, I'm giving up on on one or the other and, and go a different way. Um, and, but they are clearly, they're clearly incompatible theories um, at, at their core in terms of like with the standard interpretations of them. So relativity is a, uh, is a continuous uh, theory. You know, you have interactions between bodies. It's a realistic theory. It's not, uh, you know, something where you're just uh, describing matter. You're like explaining, it's ex explanatory, right? It's objective. Uh, like I said, it's deterministic. And you have nonlinear, non-homogeneous equations. Um, you can't use uh, linear supervision, su um, superposition. Uh, there, you know, some of the math tricks you use to solve uh, ordinary differential equations are not not possible because it's nonlinear, right? Um, and there's no special reference frame, right? So things are covariant. Um, quantum mechanics, on the other hand, um, you have you have particles uh, that could be, you know, infinitesimal or, you know, discrete. Um, you're, the, the, uh, you're looking at things as uh, you're descriptive and you have a probability dis uh, uh, interpretation because things are um uh, you have a superposition pit principle things are linear and you uh can use the probability uh, uh methodologies to to make a prediction of a probability distribution of you know what your experiment is going to have what you what you're going to observe right so it's more of a descriptive theory than an explanatory theory kind of like at its uh at its base so you know, how, how do we make them compatible? That's one thing, you know, of course, if they're incompatible, you, you want to make progress. How do we how do we fix this? Um, quantum mechanics being a descriptive approach um, and GR being analytical, they're, they're so one or the other, we need to do something different with. Right. So we got to step back and look at the like, look at the big picture um, there. You know, of course, a lot of a lot of uh, man hours has gone into attempting to quantize gravity and it's so far not been successful. Um, and and if if the other side is correct, Einstein and, and others uh, that were in his camp, it, it might not might not even be possible to quantize gravity, right? Um, so at this at that point, now that we see that okay, here's the problem statement, what can be done? So we can assume quantum mechanics is more fundamental and, and continue to attempt to quantize gravity. We can also assume that GR is more fundamental and find a field theory, a nonlinear field theory that is compatible with general relativity and gives quantum mechanics uh, as in a low energy approximation. Okay, that's another route that can be taken. 
And the third route is find an abstraction, whether it's, you know, category theory, some kind of topology, topological theory, some something, you know, at more abstract where we find a, a, a mechanism where both can exist despite the compatibilities that it's somehow allowed. OK, so so the, those are the kind of three general. I mean, there might be more, but uh, these are the kind of three general uh, uh, paths that you can take. So the path we're taking here is we're going to be uh, uh, attempting and uh, it, it has been attempted to um, uh, derive quantum mechanics, the mathematical formalism of quantum mechanics from general relativity and the principles of general relativity that we're going to use. So instead of trying to quantize gravity, right, we, we're, we're going to do the opposite. And to do that, you, you got to think you got to think about what you're doing, right? You got to have you got to think logically. You have to have solid physics principles that are the basis or the axioms that you're um, um, are proceeding with. OK, and they need to be something that can be verified. All right. Um, now, it may be that some some of the axioms you have as a result of them logically you can deduce other things that are expected so you don't necessarily have to throw in all the things that are expected and, and make theory from there you know the simpler the the, the less the fewer number of axioms um, the more likely the, the theory can you know have a solid foundation especially if it's it's uh, predicting things or things are come out as a result um, that are expected um, so so that's the approach we're taking here we're starting with the the gr approach uh, with the covariance and, and going from there. So first question is, okay, so, well, Curtis, if, if that were possible, wouldn't someone have done that already? Well, okay, we're talking about somebody did that, that did do that, Mendel Sachs. But, um, you know, looking at general relativity as it is now, uh, traditionally, right, um, it, you know, it, it, it doesn't have, um, you know, when you take the, the tensor equations as they are, um, it doesn't have the ability to predict um, um, what's in quantum mechanics. You, you can't get that, right? So something does need to change with GR to, to get one more step further. And what that is, is basically removing this space reflection and time symmetry that restricts the general, the group, um, the foundational group, uh, algebraic group of general relativity. So once that's done, you end up with a, um, uh, you go from a second order um, equation to a first order equation or a set of them and you have a, a fundamental group that is compatible it turns out later to be something that it you know can be used to um, derive a field theory of inertia so that's that's what what has to happen there and so what do we need to add to relativity so one thing we got to take away is those symmetries and what do we need to add um, so, of course, co covariance is, is the fundamental, you know, the principle of relativity, right? So this is where that, that fundamental quaternion group is, is there, okay? Um, the other thing that we need to add is for Mach's principle is it needs to be generalized. It, it has to be about all properties of matter, not, not only inertial mass, but the charge, magnetic moment, and other, you know, isospin, whatever you find. Um, it all has to be uh, tied um, to... Uh, to this theory right to, to this principle okay so and the other thing is that if you if you do take a, a generalized mock principle it will logically imply a conservation of interaction between matter fields right because that's there has to be a way for for matter to connect and that's that is something that uh that we find does have to be uh, conserved um the other thing we need to add is we have to apply the correspondence principle here so Basically, the correspondence principle is, you know, uh, the way we're often familiar with it is saying that, okay, well, you know, I have this general relativity. Does, you know, add a low energy approximation, does it give me, you know, does, do I get uh, the um, gravity uh, formula that Newton did, right? And that comes out. So basically, we, we need to be able to, if we have, if we have a new theory um, and we're saying that it's nonlinear at a high energy, a high interaction, um, at a low energy or, or a linear approximation of that theory, we should recover the, the current successful formalism of quantum mechanics. The mathematical formalism should co come out of that or be compatible with that theory, right? So th that's what we need to add uh, to general relativity. So what? 
how does quantum mechanics need to change? So um, first of all, this the interpretations, there's like tons of them. I put a Wikipedia link. I'm not going to click it, but uh, um, uh, the, we're, we're not going to consider those interpretations of having any meaning, right? Because we're, we're taking the general relativity route. Um, and also, given the data, uh, looking at, you know, what happens with quantum mechanics is we're going to treat matter as waves, right? So, uh, or analytical functions. And so we don't need a particle model. Basically, we're not thinking of little tiny balls of, of condensed charge moving around. We can treat matter as a wave. And that's because that's what we find experimentally. Um, and if, uh, you, if you guys saw the, um, the open mic where I covered Carver, Me Carver, Carver Mead's work, uh, you know, he's, he's, a. Uh, it looked like, you know, that's, that's what, <laughs> that's what's found. And, uh, what I, what I, what I find, uh, uh, another thing I want to comment about this is that, you know, a lot of times the semiconductor industry and their successes are pointed at by, by people advocate that advocate for quantum mechanics and say, Hey, look what happened because of quantum mechanics. And if you ever go look at Carver's Mead, especially his presentation last year, um, uh, I think I linked to that in the the, the previous uh, uh, open mic. He he really says that hey, you know, we weren't able to use quantum mechanics. We treated matter as waves, and that's what got us where we are. Uh, so it, it's a very interesting uh, take uh, from someone that was you know in there and actually um, proved uh, was able to give us uh, proof what we needed to know, which was that as you shrunk down the uh, transistor size, you you got more efficiency and more uh, computational power, that's what actually propelled uh, that industry. So it's it's a very stunning thing that, you know, I just recently found out about his presentation, his work. And uh, yeah, it's it, it, it's a really solid, uh, if, if you're questioning this, you know, thinking about it, well, are we sure about that? You know, go look at that work. I, I, I would highly recommend it. So, so we're also giving up um, linear superposition, Hilbert superposition, Hilbert spaces is not treated as fundamental, right? So we got to we got to release that, um, and and the interpretation, the probability interpretation of the wave equation, also we're, we need to give that up, right? In in order to take this path, so what do we have to add to quantum mechanics? So basically, uh, quantum mechanics has to go from a linear theory to one that's nonlinear, and but at the low energy approximation, we we uh, uh, you know uh, we retrieve it. And we need to treat the equations of quantum mechanics as field equations of inertial, inertial mass field, right, or a wave. So no, no longer is it a probability, it's the actual the field, and, and that's what's interacting. Um, and so we, we do need to apply the consequence of relativity and the generalized Mach principle to make these field equations, because, we you know, we got up to a certain point with quantum, the Dirac equations or the Majorana equations, and we... we uh, um, you know, and those are used for quantum field theory and, and, you know, you're able to calculate and make some predictions, but, um, we need to further develop those to make them compatible with our current formulation of GR that we're talking about here. And then also we need to apply the fundamental of interaction, right? So we're getting rid of particles. If you have two waves, they'll have, a, um, you know, and they interact, you know, that is one-to-one, -one, right? So that's where the, the so-called discreteness that we observe, um, um, comes is explained. So quantum mechanics uh, up until now, um, you know, of course you, you had the Schrodinger equation, right? So, um, but the Schrodinger equation wasn't necessarily uh, wasn't necessarily compatible with a special relativity. So what you end up having is a Klein-Gordon uh, used uh, used the Schrodinger's operators and actually made uh, a theory that was compatible with special relativity, but they were second order e equations and they included space and time reflection symmetries. So what Dirac and Majorana did is uh, uh, create a set of equations that uh, basically took, you could take the Klein-Gordon equations and factorize them and remove the space and time reflection symmetries and you end up with further predictions, okay? So that that's kind of where things kind of ended up, and then of course there was a, a, the additional uh, power that quantum field theory brought in of being able to further uh, do calculations uh, with that theory. So um, 
So one thing I want to uh, emphasize here, I talked a little bit about that earlier, but I wanted to kind of emphasize this again, is, uh, you know, we're, we're not proceeding with, in this theory, we're not proceeding with the particle concept. We may talk about particles, like just because it's a, it's just something that we're used to talk, uh, describing, okay, an electron, it's a particle, whatever, we're, it's an it's a entity, right? You, we're, if you, Entity is a very general thing, particles a little bit more, okay, we understand electrons, protons, uh, muons, et cetera, right? So, but the concept of a particle as being, you know, a little tiny ball, that's what we're we're talking about here. That concept, uh, we don't, we're, we're, we're not gonna, we're not gonna be using that. So, and uh, I, ha I have a quote here from Car Carver Mead. I won't, won't uh, read it all off, uh, but basically what he's saying is that, and, and he actually quotes Feynman about this as well, is that, we uh, fundamentally matter is a wave, okay? It has a wave property. And that's how we need to treat matter to understand things. So we need to go and look at the matter, uh, uh, the wave properties of matter to understand how things in the bigger, you know, bigger picture and, and in the small picture, how they, how they actually um, uh, work. So um, here uh, we're gonna go over continuing the, the, the matter field equations and what quantum mechanics is contributing. So initially, like I described, uh, we have the operators from Schrodinger. Schrodinger had his Schrodinger equation. Um, and Klein-Gordon Klein used Schrodinger equations operators on uh, basically the, the energy equation of, of special relativity, okay? This is uh, where the famous E equals MC square equation comes from. That's the full form, okay, if, if, if uh, you're not familiar. So E equals MC square, if you take if you have p equals zero and you take square root of both sides, that's where e equals mc squared is recovered. So, but this is the full formulation of that uh, matter, momentum, and energy uh, relation in special relativity. So, using the Schrodinger operators, uh, Klein-Gordon got that, used that to get the Klein-Gordon equation. And uh, Dirac and Majorana both uh, basically factorized the Klein-Gordon equation to get the Dirac equations. Okay, so that's where the quantum what quantum contributed con it contributes to this theory. So for general the general relativity side, basically what you have is in in the uh, special relativity you don't have a covariant operator, right? It's not um, it's not uh, uh, true for curved space time. So what we do uh, here, actually I'm skipping ahead. That's the bottom side, but. Uh, uh, what we do here is we uh, transform uh, the second the second line here I have is we transform the uh, operator from from a you know a linear kind of a, a flat space operator to a curved space operator and when you do that you get uh, the spin of uh, spinifying connection so the spinifying connection is, is something that in Sachs's theory of general relativity you have spinner equations instead of uh, tensor equations. And with tensor equations, you have the fine connection, which is kind of like the, the fundamental where you calculate the curvature of space time, which would the, the, um, the kind of mathematical uh, entity you use for that. And here, uh, because it's a spinner equation, you have a spinifying connection that's equivalent to that. And we, it turns out that, you know, that is, has to be, um, that's the contribution of general relativity to the matter fields. Now, the thing previously is that because we are saying that we have matter fields and they're, they're um, you know, uh, the Mach effect is fundamental here, you have the fundamental of interaction principle and that's where that I con comes in. So the I is basically a uh, functional that describes the interaction of any given wave particle to all the other wave particles in the universe, right? So that interaction functional, if, if you have a aggregate of particles that are, you know, very close and interacting strongly, that I will be significant. And if they're, if they're, you know, free from each other, that I can be very small, right? So you can take the limit. Um, so that, that interaction functional is part of this, uh, part of this theory and what we put into the uh, uh, Dirac Majorana equations, um, to, to get uh, uh, to have that fundamental of interaction uh, uh, principle applied, okay, to our matter field equations, and then the next step is, you know, I, I started talking about this first, but the next step is going to be taking that operator that's at the beginning there, um, and uh, 
and uh, making it uh, co covariant. So making it uh, applicable for a curved space time. And what you end up with is uh, uh, what I have here at the beginning. Uh, I, and I'm going to take you guys through kind of, I'm not going to go in too much detail, but I'm just going to walk through the, the big picture steps to, to get the final result. Um, and I know it's kind of like a, um, uh, the slide a little, goofed up a little bit here, but uh, you, you can get the picture. So initially when you do that, you end up with instead of a um, instead of the uh, the 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 Dirac uh, uh, matrices, you have a quaternion there, right? You, we're in curved space time. That's that first set of equations. And what you want to end up doing is uh, you notice that m is zero. So we we set in the Dirac equation previously we had an m there. So we set that equal to zero because we we're not going to be inserting the mass. We're going to be actually deriving. Uh, the mass from this equation because we are taking as fundamental as the mock the generalized mock principle is in the theory so we're building it into this theory okay so um next thing uh, uh the spin of you, you notice the spin of finite co connection is there right and as i described before it replace it's going to end up replacing mass in the Dirac equation so uh so using uh kind of uh uh, basically, the properties of the, the spinifying connection, we can uh, rederive that equation uh, to have a um, kind of a, um, I would say, an eigenvalue type situation where you have uh, mass uh, represented by that lambda e to the i uh, gamma. And so... One of the things is with that e to the i gamma, you, we can actually use gauge invariance to kind of factor that out and, and get rid of that. So at the end of the day, you you know, the equations on the bottom, those are the kind of the full um, covariant uh, matter field equations. You still have an interaction functional. You don't have explicitly shown um, the spin of fine connection. And and you have the the what the lambdas, which represents the the mass, which inherently in that lambda is going to be the uh, connection to to other matter. So that that's what uh, that's how we end up with a fully covariant set of equations that are compatible with the curved space time and compatible with um, the for, the formulation of general relativity that is that the spinner formulation of general relativity. Um, so what are the consequences of this? So now we have a field theory that's compatible with general relativity, given that we give up the space time reflection symmetry. We have to do that for general relativity. That's already done in the, in the Dirac formulation. So all we have to do then is update the operator as I showed and uh, uh, a few a few mathematical tricks and you end up with that um, with that system. And, and the other thing we need uh, we got to realize is the generalized mock principle is fully applied here. So you use that as a principle of okay, I know that I'm I'm assuming that that is true, and developing your theory around it. So it it inherently has the mock principle in it. It's not something you discovered, right? Um, so the 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 source of inertial mass is clear in this theory, right? So you can you can using this theory. Using some more, you know, fancy math tricks, you can you can figure out the mass of particles. Um, one of the things that pops out of this is the Pauli exclusion principle is can be derived uh, from this this uh, formulation uh, as well. And, and but that can be derived and it's derived at a fundamental um, um, in a fundamental way. It's not a it's not a low energy approximation. Uh, Fermi Dirac uh, statistics, on the other hand, is recovered. But it's in a linear non non relativistic approximation of the theory. So you can you get back for me direct statistics, which allows us to get you know the periodic table, right? So <laughs> um, it looks like my slide messed up there. So I'll, I'll continue the, to the next thing. Um, so uh, so now we have uh, a fully covariant uh, matter field equations, and what we can do next is we can use those to uh, look at or think about and figure out what happens with particle and antiparticle pairs, right? Derive what they do, what the solutions are for them, okay? Um, before, I kind of just showed basically the, uh, the equations at the bottom, 
but here I'm, uh, I'm showing a few of the steps. So if you recall, you know, the, the first set of equations here I have is it looks like a lot like what I had before, but um, I have the gammas in here. Um, and this is uh, basically uh, instead of taking the Majorana form, this is uh, for com compactness, we're using the Dirac by spinner notation. So there's only two equations instead of two for each particle here. So one for each particle is shown here. Um, and you notice that the there's an interaction functional in there. There's the lambda. Um, and uh, you have the, the, the uh, uh, matter uh, f the matter field, right? So these interaction functionals, I show them explicitly here. Um, uh, G in there is the Green's functions. There's, there's a lot of different things that uh, come from the, the spinner formulation of electromagnetism that, that pops up in here. Um, I'm not going to have time to cover that in detail, the, that, that formulation of electromagnetism. That probably should be its own talk because it's so in-depth. Uh, I was hoping that I could do both things, but uh, I figured that this is probably enough. <laughs> so, so the solution to those uh, uh, bispinner notations is shown at, at the third line here. And so you end up with a, 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 an exact solution that can be kind of shown explicitly. And given that, the, then you end up with two spinner equations, one for each type of particle, one for uh, electron, one for a, a positron. And so those are uh, exact equations that, uh, you know, fall out of this. OK, now. So 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 the, so that um, particle antiparticle pair, one of the things about that is that, um, you know. It it kind of gives us a mechanism for uh, uh, general the for the generalized Mach principle to have inertial mass that we measure. So. I'm going to cover this again, kind of step by step, so so you guys can get my understanding of how the Mach principle mechanism works in this theory. So first of all, full covariance allows for a formulation of general relativity that gives us first order equations resulting in a spinifying connection. It's okay, and the matter wave field theory it has to use that spinifying connection as as part of the operator to be fully covariant and fit the theory. Um, that spin of fine connection is now found to act as the mass, right? That connection with all the other mass ends up being um, the mass in the matter field equation, right? Taking the place of that. So the M is gone and there's that lambda. So the resulting matter field equations, if you look at them, they result in a null state for particle antiparticle pairs where they're electromagnetically coupled, but they retain their inertial mass. So the inertial mass field when an electron and positron come together in this theory, uh, the inertial mass field does not disappear, right? The electromagnetic coupling is there. And so the, you see the electromagnetic en energy, but the uh, pair is, still exists. And that pair and that dense, uh, density of that, the particle antiparticle pairs is what interacts with matter, the, the matter wave fields that we are made of. Um, and that's what gives us the inertial mass we measure. So that's how the detail mechanism of the generalized Mach principle works in this theory. So what is, what's the physical consequence of, of that dense pair of gases? So first, the solution of the coupled pair, it can be shown that that interaction functional operating on the electron and the, and the positron, that's zero. But the interactional, interaction functional itself, you recall, uh, of that bound state is not itself zero, okay? So th there's there's still an interaction there. Um, and the energy and the linear momentum um, for the bound state can be derived to be zero. Basically, once the particle couples, it has zero momentum, zero energy. It's at the ground state of the universe, okay? There's, uh, uh, there's no uh, jumping down to negative energies. Now, uh, and, and that can be derived, that's derived using Noether's theorem. Now, in, in this being a analytical theory, there, it's not allowed to go from positive energy to negative energy. That being said, your theory, you can, you can choose whether the energy levels are positive or zero is the highest and you go down negative. Okay, so uh, you can choose either formulation, they're equivalent, but you can't go from one to the other. In this in this theory, 
And given the quaternion formulation of electromagnetism in this theory, you can look at the previous uh, solutions and you can figure out what the what the ground state maps to in terms of like uh, the electromagnet electromagnetic uh, sources. And what you end up finding is you end up finding that uh, they're equivalent to two oppositely polarized currents that are mutually transverse in kind of like the Z direction. Like if, if they're on X and Y, they come together there, um, you'll find that they're transverse. And that's that's what's, what's shown here. You see the J1 plus J2 is something. It's not zero, right? You have the E to the 2I lambda T. So, so uh, um, you end up with that kind of current going out. And that's what actually is measured. Um, you know, when when a, a particle and antiparticle pair come together, you end up getting uh, uh, an interaction that you know we measure with a you can measure with a Geiger coordinate or something. You measure the gamma. What 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 is referred to as gamma, gamma rays, right? Um, the other thing that uh, consequence of a, a background this background pair of gas is what we measure as black body radiation, right? So in this theory. Uh, this is an analytical theory. So if something is interaction, interacting, if you have an, uh, 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 two, two electrons and one's moving and the other one's moving because of that, right, you have this interaction. In this theory, there's no photon traveling. It's the, the electromagnetic field is coupling and you have, uh, you have uh, interaction happening there. You don't need a separate, you know, a packet or anything like that here. Um, so how does black body radiation happen, right? So that dense sea of particles would replace that. So basically, we find that there. The other thing is that that dense sea of particles, uh, because it comes close to uh, um, um, uh, nuclei, uh, that is ex that's what ex in this theory that's what explains radioactive de decay and why it's statistical. Okay. Of course, you know, the magnitude of inertial mass of matter and I, um, as well as the cashmere effect, right? The cashmere effect is something where it has to do in the conventional description with the vacuum and, and the way it's interacting. And when you have um, two, you know, two plates close to each other, you can get this uh, attraction because there is less interaction happening there uh, due, to that, due to that matter configuration. So those are the things that uh, are consequences. Now, what are the consequences if you modify that density, right? So like, let's say what we're talking about here, one of the mechanisms to lower inertial mass or get propulsion is to modify the density of matter or the inertial mass of matter. Now, if you lower, if you lower the density of the background pairs, uh, because it, because the uh, um, uh, black body radiation is, is in this theory, uh, describes, is described by the background pair density, you should see lower uh, measure temperature, right? Because you're when you measure temperature, what's really happening is that density uh, of background pairs between you is is kind of uh, um, transmitting that, right? So um, you might see lower measure temperature when when um, the volume is 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 uh, lowered. Um, also, you you should see if if someone's lowering the volume by you know splitting and rejoining the background pairs. Uh, then you should see uh, a radiation signature uh, indicative of that. Um, also, you should see in the volume a lower inertial mass. And you should also the, um, the charge to mass ratio and the magnet magnetic moment will, will also uh, lower uh, with the same uh, ratio, right? So you don't get like atoms flying apart or you know, uh, collapsing because the mass went down and so the electron just flies off uh, or, or collapse down and, and uh, form a neutron star. You don't get that kind of thing because uh, in this theory, at least, because that uh, both of those manifestations of matter have to do with the interaction with the background pairs. Um, now, at the interface, you would expect, uh, because you have the, uh, a gradient of de a density of the background pairs, you would uh, expect to be have some birefringence type effects for matter at the shell. Okay, so that's about it for that. Um, I have a couple of lab updates. Uh, one is that we were able to uh, get another um, another turbo pump 
and get that in there. So we're able to get down to, uh, we were, I think we were at uh, close to one times 10 to the minus four uh, tour. Uh, this, this, I reconfigured it here and I put the gauge closer to the chamber and it was at about 2.8 is what's shown here. Um, uh, 10 times, time, times 10 to the minus four tour. So, uh, so that, and, and there's uh, some more parts coming in and we're going to be uh, getting that turbo, turbo uh, pump closer to the chamber. Unfortunately, I can't put it right on the chamber. I'd like to do that, but we would have to make a new uh, end cap for the chamber. Um, and we're not going to do that just yet because we're getting close to the, the um, we're basically in the regime where we need to be, where the air effects are not, uh, not something that we need to worry about. Um, the second uh, update here is this is a, I can show this video maybe later on, but basically this was one of the, the, the better runs that we had. Um, this was a, a sweep over two seconds. Uh, and you can see here, this, this graph on the right is the position of the, of the torsion arm itself. Uh, the the device is, is, is all is not graphed here, but it had the same kind of curve. They were both pushing in the same direction, and basically the sweep repeated every two seconds. So you get something um, that you know after two se you know you get a push, and then uh, and for for a time, and there is a um, here there's clearly an impulse that happens, and you can see that the uh, points here. Uh, at that first rise that as it goes up that the points are uh, further away from each other that's indicative of an acceleration and then all of a sudden it stops and you get like a kind of like a nice curve that's where the force is stopped being applied so whatever was happening whether it was still the air or a mock effect or some magnetic thing who knows uh, there was a force happening um, it looks like and that kind of you know goes away and then then it comes back again right as the sweep goes down we could we get back into that regime of those frequencies that activate the um the piezo stack and 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 you get the force again so this one was a really good run because it repeated like uh a force in one direction it wasn't a back and forth type thing that we've been having uh for the last couple of years so i think one of that one of the reasons why this probably has to do with uh, us getting a good vacuum we're not getting the air interfering with the effect. So that's the, uh, that's the update. Awesome. Awesome. Curtis, thank you. Thank you. Let me take down the slide deck and I'm going to bring everybody back in. We need to give you an enormous hand. Curtis is becoming a regular presenter also. Let me see. It looks like yeah, everybody else has their camera off. Everybody, please put your hands together and give Curtis Horn an enormous applause. Curtis, that, Curtis. Was, uh, that, that was very, very, very good about understanding the differences between quantum mechanics and general relativity. Great job. Oh, Thank I'll you. bring Dan in also. This yeah. is fascinating because I had you know, proposed to Eric Weinstein, what if you could, you know, GR was derived from uh, quantum mechanics. And then he said, well, why not the opposite? And well, why not? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And Mendel Sachs did it back in the, I think, 60s or 70s. That's already been done. <laughs> Can I make yeah. a comment on that? Um, so I do agree totally. Um, there, they, it, I think the main problem is, um, thinking binary i mean the, i don't think they're mutually exclusive uh, theories quantum mechanics and general relativity and i do believe there are mathematical ways to parse some of those differences um if you look at the paper um we have published and that there's a lot on that uh, about what you spoke on um parsing differences between general relativity and quantum mechanics and so i wanted to speak a bit on the covariance um it, um, so basically, what I put in the chat, which for anybody who can't see that is accessible as published research, um, I do believe highly that there's multiple forms of things which can account for everything, uh, but basically a theory of everything, quantum mechanics, general relativity, and parsing it. And I think that considering binary action is, is very limiting 
because you you have to expect that everything's going to be equally probable, both the wave, both the particle, um, and you may disagree, which I also coincidentally and paradoxically agree with. But I wanted to go through the covariances um, in yeah. in the, the theory of everything, the toe, um, which again well, I do not believe there's one form of. I believe there's a lot. I, I believe it's it's essentially very limiting to think binary and that uh, light existing as a wave or particle is relative uh, basically based on how you're perceiving it and and how you're measuring it um so i'll go through some of the covariances here that you spoke of if that's okay and i i have yeah. some information a alex alex hold on let me jump in just a sec i mm -hmm. i do want to try and limit things a little bit so oh no we... go ahead yeah. We stay pretty focused on Curtis's and, and then um, yourself and Chris, you guys are coming up next. And, and then I, I hope that you're able to go into some of that during your presentation. Oh, no, no. Well. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. No, no that's OK. I just don't want to get I don't want to get too deep into it in the Q&A. Right. Because that. Oh, might, yeah. I uh, some highly technical. I, yeah. No. Uh, contact sure, me. Sure, no, no problem. And one thing I'll comment on, Alex, about what you're saying is uh, so. Uh, you know, sure, there's more than one way to look at it. Like, for example, you you, you can look at general relativity and you can say, well, it, it, it comes from entropy, right? <laughs> I mean, there's all sorts of ways to, to look at things. Um, and I'm not saying that all of them are wrong. Here I'm covering, you know, kind of strictly what's, what Sachs developed and kind of bringing that back. Because, you know, like you mentioned, uh, Eric Weinstein's, you know, talking about it like it's like it's a new idea. It, it's, it's that particular idea. It's not. <laughs> So uh, credit where credit's due, right? So uh, Einstein, right? He was the one doing this path. Now, I, I what I, what I, uh, what I think is that, you know, just like we had back in the day, we had the uh, epicycles, right? And all of a sudden, it's like no, things are rotating around each other, and it's a whole different way of looking at it. And it, it turns out that okay, yeah, we can verify that, right? There's something we can test. So just like with anything. We, there has to be a predictive nature of this, and it'll tell, kind of clarify for us. Okay, what what is reality really doing? Like you know, like I said, what's God thinking, right? So in this case, one of the things I want to bring up is there is an experiment that I heard about that's coming on this year, where they're going to be taking gamma rays and probing the vacuum. So mm -hmm. I'm very interested in the results of that because that will that should <laughs> reveal. You know, is it background pairs? Is there a finite number, right? I don't yeah. know the exact details of that experiment, but that's one of the things that, uh, uh, you know, uh, is interesting to me. And the reason I gave, I'm gave i giving this talk here in this group of propulsion is because, you know, a lot, of the, uh, a lot of the consequences of the background pairs existing um, look a lot like the observables of UFOs and, and what we're, people are <laughs> describing uh, there. So I found that, you know, that all came out last year. And that's why I kind of, you know, I, so, so my, my, uh, uh, my interest is, is, is the physics. And I think that anything, one of the things that we got to really keep in mind is that, you know, for the, there's likely something like this, where, you know, there is a, a way of doing something that we can't access here, there has to be a reason why, right? So the background pair is being so tightly coupled and being so difficult to interact with is likely the reason why we don't, you know, it's not easy to to make a, a craft like this uh, uh, work, right? You need a lot of energy or, or some kind of really intricate understanding of how they're coupled and be able to, you know, uh, uh, elegantly get them to, you know, do what you want them to do. I so, agree. Great, you know, well. Cur Curtis, if, if I could jump in really quick. Um, I just brought, let me apologize. So Shiva and Michael Boyd were hiding. I had to scroll down to find them. I didn't even, they, they were here in the studio and, but I had to scroll. So I didn't see him come in. Um, but what you were talking about with being focused on the physics, a lot of what Alex is touching on kind of goes to the philosophy of science. And I know that Alex, I know you're going to talk about some of that a little bit later. I've and then actually, I, I'm, I'm really excited to have Shiva with us too. He had reached out and sent me a paper that's that's very focused on the philosophy of this as well. And so it, I think, I'm not positive, but I think that John Brandenburg 
will probably miss today's event. And what I'd like to do John. is actually have Shiva do his presentation. Well, that that's okay. I, you know, John is, yeah, I, he, John is always I welcome. I got to change my title then. <laughs> well, and, and just, just between you and me without giving away too much, um, so you, you remember the movie Oppenheimer? They had the atmospheric ignition concern. So yeah. John had a concern that that might happen from neutron bombs. And I thought, well, that's that's worth mentioning, you know. But it, we're all juggling schedules and we're all in holiday recovery mode. So it's one of those one of those things. Yeah. But anyhow, yeah, I, didn't need I, to... I would I would highly suggest that uh, I, I don't know if, how, how many of you guys are familiar with Carver Mead, but I just recently found his uh, presentation and, uh, you know, it, it reinforced for me what Mendel Sachs was doing because it's along the same lines, looking at matter as waves and not imposing our, our ideas or limiting ideas to what, what matter does. And, uh, you know, it's, it's really, I, I'm, I'm really excited about the future and, uh, you know, uh, kind of clearing out our old kind of, uh, um, you know, what we were taught you know the real things we we learned about force and 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 matter and just kind of taking taking the road where uh you're looking at solid principles and and it's not easy to think about you know okay covariance like what does it mean it takes a lot of introspection a lot of thinking to understand these things and to be able to use them mathematically um, and at the same time there's a danger of of abstracting too far where your math, you know, you can do string theory and like, just like, I can predict anything or just, you know, my math can come up with anything you, you give me, <laughs> you know, at, at some point there's, there's has to be a, a kind of a limit. Like where, where do you go too far? It's like, it's, it's a subtle work and it's not, it's not straightforward. Right. Um, to ask you but, a question, but go ahead. Yeah. Uh, I was going to ask, uh, so it seems as though you're trying to reach for something that is more a uh, continuous theory. Uh, and so, you know, how are you dealing with some of the discrete properties of particles? Like, uh, for instance, you know, you, you can see the, um, you know, in a, in a fog chamber, you can see, the, you know, the, the particulate nature of, uh, of particles. And so are you doing something to, you know, transition there uh, in your work? Yeah. So, so if you, uh, if you think about the presentation I gave where I, I went from, okay, there's a Schrodinger equation. It's not, it's not uh, relativistic. Then you get Klein-Gordon, and then you factorize that. You get Dirac, right? You can think of that as kind of going higher and higher in energy, describing more and more uh, what you can do with uh, at least uh, flat space time, right? With this, with this thing, what, what we're doing here basically is we're taking that and we're going, okay, I'm I'm now taking that matter field equation and making it fully covariant. So now it can apply in a dense neutron star. OK, and that's where this you would have to use that equation to describe what matter is doing versus the others. Right. Those those low energy linear approximations no longer apply in, in that in that portion. But if you're in regular matter, the the linear approximations, the direct equation, all that stuff that those predictions, they come out. You can still use that. You still have that. Now, where does the discreteness comes in? Um, well, one of the things that's, that's mentioned here as part of the Mach principle is that fundamental of, of interaction. So you have particles uh, where there's a built in an interactional functional. And, you know, that's that's where, you know, particles uh, interact one to one. Right. These waves interact one to one. And that's that's the, where the discreteness comes in in this theory that we that we experience, that we measure in in, in, in the lab. Yeah, I'm still not quite understanding how it becomes discrete, though. I mean, you're 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 saying that the the waves interact one to one. In other words, like one peak with one peak, you know, or one trough with one trough, or whatever. But uh, but you know, there is that, that's still a continuous wave at that point. And so I'm just curious how you breach that transition to a discrete particle. So so when you're taking the low energy limit, basically all those higher terms are ignored, right? The the majority of the interaction is one to one. So so when you have a peak, you even though we call it discrete, we all know that there's a, a line thickness, right? There's always, uh, you know, if you look at the spectral lines, for example, there's always a thickness there. It's not exact. And so so approximately it's, you know, discrete, but it's not really discrete, right? There, there's there's something else going on. There's nonlinearities there. 
and that's that's you know kind of uh, in, in the the particle model, right? The the cloud chamber. That particle is a free particle in the in the a free field limit. You're going to get that interaction as it goes along. Now, if a particle and particle pair is coupled to the ground state and it's go, go, moving through there, you're not going to see that in the cloud chamber because it's not interacting electromagnetically. And I. I'd agree because the Minkowski metric um, uh, numerical equivalents are de <clears throat> generally defined as one, 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 one. So I 100% agree with you. And also, if you have a chance to, what is the name of the main paper you would funnel people towards? And what is the name of the paper? Just to make sure that everybody can get it. Yeah. So I, I would look up Mendel Sachs. Um, he had several books. Um, he has a lot of papers out there. Um, and I, I know his, his stuff is not really, there's not that much on archive, but the first thing there is a, um, there is a paper that somebody did about 10 years ago, I think it was now where they, they took, uh, uh Mendel Sachs's, uh, relativity, uh, or general relativity formulation and redrive the, um, the, uh, Schwarzschild solution from that. So that's kind of like a good introduction because they go over, you know, how we factorize it. The, the equation of general relativity to get the quaternion formulation. Was it zero when the Minkowski metric was calculated? I don't think Minkowski metric was uh, mentioned in that paper. Oh, okay. Sorry. Okay. Um, did, I, did I answer your question, Shiva? Awesome. Okay. Uh, I think well, Michael has his hand up. Oh, Michael, go for it, sir. Yeah, I have a couple of questions. Would uh, one is would your uh, would your uh, you be assuming that the speed of gravitation is the same as the speed of light? And the second is uh, would I'm uh, what I'm assuming is that you're assuming that matter and mass is the source of gravity. Is there any gravity associated with the absence of mass? If there's no mass, there would in this theory, if there were no matter, there would be no uh, mass. Um, and so, uh, in in this theory, the gravity gravity would propagate at the wave speed, um, and that would probably depend on the density of the background pairs. So you're 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 uh, I, I'm feeling like uh, confused about your second answer. The wave speed does. Are you saying the wave speed isn't necessarily the speed of light? No, it would be the speed of light. It would be the local speed of light. So, so in the theory, uh, to know what the theory would say, the theory that we're discussing, Mel Sachs' theory, we would have to uh, uh, set up the wave equations and find out, okay, what what the wave speed is for that equation, right? Um, and in the equations I'm showing, he he's setting h bar and c equal to one. Uh, just to kind of make it compact, but you can you can put that stuff back in there and derive what C is. And there is no assumption in the theory that C is constant or or what you know of a certain value. The assumption of the theory, the fundamental axiom, is uh, general covariance. So so in this theory, you would you would want to um, uh, derive what C is. Um, and that's the way you would do it. You wouldn't necessarily make a claim one way or another. Um, so basically, would, you would say, would, you, what you're saying is that uh, the, the speed would depend on the density of space-time? Uh, the density of the... Uh, the speed for gravity would likely depend on the uh, density of the background pairs. Of, of the, uh, the background pair, you, you mean virtual pairs? Well, so, so the virtual pairs, you, you can think of it that way. That's the quantum mechanics uh, interpretation. But the, with this interpretation, there's actual, uh, when, when uh, positron and electron come together uh, and they couple, their masses still exist. So they're, they don't annihilate in the, in the sense that they're, they disappeared and they turned into energy. In this theory, um, they're electromagnetically coupled and they, their matter is still there. So we're, we're living in a kind of dense sea of these particles. So kind of like a Cooper pair? 
You know, like a Cooper pair and super kind of like kind of like that, but they're like so tightly coupled that the only way to to uh, get them out is to you know have a couple gamma rays that hit them and uh, and and separate them out. So my confusion is that my understanding is matter's mass come mainly from protons, not electrons. So how do you account for the the non-symmetric nature of the proton mass to the electron mass? Oh, so I didn't I didn't cover uh, uh, what Sachs did with protons here. That could be a separate thing. I'd, I'd have to I'd have to go over that and uh, and show you guys. But uh, that is something in this theory um, that he did he did work on. So that that's that's available as well. So there, uh, in terms there is of mass, a theory with protons instead of electrons. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, there, he did. He does cover uh, protons in in the theory. So that that is available for us to to kind of look at and see see how that is approached in the theory. Um, and and the the proton uh, and the theory also this theory also uh, does have a prediction for the um, mass of the muon, and it does predict uh, um, for fermions uh, pairs. So you get the electron and it's and the muon as a as kind of a, a, a pair, and the muon is about 206 times the mass, and that's that's predicted. That comes out of this theory as well. So you get muons, you get pions, um, you, you have protons and neutrons. Of course, neutrons are a composite. Um, I that it'd be a whole <laughs> different presentation to go over the the particle physics analogies and and you know where where the line is with this theory, right? So, um, yeah. Okay, thank you for your answers. I appreciate it. Awesome. Sure. Awesome. And we've got, so we have just about four minutes left. I, Alex, I think you had another question. And then I think probably it's yourself and Chris doing a presentation. Yeah, I'll, I'll be quick and I'll, I'll make sure I relate it to his uh, insights. And uh, I would say a simple way to explain, um, explain what he was talking about is that um, in general relativity, um, generally, uh, the speed of gravitational interactions is associated with the propagation of gravity waves. So that's going to be inconsistent. It's going to be whatever the source of the gravity wave that's emitting um, the gravity. And I think that would be a very simple way to explain all um, some of the differences that you're explaining at the beginning there, um, because it's not a constant, I think. And, and that's my opinion, at least. Um, but I was just going to touch on that a bit. It's it's very detailed. I'll touch on that a bit in my my portion of it. Um, but accounting for light, uh, I heard uh, Michael Boyd mention the asymmetrical nature of photons and how they're represented in measurements, um, and that can all be explained by by wave particles, by duality, um, and they can be both massless particles and like 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 uh, photonic waves basically and particles containing mass at the same time if you count for both those things and you sit down and do the math you're going to find it works out perfect like like all this stuff all the differences are going to immediately become apparent in those calculations even with a calculator and pencil and stuff so i just uh so uh, all i wanted to say is that's definitely correct um and i have that supported with a lot of our work not only theoretical but engineering wise so i just wanted to say that awesome Al alex thank you so we have just about two minutes left uh, curtis do you have anything else or, or should we do another applause sir um no i think uh oh i think jared has his hand up oh uh, oh, there he does. Okay. Yeah. Jared, go for it. We'll squeeze uh, one more in. Thanks. Um, so, Curtis, you were starting to talk a little bit uh, about how the particle and particle pairs, um, their momentum splits, right? You get a momentum vector for each one. Um, and with the Mega Drive, it's all about, you know, this asymmetric cap uh, capturing of momentum, right? I was just hoping you might be able to kind of reiterate or, or recorrelate the, how the particle antiparticle um, momentum stuff might relate to your mega drive stuff. Yeah. So, uh, there, there is no explicit correlation that I have in mind 
about that other than the fact that the this theory is like explicitly incorporates the mock principle in it and 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 using that does a unification of inertial mass and, and general relativity right so um uh, my interest in in the mock in, in the mega drive in, in that experiment is to kind of bring back the mock effect as something okay we have an experimental proof now that being said uh when i brought up carver meat carver meat stuff last, last time in the open mic that's already experimental proof right what, what was done with neutrons that shows us that the mock effect is real that if if you know you look at mat matter waves and the way they interact there is um, uh, an effect there uh due, due to due to those motions so all that being said um, I am investigating what, for this theory, what could be a mechanism um, that that is used here, uh, 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 because we are putting, uh, we are having a piezoelectric stack where we're putting a lot of energy, taking it out really quickly, and and we're doing it, timing it with the uh, mechanical motions, and so uh, it's a very, you know, it's kind of a nonlinear situation, right? So, you know these things uh this theory applies here and and uh what i suspect is that um that we are somehow interacting with the background pairs and and pushing off them um and and, and pushing off in a way where okay because we have a bigger mass on one side than a smaller mass when we push off we we get a reaction in, in one direction um and and that's it's it's a it's it's a very interesting effect and and to me, the experimental side of it, um, I think it's it's a very critical to have an experiment that's obvious where, OK, yeah, we can show we can put this in a vacuum, put it on a on a, um, on a, a, a set of bearings that can slide it with low friction and the thing just moves and there's no other explanation. There's no air. There's no magnetic effects. Right. That That's what we want to see. And at that point, we can you know, we can say, OK, there's fundamental physics here. We can start you know, investing time in figuring out what the mechanism is uh, really going on, right? Awesome. Well, so we are we are just past the top of the hour. So Curtis, let's put our hands together for your presentation one more time. Everybody, giant applause. Curtis, thank you, man. You have been such a tremendous contributor to this conference over the last year or so. It has been absolutely amazing. And again, I, I would love to see more work from you going forward. Uh, you're doing tons with Woodward's Mega Drive, and you're helping take that further as well. So it is tremendous, man. Thank you so much. And if I may say, too, you did great. Uh, you're on your way to your own theory of everything, to be honest. All right, thank you. Awesome. Okay, well, let me take everybody out. And again, Curtis, thank you one more time. I'm going to remove everybody so you guys are still in the background there. And I'm going to go to Christopher Mailer and then Alex Wolf. And so Alex is going to be helping Chris. Let me apologize a little bit for some of the confusion. So Chris is there. And I'll tell you what, why don't I bring, I'll bring Alex in as well. Uh, and what I'm going to do now is... There we go. So I think I think you guys wanted to start with this, right? Was was this uh, where I we were? Christopher to... is uh, has his own presentation, and I could uh, follow up on that in the last fifteen ish minutes. But if you wanted to start here, that oh, on... okay. For that, that okay. Works. Well, what, why don't I start, uh, Chris? Do we do we have yours? Did you send me yours? I can send it to you. If you can, or if you'd like to upload it that too, that would be perfectly fine. And I can speak on mine while he does that. Okay. Well, do you do you want to do that? So why don't we do that then? We'll start with we'll start with Alex. Um, Alex, if you want to do that, and, and Chris, uh, do you know how to upload? There's there's mm -hmm. a present button, and then it has slides, and and it can come from your computer. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I will uh, start here. Okay. First off, very interesting here about, uh, sorry, I'm reading my notes. I'm not trying to uh, look like I'm not paying attention, but uh, I wanted to speak on the uh, the covariance that Curtis spoke of. Um, so you can basically, some quick notes before I get to the uh, presentation. So if you um, essentially, 
you 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 introduced the idea that disturbances in space time are caused by massive objects in motion propagated outward by waves, which is directly in contradiction to viewing things binary one or the other, and that's I believe how how you would solve that, and I I believe that's supported as well by the fact that the metamaterials developments we've been doing um, have had major advancements due to non-Euclidean models like uh like i said i i don't believe that there's one toe or anything i don't believe there's one theory of everything i believe it's basically and essentially limitless and and as long as you're non-euclidean accounting for time i believe as well that that can be varied based on what uses you have for something like that and how intensive you want it to be um so i pretty much went over all that um but I just kind of wanted to to, to let uh, Curtis know that if you start looking at things as uh, propagated waves, you you might find that the mathematics uh, between parsing QMGR start to work out very compatibly, beautifully. Um, so let's go through this uh, this presentation here, uh, and and I'll touch on that at the end as well if I don't forget. Uh, so. Tim, if you could go to the next slide. Uh, do, am I able to do that? I'm sorry. I'm not sure how this works. So how do I go to the next slide? Hmm? Sorry about that. That was Mr. Brandenburg on the phone. He will not be able. He's going to postpone until February, just so you know. So Alex, if you move your mouse over the slide deck oh i you know what i have to do that because i added it for you so Maybe. it won't let you um, sorry about that just let me know when you need to go to the next slide i'm still here in the background and i'll, I'll be yeah, able to okay. thank, thank you uh so essentially first uh here's a little introduction i alex wolf uh the third uh, phd of uh, materials science and quantum physics and and we've been undertaking experiments data verification data verification r d based on the metamaterials engineered by Christopher Mailer here, which he's been working on for, I believe, 40 plus years. Um, so he engineers the metamaterials based on his education and and, and honestly, more important than education, the years and years and years of technical experimentation on a, in, in a personal sense. Um, and that's the main thing I wanted to touch on. Advancements in an independent sense can circumvent the need for large amounts of funding or imaging you know software and imaging machines and that's kind of what we've been doing and, and christopher has been instrumental the main orchestrator of that um i did put here it's uh based on dr mark moody's nasa you know he's a nasa alumni theories and pilot waves that's not correct um it is uh we, we've, we've made developments majorly based on that and it's been a, a extremely instrumental but his work are entirely Christopher's and, and me, myself, and, and all the consultants that work with him are basing everything off of data that he's provided based off of 40 plus years of work. So it's not necessarily based on Dr. Mark Moody's work, but I did want to mention him here because he's been instrumental in assuring constants and, and, and things like that. Um, so here, the third point here. Um, one thing I wanted to make very well known. Within a small, um, a very limited uh, group of, of scientists with the correct um, education, but not only the correct education, but the, uh, the correct, uh, you know, procedure for experiments and stuff. It, and especially if you have engineered materials, you can quickly circumvent large amounts of funding machines, uh, imaging machines, photon imaging, the systems that NASA uses for gravity can be completely circumvented by unconventional materials, which greatly advances experimental data in a way more accessible way than has typically been available to people. So that's what we've been doing uh, and, and it works very well. So uh, the last slide here, we have an array of outside consultants um, that verify the data we produce. I, I identified one, my very great friend, Richard Muller, who is a BS of material science. And, and 
it's very easy to create a very confined group of extremely extremely knowledgeable people and then also correlate that with outside data verification experimental verification and you have a very quick route to basically circumvent peer review i, I mean i believe wholeheartedly that data and and experimental um, output greatly reduces the need for anything like peer review, especially if you have a self-contained system where people are able to cross-verify, you're able to get around million-dollar machines, and I will. I have tons of pictures, as you'll see. Um, but that type of experimentation is the main point. Is this information, all of the information here in this presentation, and everybody else's is accessible? You don't need a degree. You don't need advanced machines or, or or funding or anything if you know what you're doing you can kind of build these systems so if we could go to the next slide that'd be awesome okay so uh here we go the metamaterials armor okay and these are the properties of the 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 metamaterials armor and here here right here um Oh, nope, not at all. Nope. Wait, sorry, one second. Let me get this fixed. But essentially, uh, this this armor here um, is uh, radioactivity diffusing. It maintains an electric uh, magnetic field. It's a uh, compression force. Uh, it, it requires, it, it, it maintains abrasion protection, impact protection, and enhancement, which is interesting, not just protection. You can distribute impact pretty evenly um, across pretty much anything. Like you could affix it to an object and hit it with the object. It's going to display anomalous properties of impact. That's something I found very interesting, which is still under investigation. I can provide technical details about that. But as I, yeah, as I said, it's still under investigation. Contactless magnetic engineering of these uh, materials is uh, astonishing i mean uh, basically you can use the material to circumvent the need for a circuit board you can uh, uh fixing things to things with screwing and that makes uh a, a lot of advancements that are typically not very accessible along with the anomalous properties of the material very accessible and i have been as you'll see in these slides uh we have we're about to go over probably a year, six months before I had access to the engineered materials physically, I made uh, basically off of sentences of text interpretations on physics wise, what is going on here. Um, and, and he was describing to me light emissions through the metamaterials with systems like this one right here. And there you go. I mean, I'll, I'll try to do that again. But Contactless engineering is amazing, and I've been studying that a lot. You can, I, I've greatly reduced components and, uh, and and other things by just routing the wires through the magnetic field. And that's pretty interesting. And that's what Curtis was talking about, too, is, is all the vectors are, are related. There, there is no difference between uh, EM, between dark matter, dark energy. You just need to figure out the interplay between those things. So I've been experimenting with all these things on the screen here. And I have some pictures uh, right here, this guy. Um, sorry, I'm not good at perspective, but uh, I've been experimenting with contactless engineering. Um, nothing in here has, there's a few minor wire connections, but other than that, everything is contactless. I mean, the, the material itself maintains an uh, electromagnetic field, which is very easy to not only manipulate, but study outputs up. So if we go here to this um, small picture, which I cannot see at all, um, we're gonna talk a bit about how I can, uh, how different fields are evidenced through this material, including gravity waves. And if you look at that picture here, you'll clearly see that. And uh, Oops, and it looks like Alex froze out there for a second. Alex, are you can can you still talk, or have we lost you? Uh, 
I'm going to keep moving just in case. <laughs> Well, and we do, uh, Chris, thank you for loading your slide deck. So we do have your slide deck while we're yep. waiting for Alex here. We'll see. He should be back in just a sec. And if not, we can always jump over to that and come back to it. And he had the some Met videos as well. Yeah, the Metal material. Oops, got... there he goes. Okay, let's see if he comes back in. And, and if not, we can switch gears. Mr. Toby, until he comes back. Oh, there he is. Okay, let me see. I logged in the back. There we go, Alex. You were back. Sir. Sorry about that. And uh, yeah, my my connection is not uh, uh, Ivy League. I'll say. Oh, that's fine. Let me take myself back out and uh, yeah, just continue and let me know when to change slides, sir. Thank you. If I do cut out here, I'll be right back on. Um. But this is uh, detailing some of the experiments and that, that's some of the things as well. Um, you can easily circumvent multi-million dollar imaging machines by nanoscale engineered materials, which circumvent the need for those things. And that's what we've been doing, not only what we've been doing, but what we've been verifying with experimental data and outside uh, consultants such as Richard Muller, who is great. Um, so if we could go to the next slide. Okay, let's see. So here we have uh, what I was talking about earlier, non-binary representation of light emissions, of photons, basically. Uh, and, and I will be honest in saying, I don't know what a, what a human or person or, or, or eyesight interprets as a wave versus a, a propagated wave versus a particle is accurate. And, and this is a good way to circumvent that. There's copious studies on this. and. And so uh, from my perspective, it's it's pretty easy with the materials that are nanoscale engineered to mimic double slit experiments. And, and basically you'll see on the bottom there, double slit, uh, you know, two eyes or, or, or one slit versus, you know. So I, I interpret that as positioning the photon as a wave on the bottom. I interpret the top as positioning it as a particle. I also, interpret that as completely subjective it's it's both correct and and that has been evidenced um by not only our experimental data and the engineered materials but the, if you i don't know if there will be a link or whatever but we have a non-euclidean model for a toe which i also said i believe is non-binary i believe there's the endless amounts of that which you can't calculate certain things like uh, like what Curtis was talking about, correlations between different vectors. It's basically impossible with, with Euclidean math. So we've been focusing on that. I've been trying to, and right here, this data I got is far before I had the physical materials. It's far before I had anything. All I had was a few paragraphs of information about a description of a video of light emissions through the metamaterial. And we're going to correlate that here in the next coming uh, the slides with the actual experimental results once I had maintained the materials and, and had a good understanding of how to experiment with them, which did take a while. Um, but you'll see here in the next slide, it, it's perfectly mimicked. And, and you'll also see from the other slides that light is evidenced not only as a wave, but as a particle simultaneously, which has been instrumental in advancing the materials. Christopher, I think, inherently already knew this always and, and um, kind of brought me on to figure it out on my own once I could independently peer review these materials. Uh, and it's been painstakingly slow, I'm not gonna lie. Uh, I, I'm very busy and, but, but what little data I have gotten is extremely, extremely lined up with what I, what I, um, based on physics, known physics principles, interpreted based off of the described data. And I did that on purpose because I wanted to have no information and correlate it later with actual experimental technical data on the, the materials, which perfectly matches up. 
and it's good to keep in mind as well, um, the paper I have published on the toe, the, the non-Euclidean toe, is been instrumental in helping some things, advancing some things, but uh, no, I wouldn't say advancing. I'd say um, analyzing data, it's been very useful for, because it's not gonna change the physical output of any measurements you get, but it has helped us make a lot of sense about what's going on here. So if we could go to the next slide. Okay, here you go. I mean, this is uh, the, oscillating metamaterials setup. So what this is, is it runs a frequency and, and I can determine the frequency. Uh, as Curtis said, I had to find a numerical value for that toe. It was mainly based off of uh, variables and and stuff from general relative, uh, re relativity, such as GIJ, which represents the localized space perturbation and in, in, in localized space, stuff like that. And you, it, and that's an interesting thing too. You don't need to know the numerical values to calculate with it. All you need to know is the measurements of the input. So calculating the numerical values of an equivalent toe to everything that can count for a gravity affecting constant has been tough because you don't need that really to know. You, it's almost unnecessary inconsequential data because as long as you're inputting measurements, it doesn't have any bearing on what you're doing. Um, but here we clearly see, and, and you'll see from the, the other um, slides, there's very clear activity of hair-like structures right there. I mean, I did that with, with very little imaging uh, access. You can see the double slit pattern, which I believe indicates a wave, which also based off of my education and experience is just my educated opinion, but I would assume that's the wave formation of the light or the photons or the emissions, however you want to define that. And this here picture is just uh, based on this little setup. It oscillates, it blasts the frequency through. It, it stimulates the material, which is magnetic, through electromagnetics. There's a, a bunch of very strong magnets and also an electromagnetic currency ran through. And when you get all those three things in unison, you, you start to be able to easily visualize some very strange behavior. And also this here is not through a typical camera lens. We have a, uh, uh, what's called a Chroma X filter, which, which makes it easier to, and, and you can read all about that. Uh, I'm not sure if that'll be linked or what, but if you look up my name, Alex Wolf the third on Google, you'll be able to find research about those filters and it makes it very easy to do what we're saying, circumvent a million dollar machine, circumvent the need for excessive amounts of funding to do research. And I will also keep open to everyone in this group. These materials are very openly available. Um, anybody who talks to me or Chris, uh, if you want any information about how this setup works and stuff, because clearly uh, I do I do fully believe, and I have mathematical um calculation, mathematic calculation, whatever you want to say with the ale or not, about this picture here correlating to a wave propagation. And then, and then you'll see in the, the next pictures, it's clearly a particle. So I do believe depending on observation and, and measurement, it can be completely dependent. This here, picture here, the, the hair-like imaging here. Um, that is ran through the filter we have, the proprietary uh, Chromax filter, which they don't make anymore. And it makes it very easy to identify and visualize, um, um, you know, photonic emissions, light emissions, gravity effects and stuff. And as long as you can correlate directly with a non-Euclidean model, what the physical data is saying in an image, it's very easy to verify that type of thing. So that's what we've been taking advantage of. and. I, I am fully uh, uh, in relation to Curtis wanting him be seeming on the right path to, to look at that type of uh, thought process because it really, I do believe is non-binary and, and a lot of the stuff he was saying, uh, almost all of it actually, to be honest, seemed completely on point. So I would like to, yeah, if we could go on to the next slide here. Okay, 
So how are photonic activity, light emissions, and EM, as well as space-time and gravity studied in a simple and accessible way? Christopher, I don't want to, like, I've been talking a lot. So if you wanted to take this one on. That's fine. I'll tell you. Yeah, go ahead. You want to carry on with your with your slides? Oh, uh, sorry. Oh, you want me to finish? Yeah, you finish it. Okay, so uh, this slide here yeah, is kind yeah, of redundant. I, I, Alex, I mean, sorry. I, I would I, say I, yeah. Fi finish, finish with your slide. Finish with your slide deck, and then we'll just bring Chris on after that. I know we have some videos perfect. too, but perfect, perfect. Yeah. Um. Uh, Tim, are we able to bring up any videos that I uploaded of the mission light emission videos or anything? Yeah, I can actually. So what I need to do is I, I will share those and we, we will cross our fingers here a little bit. Yeah, share uh, that link. It's a bundle of links. So Okay. Um, well, and that's okay. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna there we go. Okay. So let me And I'll talk on that while you bring it up too. Um we have the light emission videos, which clearly evidence photonic activity, light emissions, and give uh, mass to the particle of light. Um, not only that, but from material science, I don't know shit about, oh, sorry, I don't know stuff about quantum physics perspective. It is a very small surface area. What you're seeing in some of those videos is a stimulated magnet attached to scissors, literally. And um, it's able to move a, a material with probably 40 or 50 times the mass of it just from running it through that this one here you see that's a smaller piece and um that what that is i have uh, electrical stimulation going on at the top of those scissors my instrument my very fancy instrument and all you do is just put above it i i i put that surface with conductive gel and 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 just pulled it it would not move whatsoever at all without the gel and I thought that was interesting. Uh, that whole surface, that little notebook there is coated in conductive gel. Once I ran a current through the scissors and put it above the material, I was getting some pretty crazy pulls, basically tractor beaming um, off of this conductive surface that had a light layer of, of the gel. So that's what you're seeing uh, here. And Alex, let, let me know when to go to the next one, sir, because you sent me yeah, four of those videos. Oh, yes, yeah, okay. sorry. <laughs> Oh, no, that's okay. That's okay. Just let me know. And then here's another one. Electrically stimulated the metamaterials, pulled out the wire and set it down. Um, the, the current runs through the material. And that's interesting as well. It, it's not generally as electromagnetic study goes, or it's a, going all along the outside. If you stick a wire in that, which looks very messed up based off of the video, but I pulled out the wire for the electrical simulation which was just a basic electrical wire but between the two porting layers stuck it in stuck a magnet in there and pushed it on the material with the with the conductive gel on the surface it basically glides i mean it's pretty cool um so if we could, yeah and here is the light emission setup i was speaking of you can see those uh particle indicating waves here and and i'll be honest in saying as well a lot of these emissions we're still studying. We don't, we think, I suspect, Christopher <laughs> probably feels different, but I suspect highly these are photons. He thinks it might be something unidentified or electrons even. Um, but you can look at different areas of the light emissions and I, that's, that supports the contactless engineering here as well. There's no components connected. There's no wires. There's no anything. It's all ran through the, the electromagnetic field produced by just the armor, which I think is very interesting because we're actually scrapping this armor for a more advanced model. And even the arm, the models being scrapped are, are going to provide endless research for stuff like that. And it does look weird. I mean, just, just as a human being looking at it, not knowing anything about science, I'm going to say that looks not normal. And we're running it through the Chroma X filter here. And then you know, you get material scientists, you get your own information, and you just consult for free. I mean, I mean, it doesn't have to be for free, but that's been extremely useful. You get, I have a large network of PhDs and stuff from 
or even uh, just BSs, or even just independent researchers, not even, even just independent researchers are important. But once you have all those people analyzing the footage frame by frame, or let's assume 24 frames per second between 20 people that are in my network of people who approve of my work, you're going to see a lot of variation between how they interpret the data and then a lot of correlation between the things that they all had in common. And that's my goal uh, at working with Christopher is I take a lot of his data, which he's heavily proven, he's heavily provided evidence for and seek outside consultation and my own consultation to verify that in theoretical and mathematical constructs. Um, here you go is the, uh, the, the materials again. On the left, you're going to see the oscillation set up for the frequency, the light and running it through the material, which is, again, I cannot probably get into the specifics of how that's engineered, but it's nanoscale engineered. Um, and uh, it, it, it is, it, it's nanoscale engineered, which it will create some very weird effects. And it, I, the middle there is the gravity and time displacement warp core, which we have written on and provided endless amounts of proof of. Uh, if you, again, just Google my name, Alex Wolf III, You'll see that as the most popular research thing we've published. A couple thousand readers have looked at that, talked to many doctors who had questions or were trying to construct similar things. That middle part, purely for gravity and space time study. Um, and that that's, I'm not gonna get into that, And it, but uh, there is a whole paper published. It's about 40 paper pages long. Um, Christopher, I don't know if you can link that here. On the right, we have, a shin plate, I believe, for the armor. And uh, armor has all those properties I discussed, you know, reducing radiation, reducing abrasion, reducing or enhancing impact. Um, and it's been uh, amazing because I, I was thinking that as materials stress testing. And I didn't start submitting it to analytical testing until about a week before this because I was thinking it purely hit it with stuff, shoot it with stuff, run it over with a car. Have your dad hit it with a bat uh you know it, it that stopping thinking like that i thought of nanoscale engineering and decided to apply it analytically and that's how you got the setup such as the one i just showed you i was surprised to find out verifying christopher's work that there was a lot of light emissions that indicated anomalous properties based off of that um the back of that material on the right, the golden looking one, is a mess screen that protects from abrasion. The middle one, well, there's a whole paper on that. It's a compression forged material, and, and we've been getting small ra small outages, small measurements that indicate uh, manipulation of or, or variation of space time and also gravity. Um, and I will be honest in saying it's not, we don't have a time machine. It's It's working towards something bigger when you realize very small analytical measurements that indicate something weird. And that's what we've been doing in combination with circumventing a lot of machines and a lot of funding, which we still do between all of us have some funding, but it's been a lot easier um, to do it that way. Just and, and And yeah, so these three materials here, it's on the left, I'll go again, the oscillation frequency and light emission set up the middle study for uh, that that's the toroidal piece or is space time and gravity perturbations and then on the right pure armor but all of and, it affects light uh and i can do you want me to go into the next slide for you now yes please or, thank you okay thank you. um and and here we go so this slide is a little confusing let me get in closer this is uh an experimental uh, or not experimental. This is a, a, a prediction I had based off of the available data when I had basically nothing about this. Um, I had a description of a video of the light emissions, which honestly, I'm going to be honest, probably Christopher's time hearing this, I didn't watch at that time. But I had a very detailed description of the video. I had some minor information and I decided it would be an indispensable time for future me, future Alex to figure out, does it line up with what I'm finding with the material studies? I was studying the negative refraction index. So I came up with this little equation here. And 
So the uh, N1 and N2 are the refractive indices. So that just means how light's bending, um, respectively, to different points on the material. Um, O1 and O2 are the angles of incidence and refraction. So basically, that's um, what I had calculated as highly technical uh, angles and stuff. Uh, I don't really feel like I need to get into that or be like overly technical about that. Uh, so the net, the metamaterials, regardless, which is what I found, armor, uh, the toroidal piece there for space-time perturbations, they can have negative refraction indices. And this equation is how that is accounted for in accepted physics. Um, and I was interpreting and expecting far before that that that's what it would be like. Uh, you know, that, you know, and, and for example, blue shift. I had interpreted likely is going to have a negative refraction index allowing light through the material, as you'll see in my later pictures. You can see fully through it in the blue spectrum, validating my interpretations later with the material science. And on other spectrums, you don't see it. On other spectrums, you see the obviously material is black, but you can't see through it. Um, but yeah, okay, so let's see. Expected NRI, negative refraction index rendering invisible basically or, or 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 lights able to go through it i expect it as well lensing on red lensing is very interesting with this material and uh, uh, reviewing christopher's materials i've found that one of the most interesting things with the filter and sometimes without it is you can look at components in a very small setup basically nano components the size of a grain of salt and if you focus upon them and shine right light in the right way, which I'm pretty sure I have some videos of, I might need to upload or publish later, but I'm pretty sure I have that. It'll repeat the image in the array of the horizontal gravity wave that that's getting emitted from that, where you can see the re image repeated over and over again, and it eventually cuts off. But you can look at those copies to see greater detail of small components of something that you're working on which I've been using to engineer a lot because it, you can see something super tiny and I have horrible eyesight. Um, both of those were experimentally validated by the images you're about to see. So if we could, uh, if we could go ahead. Oh, so yeah. Okay. Yeah. So let's see, these were some predictions, predictions versus outcome that that's what I'm saying about data and experimentation superseding the need for peer review. It's, it speaks for itself, especially with the self-contained kind of little collaborative think tank we have where people can cross verify each other's work and have no predilection to saying somebody's correct. You know, it's, it provides a great way to quickly advance things as long as you can remove the aspect of needing validation from the greater scientific community. It's, it's great. And, and, and also numerically, there's no way to argue that it, it seems pointless to me to do things like peer review. But I have, but also it slows down a lot. So these are my interpretations, and they were all proven right um, based off of the small amount of metamaterial material I had. I, I predicted that you know blue is gonna basically, I said reverse the polarity of blue light. I guess by that I meant negative refraction index for the things I just showed you. And clearly, I'm gonna. I have some pictures later where you can see it coming straight through uh, compared to other frequencies of light where you can't. It comes straight through, and uh, so I I spoke on that a little a little bit. Completely cancels out the purple light. It goes through all the colors of the spectrum, uh, just so we can study the emissions. And these emissions are minor. We're not saying we have a time machine. We're not saying we have a UAP. We're saying, based off of the data we have, it is progressing very 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 fast. Because you can get information like that, small information of small measurement changes and then build on it very quickly especially with non-euclidean model um that last one there i could explain that but i don't want to get into into the math of that so we'll go <laughs> uh, but another one lensing i talked about that on the red shift opposite of blue interesting blue has let through light through the material red results in that repeating pattern in a horizontal shift when you focus on stuff especially oh well especially through the lens sometimes without it so that that's pretty much it i put other predictions but uh you know i messed that up that ignore that okay let's go to the next one
Okay. So now uh, I wanted to have this just be a question mark. Uh, the, the, the framework I've published on uh, is what got me and Christopher. I'm, I'm doing that like a grandparent, grandparent video chatting. But uh, sorry, I, I wasn't really looking at my camera. But uh, how do the metamaterials relate to the ESCA A3? Uh, the, the, basically, the, the theory of everything, the non-Euclidean framework we use. I can say a few things about that I've seen and I have uploaded on my research page countless, or, you know, countless examples of... Uh, uh, Mess me when you get there. Sorry, sorry. Um, so my wife is leaving to work, sorry. Um, but so basically, we have countless examples of consultants or people we work with, myself or Christopher, using those equations to further not only his work, but mine. It's easily calculable. We have a published uh, paper, uh, document, I guess, of pen to paper calculations, which is the simplest method available of authentication for that. And it scales all the way up to AI and computation verification. Um, so basically, it's impossible to tell the pull between different vectors that are affecting space time and gravity consistently with any Euclidean model. So sometimes when we have to verify data or check data, we've been using non Euclidean models such as that one, which are verified mathematically consistent to calculate what's going on and how to further enhance the materials. And since we have a self contained method of verification, it's very fast. Like you, I could probably send an email to the collaborators or the think tank that we're in and uh, probably get a response on how uh, magnetism was affecting the material and how to enhance the material within like what, like a, like an hour. So that, that makes things very fast. You don't need to get bureaucracy, verification, funding, anything, because a lot of the people involved too have verific uh, have a uh, either personal or independent funds or access to funding, and that's uh, and that's been great too. But you don't need that. You 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 can use analog basically systems to do the equivalent, and it's more work and more involved. But I don't believe that should count, uh, you know compute to spending more money, and that one of the major aspects of that is. These functional non-Euclidean models, which you need to be able to account for both easy, like a quantum mechanics, okay, calculate with it. It should, if you see any model that you're suspecting should work for that, get an output and then compare it to the GR output. The difference should be negligible. Like, uh, like if you account for the differences between measurement, the difference should be measurable. And there's literally, I found maybe, I'd say two to five very involved researchers I work with PhD wise who have their own versions and it calculates like, but only sometimes for specific things. And that's how we've cut down on a lot of, a lot of the cost by, by using these non Euclidean models. And it gives you data that otherwise, if you're using a Euclidean model would require a massive amounts of funding and b massive amounts of energy. So it's been great circumventing that. And if we could get to that. Yeah, Alex, if it's okay. So we are at 2.40 now. And what my thought was is that we should go to Chris at the top of the hour. Oh, so yeah, 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 yeah. Go ahead. I think you have three You have three slides left. And so I, I was thinking that would probably work pretty well in terms of timing, if you're okay with that. How many minutes should I give each one? One minute each one? Is that okay? No, no, like five five minutes each one maybe or something. Oh, okay, I, okay. Yeah. yeah, I don't even need remotely that much time. Thank you. Yeah. Um. So here we got some of the different emission spectrums from this uh, EM stimulated setup of the metamaterials, which does maintain its own magnetic field. Interesting because the material breaks, it's cloth like, and uh, it's very weird. Cause like I said, I was submitting the metamaterials armor that Christopher developed to stress testing. I didn't think of it analytically at all. Once I did, I got stuff like this. That piece you see on there is I believe a uh, breastplate a breastplate for the metamaterials materials armor we have now with all the properties that I had indicated. Um, so here I said on blue, you, you know, you see a, a, an inverse shift from blue to red. And, and that's interesting because of what I spoke about. Blue is very good for negative refraction index and red is very good for lensing. So the quick shift between those two 
indicates a lot of activity that I'm still investigating and I'm not going to pretend like I know what's going on there. Um, uh, Christopher had said here, uh, detailed as quadruple layering of light, um, evidence of inertia slash rotation. Well, this set setup is oscillating and um, really helps visualize things, especially with the EM going through. Um, here we have here we have the blue light to purple light shift, um, evidencing anti-gravity as a horizontal lamination of light. Um, in parentheses there, I put interesting photon clusters to the central left of the image. That might be cropped out, but there is sometimes when you run these on red, weird spots where it's gonna, like the longer you take a video, even if it's a lens artifact, it will like change really weirdly. And I'm still investigating that like, will get very bright, like a dense red spot underneath that um, emission there for a uh, blue light to purple light, the second one. Oftentimes there'll be a, a really dense, very visible, like basically looks like a laser point underneath it that just keeps getting stronger the longer you record that isn't visible by the human eye. I thought that was interesting. And I don't know the implications. Maybe somebody here can figure that out. Um, and now we have the horizontal effect of the uh, potential anti-gravity. That's been interesting because, as you can see, it's not evidenced on every single col like, uh, color shift. It's different color shifts have different properties. And I think people should think more about why the things they're looking at have quantum explanations. And uh, that's kind of what we're doing. Um, we have found that gravity waves are easily imaged uh, vertically. So, yeah, and that's the last picture there. The, the red and purple spectrum seem to get the most. Blue seems to kind of diffuse it and let stuff through. So I'm still kind of trying to study the implications of that. If we could go to the next one. Here we go. That one kind of looks like a supernova. I'm proud of that one. You can see some hair-like structures there that I thought were photons, but maybe electrons or something undefined. Maybe somebody else can figure that out. And uh, this is what I'm talking about is some some machines take a lot of money to get similar images by creating materials science, circum like a way to circumvent that. You don't need a machine. You need materially, the, you're, you need engineered materials, nanoscale materials where you can circumvent those machines. And that's what I did. That's what we all do in our little collaborative group here is, is try to find ways to get these images to advance experimentation very quick without the need for massive funding or anything. Um, so here we go. It, there's a the yellow to red transition is very interesting. And I'll be honest in saying that I'm still studying that. So I can clearly see compared to some photonic imaging I've seen um, and potentially what they assume is gravity imaging. Um, similar things there's very fine detail and and nothing was really needed beyond the nano scale or nano engineered materials nano scale engineered materials um to get pictures like that um and, and then all you need to do is use the non-euclidean models to run that sometimes i'm going to be honest i use ai i'll run that through ai with uh, the non-euclidean model it'll tell me all the implications boom 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 like it doesn't necessarily replace intelligence, but greatly aids in it. So that's been a, a very important part. I can run images like that through but through AI. We have a proprietary AI that we use for engineering um, that I worked with Mark Moody on from the NAS alumni, and it'll spit out, um, like you, you can put in hundreds of pages of data, and it'll start working with you very easily on how to interpret pictures and stuff. So that's part of what we've been doing is, running pictures like this through. That's not necessarily my interpretation. It's Christopher is based on all his experimentation, mine based off of my education and experimentation, and then combined with the AI, we only really talk about things where all three of those agree. Um, and then here we have the crimson white yellow transition of the, the, the light emission. You should be able to see some photonic particles if you make that big. It might be a little messed up. I, I think maybe the image on the left is better than that. Um, we do suspect that the atoms could be electrons or something unknown, like uh, something dark in nature, and, and at least evidence is for sure gravity and mass, it looks like. So if we could go to the next one. 
Now, this is the last slide before I give it up to Christopher, but I I was hilariously unspecific about my secretary slash awesome wife making this slide because I don't think it required a lot of detail, especially with the scientists here. You can see how manipulating these things and controlling them to an infinitesimally small degree and figuring out how to do that mechanically and engineering wise is going to directly relate to propulsion. There's not a single thing I really discussed that couldn't be applied to propulsion in some way by just simply thinking about the equations that would be required to make a system like that. The anti-gravity waves, the photonic emission, all that stuff, it all directly relates. And pretty much nothing here was mentioned that didn't have a relation to propulsion in some way, however roundabout. So I'll give it to Christopher now. And that's uh, that's pretty much all I have to say um, to Curtis. Uh, if you want to email us, we have tons of data about detailing those covariance differences and how to account for them um, in a non-Euclidean model. So I, yeah, that's available if you need it and I'm done pretty much. Thank you. Awesome. Awesome. So you know what? Let me, let me do this. I'm going to bring, let me see. I'm going to add, we don't have that many people with us. Yeah. Jeremy's no, there. No. Okay. It, folks are just kind of wandering around. I'm going to bring them in as we can. Let's give a giant hand. He looks happy. To He's smiling. Bull, the third. Oops. And there's there's Jared. We'll bring Jared in. Alex, thank you. Thank you so much. And again, that was build up. Alex has been doing work to to work alongside with Christopher Mailer. So we're, we're a little bit out of order, but it still is absolutely wonderful. Alex, thank you so much. Thank you so much. And as your guys' work moves forward, um, I would, you know, love to have you guys back for updates. So what, what I think what I'm going to do right now is I will take everybody out. Oh, I love Drew's, I love Drew's puppet there. I'll take everybody oh, out yeah. except for Christopher, and and then we will put his presentation up. And then Alex, I'll bring you back in for Q and A if that works. Oh yeah, he's the smartest of all of us. Let, let him. Okay, okay. So Christopher, sir, you the, okay? And let me put your presentation up. Perfect. And you uploaded this, so you should be able to use the back and forth buttons. And yeah. it looks like you got about 20 slides there. So what I will do is take myself out. Um, you, your voice has been a little faint. If you're able to speak up or, or move the mic, that might my, help. I'll do my best. Uh, Thank you, sir. Okay, so my name's Christopher. I'm not used to talking to people. It's the first one of these. Um, presentations I've done online. Um, I tend to be in the lab more researching and experimenting. So I set up WTRC four years ago. I've been working to develop uh, a functional warp core for seven, 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 seven or eight years now. And um, I've gone through multiple stages of development to get to where I am. So basically, my field of expertise is in distortion mechanics. I don't use conventional methodologies to use uh, to develop toroidal systems. I use um, a means of distorting the current as it travels from point A to point B to generate an, an effect, and then I apply that effect to keep the an equal opposite effect, you generate a new a new distortion effect. And I employ those distortion effects to build a warp core. So I know it sounds complicated, but so based on um, fields instead of currents. And that's the best way to explain it. So I'm looking at distortions within fields. So you have you have an electromagnetic field which is quite fluidic and then it's about generating uh, a variable within that fluidic field to create um, an impact that will benefit you towards the object of your uh, or purpose that you're driving towards. So in my case, it's a warp core. A warp core needs to generate a warpage, and that warpage needs to generate an effect. I use quantum um, energy quantum technologies to power my work core. It's not powered by any man-made electrical system. 
I don't use electricity, I don't use lipo batteries or lithium batteries or any other power source. Everything comes from the subquantum. And I think that's a very critical start from where I'm going. So if we move to the next slide. Um, I came into physics on a tangent. I was working to develop a new type of ground penetrating, ground, ground penetrating radar system to detect skeletal remains. Skeletal remains are neutral materials. There's no iron in, in calcium or in, in bone. Um, and that's a reality. So you can't detect bone with normal uh, ground penetrating radar systems. So I worked on developing a new type going through um, saturation theory into elongated magnetic field theory, where I elongated the magnetic field 10.5 meters. And then from there, I moved into warp technology where I distorted that elongated magnetic field to produce the world's first warp field. Um, at least, as far as I know, it's the world's first one. Um, so, moving from there, I stuck with that with the Beetle Bomb project. So, the Beetle Bomb project was the very first true warp core I built. And it's the first warp core to displace zero inertia, which is a severe of neutral energy. It's not true energy, it's more like um, entropy, if you like. When you displace that from the field, from the warp core, you generate elliptic slices. Those elliptic slices are uh, split into two segments, one and then a second one, at maybe two or three meters apart. And they're quite large, you can stand inside them. Within those fields, there is no energy, no electricity, no magnetism of any kind. You get you read a zero using an EM field detector. So for measuring radiation or measuring your television, your computer, the space you're in, that's what you use, measure the electromagnetic field. Inside that zero mesh field, there's nothing. And any radiation in your body is removed. So you know it's a it's a really useful new advance for the medical fraternity. Beat Bomb was the first true walk called to be able to do it. It's the one that's led me to where I'm standing today. I have developed a lot more than 70 prototypes, but I lost count a long time ago. So WTLC used it. We're approaching this from a completely new perspective. The walk core, which is quantum based, takes energy out of the quantum field. We displace zero inertia to create a zero inertia bubble. At the parameter of that warp bubble, there are two fields. One of them is an EM field, which is the symmetric asymmetric electromagnetic field. The second one is the zero inertia distortion field, where all the energies have been compressed to the parameter of the uh, warp field, the warp bubble, and they're rotating. But as they rotate, they generate new um, exotic distortions within the field. And that's the best way to describe it. Within the zero energy pocket, where there is no uh, radiation, no electromagnetism, no damage and harmful, there are some uh, displaced quantum particles, and they're called quantum dots. But very recently, we have evidenced these as quantum stars. They are spherical, they have an, an axis, they rotate, and they have a corona, they emit um, mass as ejections, the way the sun does. If you look at the sun, when it emits, um, it fires out um, plasma from, from, the, from the sun, that's the same thing as a, a, um, a quantum dot, which is a quantum star. And what the implication is, when you go subquantum, there is a quantum universe. And we don't really know, understand the quantum dot totally yet, but my perspective is within the quantum bubble, 
and bending space. And that quantum dot, that quantum star, is connected to the meta universe. And I don't mean anything to do with um, Google <laughs> or, um, or or their, or their um, metaverse. I'm talking about our our universe, our cosmos. Um, so I think these these quantum dots are tied to the, tied to those stars, and that's part of my research is looking to see if there are any objects moving around them. Um, which could be classed as planets, if you like, quantum, sub-quantum planets around these stars. If there are, then that establishes something very important, because that means there's a possibility that these quantum dots are connected to the stars in our universe, the universe itself, which means if you pull on these quantum dots, you move from here to that star system, and it's done instantly. Which is why you have this field, which is why you have the a warp, um, warp field, and it's why I'm researching metamaterials which interact with that warp field. And part of my research is about developing a metamaterial that is collaborative and works in harmony with this warp core to achieve an objective, which is to go obviously beyond our solar system. So this is very intricate and complicated research. It's diverse, there's lots of uh, fields. I inter interact with many scientists around the world um, connected to different aspects of this and they relate to zero point energy as quantum energy, um, something I've achieved um, and evidence powering different devices like motors and uh, lasers and things like that. So the warp core, I'm currently building it called Anum. It's um, an ancient name, it goes back to Ireland and the indigenous population. Um, we shall move to the next slide and we'll carry on with this. So this next slide, this is to do with um, micro warp cores. The micro warp cores are part of my research. I use them for geometric uh, amplification and to study the geometric layout of the EM field and how you can apply it. And there are different ones. This is the very first warp core on the planet to produce zero point energy that I know of, has a direct voltage. So it only produced one volt, it's the star. And from there, you go to the other warp core, micro warp core, which produced 98.6 uh, volts. And that visibly shows in the image, LEDs and the laser being uh, powered. And that's mostly through um, a thing called negative induction. So with negative induction, if you think of the um, nuclear power plants producing a positive energy, there there's also a negative energy underlay beneath that field. And by not, by tapping into that negative energy through a single uh, earth connection, you can draw quantum energy out of the quantum field to power other items, other devices, um, like the laser, like the LEDs, and any motor that most of them are powerful, like a couple of 12 volt motors and lasers and uh, a few other things. But we started it's a new piece of research, it's new innovation, and it's um, a process. And solar power started somewhere. It's taken a long time for them to get to where they are. Same goes for nuclear power, I guess, same goes for everybody else. Zero point ten years to start and it has a long way to go. And the fact that we can draw upon like a zero point energy as a current. And the empower through small things, it means it's refined. And from here, we can move forward. And the same goes for the warp core, the same goes for everything else. The second image on the um, slide that relates to quantum particles. And looking at the space around the warp core with diverse cameras, I have 22 different cameras looking at this thing, 
you can see them in different lenses and under different filters and different types of camera and they can evidence uh, multiple uh, uh, changes within the atmosphere because this is a zero inertia pocket where I stand in. There's um, I'm quite healthy in this place. But what you can see is an, uh, an environment that is quite excited. All the particles display quantum light and that comes from the quantum field. So you can see zero point energy has um, been triggered by quantum light because it, you can see it in flowing as a fluorescent uh, transmission, which is very interesting. And I'm studying a great many things connected to this, along with quantum dots, quantum stars, because um, it's all part and parcel of the process. And um, it's one of the reasons why maybe some, um, we'll call it, call it tic tacs or an identified alien crowd, maybe and emitting some light colors, it may be connected to quantum displacement. So as the field expands, as the zero inertia field expands, those colors become um, transmit, um, displaced further and further from the warp core, maybe to the outside of the warp core, outside of the warp field. And um, that might explain some aspects of this. So unlike other theories, I'm not relying on just a warp core to achieve warp propulsion. The warp core itself is um, its not necessarily a, um, a power source like a, a rocket engine or anything like that. It's far more advanced and you have to think of it, think of it in a far more advanced way where the quantum energy interacts with the meta hull to achieve a status of symbiosis and together they form another reactive state that you achieve or propulsion or um, as um, oh what his name I think it was Kurtz I think Kurtz was talking touched upon uh, temporal distortions well part of the warp field does generate temporal distortions which are quantum-based uh, gravity impact. And these quantum-based gravity impacts can mean that in the future, and I am experimenting with um, temporal control, to, I've been able to adjust time distortions on atomic clocks, setting back to neutral, to zero, and then we're working now to see if we can accelerate those time distortions which are currently running at one hour and 24 seconds forward and 24 seconds past. The past um, atomic clock was adjusted to back to zero and I lost the one hour and 24 seconds when I re realigned it to the uh, National Physics Laboratory and uh, corrected the time. But since then, it has recovered in the 24 seconds backwards in time. Um, I'll just check it. Yes, it was Curtis. <laughs> I have to keep notes because um, I'll forget. Um, so Curtis did touch upon uh, time. Time is linked to gravity and it is linked to the quantum field, which I'm evidencing. You can adjust time. I've been using 50 and 500 hertz as uh, resonances to try and change time, but it's only touched upon time past. I haven't been able to alter time forward, which is something I'm still working on. So this is um, not a simple um, process of building a, a jet engine. It's quite complicated, but if you want to achieve an anomalous action, like a warp propulsion system or a UAV or something, then you need to move uh, out of the normal realms of physics towards something a little bit more exotic. And by taking this approach, I've been able to evolve the warp core from a toroidal system, which was quite simple, 
um, just like far more exotic animal plants. And when I first started, the only person in the field that I knew of was uh, Harold Sonny White with NASA. He used a very simple toroidal system that was basically a round bar with some copper wire round, wound around it. I've gone way beyond there and developed hundreds of different um, distortion based toroidal systems, which are a, well, a variable. You could say the simplest one is to merge Harold White's um, round bar toroidal capacitor with a Casimir experiment where you use two plates. You wind, if you put a layer of copper between them, and then wind that up around the copper and then merge that with Harold White's toroidal system, then you have a distortion toroidal system. And expanding on those, you can achieve a little bit more than a standard uh, drive system. And I think it's quite important to explain those advantages so that other people can experiment with them. But it's not necessarily about how quickly a current travels from A to B, but how it travels from A to B, and if it can generate another impact or another influence as it travels, which is how I'm approaching the field of uh, one mechanics. Um, so within this, the field is quite extensive. I look at everything. I examine everything that crops up and there's a new things cropping up every single day. The metamaterials, you generate anti-gravity, gravity impacts, you generate uh, some electrical currents with the warp core, it's very similar. And the waveforms between the two are matching up very quickly, as are the resonances generated by, by both. And that's part of the symbiosis process. You need something that will work in harmony. And then ideally, once these items are built through the warp core is completed and we have a fully functional, fully built, full size meta hull within the premise of the warp field, the pilot should be able to interact as a symbiont person between the two components to generate um, a warp drive or a temporal displacement. And this is the theory behind the um, process that I'm approaching and the direction I'm coming from. So there's a lot of new technologies, there's a lot of, lot of new experimental development, and um, most of which haven't even been studied by other people. I have a mass of data, the quantum dot, that I haven't analyzed myself because the time it takes to edit all the videos, which are taken in a completely blacked out room. You can't see anything but black until you edit them. And then you see quantum dots, you see the infrared in the warp core, and you see any other anomalies in the space around you. So you might see um, a temporal portal. It's not really a portal, but it's more like an orb, but it's, um, that's connected to time. And within that temporal or, or sphere, there is a distortion because it separates two times. There's time forward and time past. The biggest experiment I've achieved with that so far is moving past time to the opposite side of the warp field. So where it was negative time, positive time, it's now positive time, negative time. And that's when I cancel out the uh, one hour negative um, incursion into the path. Um, so I, I research and I experiment every single day. I've included videos in this um, presentation so that you can go on to uh, LinkedIn where I release most of my videos. These are of experiments and evidencing them every reactive state. So if I'm working with negative induction, I evidence negative induction like I'm doing behind me. This is um, a reaction between two metamaterials. One is a brand new reaction plate, there's a pair of them, and these are to measure the warp field. And I'm looking for anomalies within the warp field, which will then advance my research forward. It will also then impact upon metamaterial development or a meta hole, which will also advance. 
I developed my own sensors for this and these are nano sensors, they're ultra, ultra small, um, size of a pinhead, you know, they're really small, very thin, they're designed to go between each laminate and either a micro laminates and metamaterials, so they are literally at this camera. Uh, less, than, less than a millimetre in thickness, and you have 64 or so uh, laminates, and they are um, intensely compressed to achieve the metamaterial structures that I'm working towards. I use them for meta, meta material for meta hole development, and I'm using metamaterial body armor to advance meta hole development. So as I pro develop a process to refine meta uh, materials for body armor, removing radiation, they're really good shielding for radiation if there's ever a nuclear attack, then that's what you want to be wearing. Um, great for in space because they were designed to protect you from EM radiation, solar radiation, cosmic radiation. And they are a really good um, shielding. The experiments Alex was doing was testing them to destruction. I wasn't expecting that. But they were designed to take um, micro impacts from micro particles in space. So it's nicely survived. And he was using axes and all sorts of mechanical weapons. Um, I believe in quantum tethering. So I think the quantum, the so quantum field I'm generating in this in this warp bubble is connected to the macroverse. And I do believe that um, the quantum dots, which have evidence as rotating stars, Quantum, quantum size, obviously, and showing that they are formed out of either plasma or gas. And maybe in some parts they are solid, they are maybe you know, have mass like a, I don't know, like a, some type of larger body, I don't know. Um, it's not my field of expertise, expertise in um, astronomy, but. Um, I would I would say um, a physical body maybe that's the best way to explain it. Some of them may have physical properties. I don't know. They, this is just a, a new discovery within the past couple of months. So no, until now, no one's ever seen the quantum dots. They haven't been able to photograph quantum dots until I think it's February 2022 when I released the first one, or I achieved the first quantum dot. In the past two months, I've been able to record a quantum dot rot rotating and evidencing star-like behavior. And that's why I refer to them as quantum stars. And I do believe there's a quantum tether connection. So that might support then quantum mechanics as a science. Um, but we'll see how we progress because the warp field is, is in theory a, mag a magnification system. As normal space folds over the quantum field, then you should see um, the universe in a whole new way. And that's where it's possible that quantum dots are simply reflections of our universe. And I am looking to look for constellations within the makeup of the quantum dots. I have seen some close proximity, but nothing from them matches it. It's still work in progress research. You know, it's just random. Um, so we talked about quantum dots, so we can skip past the next next one because I think I've gone through there. The quantum bubble is the zero inertia field and it is just displaced the radiation. I think we could get radiation detected and evidence of that. But the computer in front of me, 400 millimeters away, I suppose, the radiation coming from that is. A third of the radiation coming from everybody watching this video, uh, this um, program, their computers display higher levels of radiation, and that's because of the quantum field I, I exist in, this uh, zero inertia displaced field, which extends three meters and uh, six meters, okay, four meters and six meters. So it's, it's more oval, like a, an American football ball, a football or a rugby ball in shape. And this is very important. 
I need to measure all these parameters, which is why I'm developing the reaction plates. So then I can design the meta hull to a higher specification and uh, the right shape to fit the parameters of the field. But it has to fit inside this um, warp field for it to function. And that generates then the symbiont connection between meta hull and warp core. Um, so the next slide, we're moving to two beetle bombs, the first one and the second one. The first one was for archaeology. It did succeed in detecting the skull's remains underground, but it lacked range and it was radioactive a little bit, you know, within 1.5 meters. Uh, I have since removed the radiation from the system. Um, the new warp core, you can get within 100 millimeters of it. Uh, before the rate for all the um, radio <laughs> detected uh, start to alarm. It's uh, very low levels of radiation and really, really safe. Um, the second black um, beetle bomb, that was the next stage in the evolution. And uh, the warp call that preceded the Liana warp call that generated uh, a significant amount of um, 0.10 to get 98.61. And um, I stopped the research at that point because it's all about funding. And my priorities are, although they're diverse, and I do try my best to um, research multiple fields, there's a limit to how far you can go within those fields without a serious amount of um, resources behind you. Um, the only thing I would say about zero point energy as well, I only researched it in the first point, first place, because of a professor in Australia called Robert Pope, who was with the Science Art Centre of Australia, and he asked me to um, focus on zero point energy for the, for, for the world's sake. But I wasn't really interested because I was looking at other options. I'm looking at wormholes generation and looking at um, what propulsion system and temporal displacement system. I'm looking to develop a system that can take you from this planet to a planet around another star almost instantly. And this is the direction I am pushing towards, which is why everything I'm doing is intricate to the actual central warp core and that goes with the metamaterial meta -material research the meta hull and the body armor, all the sensors, everything, they're all uh, either meta material based, nano based, or quantum based for the same purpose. And um, it's all about advancing the research. Every prototype leads to the development of another prototype, and that prototype is always more advanced because you have to learn as much as you possibly can on the work you're doing. And even if you have a negative uh, piece of research or everything, you must absorb that, take it on board, and look at why it failed. And do those failures that you done. Because you find new discoveries within failure. And it's always a good um, resource and um, ability to embrace those negatives. And see to turn them into a positive way of moving forward. And it's only through those failures and hurdles that you can actually achieve your objective. And I think it's a very important um, learning lesson to recognize that there are lots of failures before you succeed. And um, in the next slide, we see three different micro warp cores. I've already shown you the AYANG um, micro warp core. The uh, one beneath it is a Liana warp core, which um, evidence zero point energy. The reactor Riffin warp core also evidences zero point energy. 98.6 the things of Liana with a negative induction. And I put these in because I wanted to, wanted to display that without any technical advance, without any really difficult, complicated technology, you can build a warp core that generates 
walnuts of uh, the zero point onion, which is free energy. So for places like Africa and third world countries, this is research that people need to consider. At the centre of the Leanne Le Walk Core, I have a micro walk core, and that's generating stimulation. There's um, a spring action taking place, like uh, mm, a, a flexible uh, EM field, if you want to call it, or a flexible EM thread, and there's a, a rebounding action generates the current in the end. But the negative tether to a negative vortex or an earth that actually draws upon the uh, zero point energy to generate that current. Um, you can go beyond them. This is the Anu Walk Core on the next one. This is the most advanced one I work on. It's the second generation. Uh, the first one was troidal. This one is cyclonic. It's wired so I can actually uh, take take all the wiring to piece and rewire it again to make it into a hurricane type drive system, which would be a lot more aggressive. I haven't done that yet. Uh, I'm apprehensive about that. This warp core, as it stands now, is a fully functional working warp core. It displaces zero uh, inertia field between four and six meters. It's still waiting to get. Two more warp rings. These are very special gravity inducing warp rings. They generate a friction plane. And above them will be another three um, warp rings, both on the symmetric field and the asymmetric field to complete the actual warp core. And then after that, I can start really um, experimenting and studying the warp core and all the benefits and effects that come from it before I start to consider moving on from that to a new generation of what for, or simply accepting that it's at its um, limits, the focus on the meta hole. The meta hole will amplify the warp, uh, warp core, all the energies and the quantum energies and the uh, EM fields and zero emission field coming from that warp core will be amplified and magnified by the uh, meta hole because of the reactive materials I'm working with and developing achieve this um, object. All the um, meta hull materials are very specifically designed to interact with the um, warp field, the quantum field, and to generate um, this advancement, this amplification, and potentially displacement. I won't discuss those in detail because they classified and working on all the technologies all the time and nothing is patented because they're all experimental prototype and um, research endeavors. Um, so this is quite an advanced work core it's one of the it's the most advanced to date. Um, so we talked talk about electromagnetic fields but they are a good way of explaining that electromagnetic field is to think of them as shears. And if you have two shears in close proximity, and if you think of that, of that as the Casimir experiment, but instead of using metal plates, you're using energy planes. And it's this that you're working towards with distortion mechanics to generate a new distortion between those two energy planes. And this is the thing that's pushing for the um, warp core development. That I'm working on and uh, the research I'm undertaking, which is quite extensive. Um, so that's the thing that's going to generate the warp propulsion system in the end of the day. It's these uh, distortion, the distortion mechanics between the warp core, the meta hull, the warp field, all of them coming together to achieve an objective. So this is the symbiote part of the experiment and the research being undertaken. Um, I have evidence uh, considered about connected to this, so the quantum dots, the zero inertia displacement. The resonance is coming from the predecessor of this warp core um, as a resonance waveform. All of these, which are online and you can hear them, 
evidence the path I'm taking is the correct path. What was something I was going to say? Huh? I completely forgot what it was. Um, it's gone out of my head. Sorry about that. But, um, the residents are, are a vital key, but the new one I've got to live on, new residences, since I rewired this multiple to make it a cyclonic system, those residences are now inverted. Those inverted residences within the rock pool are generating the temporal distortion at the parameters of the rock field. And they didn't exist until then. So this is something new. Temporal distortions also, I should point out, I have existed in some of these, have been captured on camera. Um, yeah. And you're conducting an experiment that takes like 30 seconds and your recording lasts for 30 minutes. Uh, you don't know. You have no idea that you're in that temporal distortion. You, you, for you, it's a couple of minutes, a couple of seconds, a couple of minutes. You know, it's a um, very strange, very surreal experience. I have quite a lot of evidence. And I did release some on uh, LinkedIn. Uh, some of them connected to experiments I did at the university. Um, even now, just just staring water, and you go from normal speed, and as the the zero edge field rotates around, then so does this quantum wave, and this quantum wave generates this uh, temporal distortion, triggers it, and you suddenly just slow down to a very slow. <laughs> cycle, voice uh, commentary within the video disappears. It's elongated, stretched out, um, but your action, uh, your action has slowed down. And the reason why there's no sound in those videos is because there is narr narration there, but um, yeah, time distortion, it's, it's a very weird thing. Um, no side effects because the zero inertia field actually protects me within this space. And I think that's quite a, an important thing for anyone to consider when they're dealing with time or when they're dealing with very substantial EM fields or radiation, they need to shield themselves. Zero inertia fields are a good way of going about that. We're just spacing, zero, spacing uh, half of EM fields and radiation on the space you're occupying. And you need to consider these. Long exposure to EM fields, can, can, it can be harmful. You can get cancer. So you should think about this. Um, so we can move on from there, I think. So the next one is to a troidal um, capacitors, generates poor, poor and distortion mechanics. I have a couple of samples of here. This one is a metamaterial troidal capacitor. It's really advanced and it's tear shaped. So the second one, this is an earlier version. This is a binary system. So I developed the tear shaped system, which is a um, metamaterial and I'm using an aluminium and copper, wound in copper plate. I'm also using um, FE304 inside the aluminium to generate a distortion. And then it's wound in copper in multiple stages of copper. So there's probably three layers of copper uh, wiring attached to this particular toroidal capacitor. These are the most advanced, the ones displayed in the actual picture. And these include a negative induction, which is um, just something new, really at the cutting edge. So with the new anode warp core has a um, a negative induction wiring system built into it that interacts with the um, toroidal system. Hopefully at the end of the day it will generate a significant 0 0.10 energy outage as an additional outage. At the moment the walk core is using all the zero point energy to achieve um, what is what thing, its uh, so, soul state at the moment, so it's achieving what it is doing 
accuse them of anything themselves. Which is a complicated piece of technology. The torus itself is unique. It's non-standard. It's not like anything that uh, any other physicists have built. They normally build the same standard ones. This is nothing like that. It's a really advanced system. Um, and it has diverse uh, toroidal systems in there. Far more complicated than the ones I've just played. Some of them are really, really elegant. Um, could be pieces of art, but so elegant. I use very specific nano sensors. These are a small display of what I use in the next slide. Um, I use butterflies, and they are basically um, three plates. They're microscopic, ultra thin. One of them is 24 karat gold. One of them is aluminium. The other one is metal material. And I can place these within different layers of uh, metal material to generate a reading. I can generate multiple readings from them because they are that advanced. I can generate, I can read the um, any electrical current being generated by ZP. I can generate, I can record also then the EM field, any anti gravity gravity um, taking place within these metal materials or within the rock core or within any, any of the body arms. So they're quite really advanced and very unique, um, very, very small. I mean, no point in putting one of the camera, you wouldn't get to see it. <laughs> so really, I'm using ultra fine uh, wires as thickness of your own human hair. Um, as I stated earlier, the metamaterial body armor, like this sample here, which is uh, flexible, it, I use a very special uh, metal material called uh, Ferrex. Ferrex restructures all the metals within this and all the other materials as well, because this is not a, a true metal material, and nor any other metal material, a true metal material as a solid state metal material, like this um, tri state system. These are partially organic metal materials. And they have a very unique set of properties uh, that were designed to, for my 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 objectivity. So I was really looking at um, shielding against radiation in space, looking at harsh environments, and how best to protect people within those harsh environments. These are really complicated and they're quite expensive to produce. There are. Um, Three or four layers of Kevlar in there as well, so it's just an extra bit of defense. Um, but all, all the materials are really, really um, durable and designed to the best of, best of my ability to protect anyone using them. The uh, sample uh, panel of metal material, I'll just to give a rough idea of the type of research that's gone in, and these start with very early. Um, experimental research like this um, piece of metal material here, which is the very first multi laminate um, sample I produced. This is designed for the uh, meta hull. This is the original uh, sample. And I've gone from there to ultra thin samples like this one and to these um, really ultra thin meta materials like. Um, this one here, which is a really solid uh, metal material. It generates gravity and anti-gravity within its fields, which are, um, they are not compressed under an even pressure. It's better to apply multi-pressure. And that can let the you to generate multiple impact. So I think it's really useful to explain that if anyone is thinking about trying to go in this line of experimentation. Um, the properties are really anomalous in most of these materials, and I use diverse materials. Uh, I am concentrating recently, now that I've achieved enough on my own metal materials to achieve what I want, to 
focus on those and pursuing my objective, which is this year, I'm aiming to build the very first section of a meta hull so that I can test interactions with my warp hull. And this means a full size piece of um, warp hull and then bring it into close proximity to the warp core between four and six meters and looking at interactions. The reaction plates I'm developing are part of a process. They're part of the process of measuring the EM field on multiple levels. They're really complicated reaction plates and they have the potential to draw energy out of the exotic warp field I'm producing. Uh, but it's experimental. I haven't tested so I don't know if it'll happen, but it's a uh, it's just some an idea and you have to test these ideas to see if it's possible to stimulate energy out of an EMP. Um, something unique but worth pursuing. And I think we need to look at energy in multiple ways. So if we move on, you can explore any of these links. And um, if there's anyone who is a true scientist and they would like to look at quantum dots, you have editing software for videos and um, you get in touch and I can send you raw data. There will be a couple of videos because they're really large. They take a massive amount of the space. Um, you know, maybe one, 1.5 gigabytes a video. But you can edit them yourself, examine them yourself as raw data. And I don't mind sharing that because um, this is something really new. It's interesting. Some of the videos may not show quantum dots. They might just show uh, radiation coming from the warp core as a heat signature, which is very, very low. Because I've been working to work in harmony with the universe and not impose myself upon the universe. I believe in um, equilibrium. Um, so the warp core uses quantum energy because I don't want to extract them from the energy um, from the universe. That energy travels through the warp core and back into the universe. And it's done in a series of two quantum bubbles, but they're not two bubbles, they're actually um, uprises and downrises, best way of explaining it. So you have um, an upswell and downswell. This is what I'm aiming for, uh, and we generate into a quantum. Uh, fields that have a in the downswell and then and an upswell and it's this waveform that allows me to achieve what I'm aiming for and I have spoken about this in all my papers there's very specific waveforms and there's very specific frequencies I'm aiming for and all of these are now being evident with what I'm doing along with some very new waveforms and one of those I think is Mark Moody's pilot waves which I'm guessing is a reoccurring wave a resonance wave through the oscilloscope and um, diverse other uh, resonances as well. They've checked this, the resonances have changed a great deal since the new wiring system, um, and you have to take it on board. Things have changed, and the other resonances that you couldn't normally hear with your own ears, they are now out of the picture. They are really embedded. In the opposite side of that warp core going to the subquantum, they're not, they're not coming here. Um, so, all the links on this page they're basically to do with evidences, so you can actually go and examine um, ZPE, the light displacement from ZPE, and um, the quantum stars, and the other experiments I've conducted over the years to do with zero point energy and the development of the warp. In line with uh, the other workflows I've proceeded with. Um, so, this one is uh, again the annual warp core, but this is an, a normal picture, it's the wrong way around. This connects to the time distortions. I'm using atomic clocks, I'm using five atomic clocks. There was a six that broke, um, but the Five atomic clocks, three of them measure actual time, and that matches up with the computer and all the other time pieces. I have other atomic clocks that 
just pull this at different locations away from the log core. The two gen recording the actual temporal distortion are slightly out of phase with the National Physics Laboratory's um, signal. So that's why that signal isn't um, correcting them. And I have done a lot of research and switched them around to verify this. And um, that's quite a, an interesting um, piece of evidence for potential for time travel, but we're not there yet. We're going to be, it's a long way to go, but I think when we get there, maybe when the meta hole is built, we'll have more evidence to support more anomalous reactions, which will relate to time distortion and uh, spatial function. But there's still a, a, a fair way to go and lots of research and experimentation to take place before that. Uh, but the Allen Walker is only been around since 2002, it's evidencing itself really, really well. Um, taking me leaps forward, um, where I'm having to come to terms myself with all these new advances, ahead of everybody else, I'm trying to make sense of some of them. And this is something you need to think about when you're going into advanced research. You need to be able to try and get your head around what some of these uh, impacts are. I set out, um, I think in 2001 or two, I think I spoke to Jackson McCarthy about this temporal distortion and trying to create them. And um, I think last year I just yeah, hit the nail on the head. And it's just been advancing since then. So I record these temporal distortions every single day. And they're advancing at a ratio of one second per 36 hours, forward and out. Um, and very interested in temporal distortions as well, and in control of them. Because it's that control that's going to lead you to achieve um, time displacement which on the travel. To a different place, a different time, you need this and you need to understand how to manage that time for and out because there's no point going to a time in the past or in the present in the future and not being able to get back. <laughs> you need to manage it, you need to control it. And some of the research I'm doing connects to this. Um, and in, in part, Mark Moody's uh, research um, I experiment with that to see how it impacts on these time distortions. And it's through his one-on-one uh, -on -one, um, pilot wave that I've been able to adjust time. Although it wasn't that particular signal, it was a different waveform I was using, but I was, that was in resonance, I was able to adjust time uh, backwards by realigning it to the current. And that is an advance. The only other thing I would say about uh, the pilot wave is 1.0111 um, increases quantum dots within the warp core and the space. And that was also another interesting uh, piece of research and experiment which I've been able to evidence. Um, the photo from that has been released. Um, I use 22 different uh, CCTV cameras, digital, and I use um, Olympus cameras, EM, OMD, OMD EM1 cameras with uh, infrared um, to examine the um, quantum dots. I put those quantum uh, vid the videos on of the quantum dots then onto my computer to edit them. And all I do is raise the light, lighten them, so I can actually see the quantum dots. Uh, if there are videos, I will use my iPhone to record those quantum dots and the magnification, and then you can actually see the rotation. There's no trickery involved, it's quite simple science. And um, as Alex said, you don't need multi million pound pieces of technology. I'm um, advancing very well with a couple of oscilloscopes and various other pieces of technology, which are quite. Um, low cost to, to achieve everything. I think one of the best quality technology I have is my radiation detector, which I use every day. And you have to. And 
will do the EM detectors and very sort of numerous, numerous um, um, I think my brain is going dead, um, system to monitor resonance and wireless communications and anything else that's taking place within the space. I have to do that every day and keep a record. So this is you know, just one of the processes that's part and you spend half a day just doing these small experiments and small uh, registers of recording of um, everything you're doing to, to keep a log of everything um, for the future. Uh, so you go up there, it's the engineering. So these are some of my collaborators. Uh, they, I work with these. Um, I'm very fond of these these researchers and uh, independent scientists. I have uh, planned myself for uh, Alex, Dr. Alex Wolf. I'm hoping he's going to end up working with me on the Meta Hull, and he'll be the lead scientist because he's um, he likes destroying things um, and pushing them to their absolute limit. And I quite enjoy watching him do that. So it's very interesting to see how. He reacts when he discovers new anomalous things and um, how he then explains them. Sometimes, not the way I see them, but um, it's very interesting to see how young people um, absorb information and how they uh, rationalize it. I try and uh, share as much information as I can with all the people on this list. And I'm quite happy to. Um, connect to other people and when it comes to the quantum dots and the information I'm not able to analyze because I don't have the time in the day then I'm quite happy to share those raw data but when it comes to the warp flow technologies and the very specifics connected to the technologies I'm unable to share that or the some aspects to do with the metamaterial development because these are non patented prototype technologies. I fund my own research from up to bottom. I have no support from anywhere, so this is all privately funded research and experimentation. And I just believe that somebody needs to build a workforce that works so that we can get to where we need to be on another planet or a thousand other planets or eight billion other planets and uh, build a better future. And I think that's it. Done. We lost Tim. He's fallen asleep. No, no, I am here. I am here. You're all set. You are all set. We only have about eight minutes left. So let me do this. I'm going to bring everybody back in. And actually, what I was doing was just updating the website. Uh, and let's see, I'll bring Alex back in. I think that's pretty much everybody who was here with us. We have a few folks that have blanked out their cameras. There's Jared. Okay. And everybody, please give Mr. Christopher Mailer an enormous applause. Enormous. Christopher, thank you. Your audio was very faint, but I know that you're new at presenting. Oh, and I, I, I didn't want to disturb you. It was wonderful. It was a wonderful presentation. Thank you so much. Um, so we you. have about... We have about seven minutes until uh, until it's time for Shiva to present. And Shiva, again, thank you for joining us and, and being patient. Uh, do you guys have any questions for the next few minutes? Yeah, Curtis, go for it, sir. Yeah, so uh, one question I had was in terms of the effects you're measuring. I, I caught that you, you have a um, – you're measuring with atomic clock some time um, effects. Did you measure anything in terms of uh, inertial mass? Did, were you able to do any measurements of that? Um, I measure the field uh, on a regular basis. I'm looking at the parameters of the field. I'm looking at the internal um, setup of the field. So the zero inertia field on the inside, I look at then the EM field on the outside. Um, the actual mass you're talking about, that's to do with the actual um, what field itself, which is difficult to measure at the moment, which is why I'm building these reaction pipes. The experiment taking place behind me is connected to that. It's all about 
producing a metamaterial plate that is sensitive enough to measure uh, a flux field. But it's a large flux field. And that's how you have to see uh, what field it's. It's a state of flux. It's not a, a regular PEM field. It's, it's watery in, in a sense. And you have lots of friction within the field because there are two fields colliding, one's rotating. And the others are, one's, one's uh, symmetric, one's uh, asymmetric. So it's, it's a complex field. Okay. Uh, um, the follow-up question I had was, is the, the field you're generating at all related to the uh, Mach Lorentz thruster? It was a uh, kind of uh, researched by NASA uh, several years back. The MLT drive, MLT experiment. The only um, NASA experiment I know of connected to what I'm doing was the one that uh, Harold Wright uh, undertook when he first built a. He tried to build a warp core. Um, he tried power in it, and it, it didn't quite work. Um, but I don't really engage with other researchers. I'm okay. so intently working on my own. You know, it's like my head's down. And I do that every day, every single day. Uh, you can't read every paper that somebody sends you. It's not possible. I'm not a theoretical physicist. Um, I, I don't teach in universities. For that reason, I just, I'm, I'm an experimentalist. I don't know I do with these uh, experiments every single day. And they think it would be fun. Understood. And you're using a rotating magnetic field? I'm using a, a distortion field. The rotating aspect is the displaced zero inertia field. That rotates. So the zero inertia is rotating at uh, three to four cycles per minute through the space. Okay. And it's, it's pushing all the radiation out and everything else. And that's how it works. And then you generate friction on the other on the other field. Does that make sense? Yeah, thank you. Wonderful, wonderful. Uh, so let me go to let me see who who else has questions. Again, we've got about four minutes left. And if nobody does, I'll, I'll tell you what. Why don't we do this, guys? Um, why don't we give Chris a final applause, Christopher? Oh, I, thank I, you. Sorry, I, I, sorry, I was uh, I was focused on something oh. else for a moment. I oh, there's Michael. Oh, Michael so, with his bad camera. I'm yeah, tease you about your camera again, Michael. So, what exactly are what's the working theory here? What are you actually doing with this? Yeah, just like as a first thing, like that. Yeah. Um, like what, what, my research involves distortion mechanics. I'm using distortion mechanics to build a warp core that uses quantum energy. No other energy source, just quantum energy. The quantum energy displaces zero inertia out of the warp core. The zero inertia rotates, and it also produces two fields. One is the, zero, the parameter of the zero inertia field, which is, which is like an exotic EM field. What, what yep. do you mean by zero inertia? How zero inertia rotating? So is that like a, a geodesic or something? Because, like, angular momentum is angular inertia. Is that's it's a zero inertia field. It rotates at three to four seconds, uh, three to four times per minute, um, and it interacts then with the symmetric asymmetric um, EM field, which is an intense EM field. That's where the radiation goes. It's transformed into um, partially energy, partially an electromagnetic field, or quite an intense one. And that gives me then the range, which is at most six meters. So what, what do you mean by asymmetric uh, fields here? You have two fields emitted yep. by the wall. One is above, one is below. But in, in addition to that, then you have the zero inertia displacement field. And as it rotates, it displaces any energy within this field to the parameters of the um, EM field or the zero inertia space in the And that generates another field, an exotic field. Got you. Even okay. And that's going to that parameter. I can see how there might be something there, maybe. All right, cool. Uh, I guess I'll just take a look at the numbers they got. 
Well, and guys, we are just about I would, there. I would look up the. Uh... Go ahead. Sorry. Oh, well, um, well, actually, what what I want? Oh, yeah. Sorry. Go go for it, Alex. And then we'll wrap things up. Oh, here. sorry. I just had a. I was just going to tell him too. If you uh, uh, on Chris's part, mainly a theoretical discussion. If you need any of the technical details, because the time constraints, I would again direct you to the research page. Um, not only does it have the non-Euclidean model we use for a full, like if you even emailed us, we can give you all the numerical values for all the equivalents of that. And the process is occurring. There's just not enough time here. I tried to go over as much as I could, but. Awesome, awesome. Sounds well, good. guys, let's, let's do this. Let's put our hands together one more time for Mr. Christopher Mailer, as well as for Alex Wolf III. Both of you gentlemen, thank you. Thank you for presenting at APAC. And we'd love to hear updates as your guys' research moves forward. So what I want to do now thank is you. I'm going to take everybody out. And I, I want you guys to pay close attention to Shiva Minucci. Miucci. I'm sorry, Shiva. And I just took you out of the studio. Sorry. That's all right. Uh, nobody gets it right the first time. Uh <laughs> Yeah, I'm having mouse issues today. Okay, so there's, there's, okay, perfect, perfect. Now it's just you and uh, myself. Do you want to try and upload your presentation or do you want me to upload? Well, I, it I don't you? have a really uh, current slide deck, but I've been doing this for about 20 years. Uh, so, you know, the, I can, I yeah, can, do if this you want to just speak, great. that's, that's totally fine. Um, yeah, uh, yeah, basically, okay. So, so just to let everybody know, I sent Tim uh, one of my most concise papers that I published, uh, basically on the, uh, the, the history of, um, well, of modern theory. And uh, this is going back to, well, especially there was a period of time from 1887 to 1905 that is, uh, is especially critical. But before we get into that, uh, I kind of wanted to point out one of the things that everybody is sort of um, wondering about. And that is, you know, OK, if we've got the this, uh, you know, these models of physics that are down to, you know, 12 decimal places, you know, perfect prediction. But then at the same time, we've got, uh, you know, something like the vacuum energy catastrophe, where uh, the the difference between what is predicted and what is measured with our current theories is, uh, let's see if I, let me, let me bring up this little uh, phrase that it was put in, it's so great. It's a, a factor of 10 to the 120th, is a factor of a million, billion, quadrillion, quintillion, sextillion, septillion, octillion times. So that's uh, the difference between what we detect and what we predict with our current model is uh, a, a, a difference that is larger than comparing one atom to all atoms in the universe. So how can we be both, you know, just really perfectly on track and so incredibly, unbelievably far off at the same time? And uh, and so before I get to the history of physics and how it is that we can uh, look at various analogs, I want to talk about the very idea of an analog and limited truths. And so one of the stories I like to tell is uh, the story of the fishing tree in Papua New Guinea. You can go to uh, Papua New Guinea and there's a, uh, a tribe of people who they pray and sing to the fishing tree and to retrieve fish. And uh, and during the ceremony, it's a it's a replicable experiment. So therefore, it, there is a there is a science to it. You can watch them do it, and they will always retrieve fish using this ceremony by appealing to the spirit of the fishing tree. Now, that is a sort of truth within limits. And what I mean by this is they are using a theory about a spirit. And when we go and investigate a little bit deeper, we find that there is a, um, a neurotoxin that is not toxic to human beings, but is toxic to the fish that is in the root that is a part of the procedure that they are using in their experimentation to uh, achieve the desired result. So they have a type of truth, they have a type of theory, and they have uh, replicable uh, results that are basically a, a type of science. So... The, the fact of the matter is we can do this same thing in modern times in a, you know, in a much larger way. And what we do is we produce an analogy to the, the truth that is, that is off by a certain amount. And the reason why we can do this so well is because of mathematics. In other words, there are, there are mechanical ways. Mathematics works like a machine, as which is, uh, you know, the first computers were Babbage's difference in analytical engine. And, and those are, you know, made with gears, et cetera. And it's because mathematics works like a machine. And so without knowing necessarily what the machine is doing, you can continue to hook things to it to make it do more things. And so that's the way in which what we can have right now is a, understanding 
of physics that is a truth within limits. That's why we can get so close on so many things and be so far off on others. And so what, what differentiates between a good theory and a better theory? Because I'm not going to say a good one and a bad one. I'm going to say, you know, how do we get closer and closer to the truth as we try to asymptotically approach, you know, what is really out there? And um, the difference is really it's in your ability to predict reality uh, over a longer and longer period of time. Like, for instance, one of the things that they could possibly do with this this uh, spirit of the fishing tree is they could try to apply it to something else. Like, uh, retreats, they could think of it as a food retrieval system. And therefore, by burning it, they might actually, you know, uh, calm or even kill bees because... Uh, as you may or may not know, neurotoxins are especially, various insects are, are very um, especially susceptible to neurotoxins. And so they might apply this spirit of the fishing tree theory to even extend their, their, their theory to other things and get good results. But that doesn't mean that their theory is the best theory that could be used. And so what I want to talk about today is uh, how it is that we got to where we are, how it is that we are you know, doing well in so many ways and then doing so horrifically in others and what it is that we might want to look at as a alternative path that we could take. In other words, how did we, where, where did we take those missteps that we might be able to back all the way up? And I, I like going back uh, 200 years specifically, uh, but how do we go back and find a specific place that um, we can interject a, a little change and maintain a perfect analogy all along the way with our current physics, because we've got a tremendous body of evidence that proves our current physics theory. In other words, the mathematics that and the way it comes out uh, to be correct in a variety of ways. But then how do we how do we how do we make that work with another theory, another interpretation? So what I'm talking about here is the change in interpretation and how you achieve a better change of interpretation is by looking at the history of physics. So. Uh, I said I'd, I'd go all the way back to uh, 200 years. Um, I didn't in this paper. This, is, this paper was back in 2018, I believe. And uh, I, I, I go into it in a few other papers. But uh, where I like to start is with uh, Fresnel's um, uh, index of refraction. So he, the way in which he developed the, the index of refraction was based upon the the idea of ether. Uh, and now you, you, if you follow a tremendous amount of physics up to um, before I start talking about ether, because that's that's a uh, a very it's a topic people don't really like to talk about, uh, and there's a reason for that because there is this divide in ether between relativistic ether and non-relativistic ether, and most people only know about non-relativistic ether. In other words, everything that was prior to 1887, I won't say everything, a a large portion of the theory that existed prior to 1887, the Michelson Morley experiment, was um, was non-relativistic. Uh, however, very quickly thereafter, um, they actually did immediately come to the uh, idea of the, the base idea of relativity. And that was through uh, a Lorentz Fitzgerald contraction. In other words, so um, uh, Fitzgerald was the was a scientist who uh, proposed this initial idea that, well, you know, maybe the reason why we're getting this null is because there's this perfect amount that matter is short. Now he didn't come up with that out of nowhere. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of people believe that he just, that was very ad hoc. However, it does travel back to specifically the, um, the Fizeau experiment. And uh, that's why I'm talking about going back 200 years. And I'm gonna have to jump around here a little bit. And I hope you can follow along with me to because I need to tell this narrative so you understand how it is that we had, took this specific deviation in physics that can be an alternative path. It's running side by side, and it's present and alive today in a variety of different places. And I'm going to get back to that. So please bear with me as I jump around a little bit. Uh, so the, uh, the one of the things that happened in the Fizeau experiment, that's the experiment where uh, they ran light through a tube of water, ran the water, and, uh, and wanted to see how much it, it impacted the, uh, the speed of light, uh, basically by the movement of the water. And prior to this experiment, Fresnel predicted that it would not be, it would not completely carry the light along, nor would it have no effect whatsoever, but would have a very specific uh, amount that it uh, carried the light along. And he predicted this, you know, from the index of refraction. So that's that's why I'm, I'm trying to show you there's these little pieces. So I'm gonna give you a little hints, a little, and I'll try to keep it short because there is a tremendous amount to tell here. So 
so one of the things that you'll also find is that uh, Einstein and others uh, also kind of uh, take this as the the first grounding, the first port, you know experimental point in relativity was the the Fizeau experiment. And um, so going back forward to uh, to Fitzgerald, he was uh, he was actually rediscovering the work uh, works in the ether prior to that. Now um, let me just say uh, first of all before we go forward, and here's some of that jumping around. Um, it, special relativity was in 1905, and general relativity was in 1915. And in 1920, uh, Einstein gave a um, a speech to the University of Leiden in which he summarized it with "space without ether is unthinkable." Uh, and in addition to that, you have you know as, as uh, late as 1950, Paul Dirac saying that uh, we are forced to have an ether in one of his papers. I can uh, put that there. And then there's uh, there's also more uh, recent books that also mention the ether, but there's still this sort of pushback against the ether specifically because of this misunderstanding that ether theory really only advanced after 19, uh, 1887. So in 1887, there's the, uh, the Michelson knot. And shortly thereafter, uh, you have Fitzgerald contraction, which is the, that is where you get the very basis of relativity, which is the, uh, the, we call it the Lorentz factor or gamma. And so this is the amount that things shorten by. So you need to understand why this works in a, uh, a fluid based environment. In other words, how can this work? Because one of the things that you'll, that you'll learn, if you learn anything about uh, modern physics, you learn about relativity is that uh, electromagnetic waves, they can't be compared to mechanical waves because you know relativity just doesn't work like that that's the story that should be told however that's not actually true uh it was based entirely upon the way in which waves would be traveling in a medium if they were carried along by that medium and then what i'm telling you is the central calculation that defines relativity uh is based upon the way that waves would have to move in a medium and that is what um, Lorentz was describing, and, and before him it was Larmor. By 1895, I believe it was, Larmor had actually uh, come up with uh, time dilation. So length contraction, time dilation, both of these things existed prior to 1905. Now, I'm not saying Einstein's a plagiarist or anything like that. He has, this is the reason why he has two parts in his paper, which is the uh, the kinematical part, which he just takes everything that Lorentz did and just explains it in his in a way in which he feels like you can simplify it and not really think much about it. And then he does his part, which is the electrodynamical part. So that is, that is the part that he is purposefully saying, this is what I'm contributing. This is what other people have contributed. So there's been a misunderstanding a lot of times saying that he was plagiarizing. That's not the case. He was, he was, importing work and saying, okay, that's what this is. And now this is my work. So th that's an important thing to understand. So um, it, it is critical to understand that this is a mechanical wave theory, relativistic ether existed and was very well understood. Now, um, here's the thing that you have to understand about uh, the way that it works. It's just a simple fact that if you, you know, if you, direct a wave into a moving medium, it's going to be carried along with the medium. So say there's a river and I direct a, a wave across this river. Well, that, like if I drop a pebble in a moving river, the, the, the circle that comes off of it, it's going to move with the river, right? So if I want to direct a wave to reflect off the, the, the bank over here and come back to the same location, I cannot, if it's, a, if it's in any way a coherent beam, in other words, a straight line sort of beam, I, I can't aim directly across the river, right? Because it's going to be carried along with the river. I have to aim ahead of it. There is a very particular angle by which that has to be done. And there's only one angle that it will work to come back to the origin. And uh, it has to do with the wave speed in the medium. And uh, and so this, this, uh, this amount, that is directly uh, the, uh, the Lorentz contraction. Now, the contraction part is that for it to go the other direction and back, in other words, to travel upstream and back downstream, you may have an intuitive thought that's like, well, if a swimmer has to go upstream and then go back downstream, it'll cancel out. It does not. Uh, the, it, it, the amount that it is uh, further is actually uh, gamma squared. So in other words, it is the change factor squared is actually the amount that it is over. So the change factor is the square root of that amount. And so it's a, it's a simple geometric 
trick, basically, to uh, say that matter shortens up just the right amount in the direction that the river is going so that a, uh, a swimmer that would have to go upstream and back downstream has a shorter distance to go overall and, and the beam going across and back. Uh, it travels the same distance, and they end up both traveling the same distance. You get the null effect in an interferometer experiment, which was the basis of it. So the story here, just to understand, is that it is a description of light being carried along by a medium. It is a mechanical wave in a medium that works, and there is a workable theory of relativity that is entirely mechanical wave based and based upon the ether. And of course, uh, Maxwell's equations were based upon the ether. And there's a variety of things I won't go into uh, to, because I, I don't want to take forever here. But um, so this is a point, this is a, a point at which most people are unaware that there is an alternative interpretation. We're aware that we have things like the, uh, the uh, many worlds interpretation, Copenhagen interpretation, pilot wave interpretation for quantum physics, but people are not aware that there is a, uh, well, most people are not aware that there is a the relativistic ether that is an interpretation of relativity. And it is, uh, it, it comes to the exact same um, uh, calculations. And at the time it was, it used to be called Lorentz Einstein relativity. And there was a, this thing with Poincaré who also did the same thing that Einstein did, but he did it for the, uh, the relativistic ether. And, uh, and these were called um, mathematically indistinguishable. So understanding there are these two explanations of what's happening. And the difference between these two explanations is that in one case, we believe it's an illusion caused by the shortening in, in reality. And there's actually um, Oliver Heaviside, who is responsible for interpreting Maxwell's equations and giving them us, uh, the, the version that we have today. Uh, he actually explained how it is that electromagnetism would uh, lead to the shortening of molecules, atoms, etc. So there's there's plenty of theory that was developed in that initial 15 years uh, before special relativity, and, and then when when ether started to be um, discarded as not not relevant or at least not necessary to come to the certain calculations, and, and there was a variety of metaphysical things that happened at that point. So now I'm going to start to tell a little bit of the history after that point, but it's just very crucial that you understand there are these two alternative ways. And these, these two alternative interpretations, a fluid dynamical perspective, continue to persist uh, all the way up to, to the present day. Um, one of the other things that are, uh, so what is it, if it's mathematically indistinguishable, one of the arguments that are frequently made is, well, if it's mathematically indistinguishable, then why would we care? Why would we pick one or the other? It's just, it's not, that's not real science, et cetera. However, there is a way in which we could distinguish between uh, special relativity and relativistic ether with Lorentz and Poincaré. And they published right at the same time. There's a publishing irregularity. And people, historians talk about how there's a very good possibility that without that publishing of uh, irregularity, Poincaré would have been given uh, primacy for relativity theory, and we would be working with um, relativistic ether today instead. Um, but the point at which there is this deviation, now Einstein, uh, in his paper on the electrodynamics of moving bodies, which is the relativity paper in 1905, he, um, he did give some indication that's like, well, we don't have to think about the ether because we're having all these weird problems with the way in which it works. Well, um, I can clear up a lot of that, but I don't want to get too bogged down in so many different, different details about why it is that it seemed very strange and how you can resolve all of those problems with the, the simple thing of going back to for now. But moving forward here, the, um, oh, where was I there? Give, give me just a moment. Let me take a drink here. The, the point at which relativity and uh, special relativity, excuse me, and uh, relativistic ether, ether are differentiated, where they uh, be become actually differentiable by experiment, is called a one-way speed of light experiment. Now, according to most people uh, today, that, that has never been successfully accomplished. In other words, we have never measured the one-way speed of light is a very common argument. And uh, I, I would argue that is actually not true. It is simply they do not like the consequences of the voluminous uh, 
positive experiments that have actually proven that there is a difference in the one-way speed of light because there is a sociological problem here. And the sociological problem is that people believe that if you have a light speed measured different in one direction versus the other, that violates relativity. However, it does not. It simply selects between the two alternative interpretations of relativity. And, um, and so that is, that is one of the, the key factors that is, has confounded us for uh, about 100 years now and why it is that people do not talk about the ether. And when they do, they're typically referring to the ether that was disproven by the 1887 Michelson-Morley experiment. Uh, but they are not referring to the forgotten theory that birthed relativity that was prior to special relativity, and that is relativistic ether and that they are mathematically equivalent. So that experiment, a one-way speed of light experiment, um, there's a lot of argument there, like I said, don't wanna get into that too much uh, about that it has been accomplished or whether it is not, but that has traveled forward now. And if you want to look into it further yourself, uh, there's something called the uh, Mansuri sexual uh, test theory of relativity, which is uh, about proposing a mathematical way in which you can account for this type of relativity. In other words, it is a ether relativity. Um, and this was also, you know, something that is only known amongst a very small group of people, uh, but it is known in certain areas of science. And, uh, but let me, let me travel forward a little bit. So here we have um, the sociological effect that is this occur over the past hundred years. Well, part of that story is that um, one of the, the close friends of David Hilbert, actually, he said he said he's more, more uh, closer closer to me than a brother or something to that effect, and uh, is Hermann Minkowski. Hermann Minkowski is Einstein's um, teacher. Okay, he was he was a teacher that and he uh, put forward a version of relativity in 1907. So that's a couple of years after Einstein's paper. Uh, Minkowski comes forward and gives us Minkowski space time. And then uh, two years later, about the time that, you know, the, the things don't, don't travel uh, as fast back then as they do now. So it's about the time people are starting to get a handle on Minkowski's thing. Einstein says some things in public where he says, uh, now that the mathemat mathematicians have invaded the theory of relativity, I no longer understand it myself anymore, which was him referring specifically to Minkowski's space time. And, uh, and in Minkowski's invention, the way in which you mathematically treat it, it's specifically, it specifies isotropic constancy. In other words, there's not this two-way effect that cancels out in all two-way experiments. And once again, I was saying there's a one-way speed of light experiment, which everyone now says has never been accomplished. Uh, the, the difference between relativity, as we now uh, are mostly taught, versus this other version of this other interpretation of relativity is a one-way speed of light test. And that would, should it be successful, and I'm contending that it has been successful many times and simply not been uh, accepted, would prove that the other theory is the, is the one that should take primacy. But uh, I mentioned David Hilbert. David Hilbert is who helped Einstein very vigorously right at the time uh, that he was developing, he was finally finalizing it. We're talking about 10 years of him struggling with general relativity. Then right, right around that time um, is, is when David Hilbert uh, actually helped him. Well, you see, David Hilbert was very tied into this whole community. And why I'm telling you this story is because Minkowski, who was like a brother to Hilbert, suddenly died of a ruptured hernia after Einstein had publicly ridiculed him. His uh, you know, superior, basically, in everyone's uh, eyes, and everyone came down on Einstein hard. And uh, so you need to understand that basically there is this huge communal pressure for Einstein to make up for his faux pas and to use this dead man's work. And uh, and so he can he starts to use the Minkowski space time because it is a useful heuristic because being able to detect the difference between two-way experiments and one-way experiments is very difficult. It's a, it's a subtle process. Like I said, theoretically, we have never done it uh, up to today is what, what uh, the mainstream uh, currently contends. So, so he integrates Minkowski space-time, which then specifies isotropic constancy. And, uh, but then all throughout uh, Einstein's 
writings, you can't, you, 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 you hear him repeating over and over. We have to abandon constancy. Constancy uh, is not anywhere. We, when you're talking about general relativity, it, it's only in places where there is no gravity, uh, gravity that, uh, that it's ever realized. So therefore, and he says this explicitly, you know, the constancy is, is nowhere realized anywhere in the real world. And so he specifies this specifically, which is how he ends up coming to the to the speech in 1920, where he says space without ether is unthinkable. So the problem is the word ether. Uh, people, they immediately are thinking of Stokes ether. They're thinking of a specific type of ether that is not workable instead of the type of ether that was developed during that 15 years. That is relativistic ether. So now I told you all of that. Because you know now we need to continue into the modern the modern day, and um, there is a there is a lineage you can trace all the way from McCullough, who was uh, who who first gave us something called a rotational elast elasticity that led up through Fitzgerald, who had rediscovered his work, who came up with the who was the one who first you know presented the change factor in its mathematical form in 1889 or yeah 1889, and um, this, this lineage uh, also continues up through uh, me, who used a four-dimensional um, uh, uh, generalization of McCullough's ether as the way in which he was working towards general relativity. So it's a little bit of a little bit of competition between Hilbert and, and Einstein during that period, and, uh, and collaboration, tremendous amount of collaboration. That is very historically, and there were some people who once again wanted to, um, you know. Uh, accuse Einstein of uh, uh, plagiarism because of that collaboration, but that's it's simply not true. Uh, there's, it's been proven that there was, he did come to certain things before um, Hilbert did. But the point is they were very closely working together. And there's a sociological aspect along with, you know, them, some of the things that were happening in World War One and World War II that you have to understand why it is that we select one view of the way the world works versus the another when they are mathematically indistinguishable. Now, they're not experimentally indistinguishable, except in certain people's theories. So now all of that leads up to now we need to get to the, the quantum era. And in the quantum era, you'll, see, you'll find in my paper, and uh, because I am a little bit rusty on those things, I tend to load them up as I'm, as I'm writing the paper to publish, and, and then they start to get a little fuzzy after, after some time. But there, are, um, there was a, a casting of uh, quantum theory in, in uh, hydrodynamics at the very beginning of, uh, of quantum theory. And so the, what, what I'm saying is that there is an analog to quantum theory found in hydrodynamics. So from, from all the way back to Maxwell's equations, now up to quantum theory, you can trace this line of hydrodynamics in something called a rotationally elastic ether. And um, so what does that lead us to that can be you know a little more useful today? And that is specifically pilot wave theory. So I'm going to, I'm going to get you to something that is, uh, that, that starts to make more sense. So pilot wave theory is the, the alternative interpretation of uh, quantum mechanics that uh, people don't talk about. It's like, uh, for some reason, it's the, uh, it's the bad boy of the group. I, I don't, I don't know why people don't talk about it very much, but it is uh, those people who are actually, uh, you know, somewhat in the know when it comes to um, the physics of UAPs, et cetera, they actually do talk about pilot waves specifically. And that is because it is a deterministic way in which things work. Now, people hate determinism. That's just nobody wants to feel like they're controlled and nobody wants to feel like they're a puppet, et cetera. But uh, determinism, as most people understand it, is not the way that chaotic determinism works. So there's uh, the ways in which if you look into chaos theory, the way in which, um, you know, the, the very small things can work together to make very large things happen in the butterfly effect. effect uh, that is a, um, a deterministic set of effects, and you're only you know you're only keeping up with the the butterfly flaps its wing, and that scares a frog, and yada yada. Instead of keeping up with all of the other things that are side by side with it simultaneously, that, that contribute to these very subtle effects that we cannot track, but we can only keep up with via statistics. So, in other words. Um, now, this is going to lead to the work of Coudé and John Bush at MIT. And, uh, and what I mean by this, there is something called the silicone, silicone walker experiments. These are silicone droplets that bounce on a bath that is uh, driven by a, at, at a certain frequency. And uh, these experiments 
have been proven to show all of the effects of quantum mechanics in this system at a macro level. So all of the things that, uh, for instance, one of the things that Richard Feynman said is, you know, the, double, the, the dual slit experiment uh, it absolutely makes no sense. And that is the, you know, that is the, the thing that, uh, that is really at the heart of the weirdness of quantum mechanics. We can't, uh, we have no theory that can explain how and why that works the way that it does. Uh, however, now with these experiments, who, was, who were began by Yves Coudet and, uh, and explored by John Bush at MIT, and I re really recommend you go to Pilot Wave Hydrodynamics, that's pilot-wave dash hydrodynamics.com and you can get, get to his website um at, at mit and I, I really suggest that you study this the he the way in which this works because all of those things which you know seem to be spooky action at a distance the uh, dual slit the all the things that are mysterious strange weird all of those things work within this macro size system millimeter millimeter size droplets that you can watch do their thing and, and the, the way in which it works is through chaotic dynamics these chaotic dynamics have a feedback loop so as a droplet bounces and it's a droplet of the same fluid on the fluid so the only way the droplet exists is by the by the the energy that is pumped into the system and by the way in which it alters the surface so in other words the, the droplet itself participates in its own existence and, and so this feedback loop leads to it moving around in a, in a normal human, you know, time frame. You would watch this droplet just kind of move around randomly. Well, the randomness is pseudo randomness. It is not real randomness. It is a chaotic dynamic that is de entirely deterministic. But the minute effects that lead to the way in which it moves are there are too many to, uh, to keep up with. So we have to treat it with statistics. But the map is not the territory. And what I mean by this is that statistical treatments can give you ideas about systems that are valuable and useful, and you can engineer based upon them, but they are a heuristic. They are an analogy. They are a way in which we take out some very important complexities that might be there and valuable to us and instead deal with what we can deal with, with our, you know, very blunt tools. So. What we find is that this this droplet, as it um, explores the corral, you watch it over a long enough period of time, it actually spends more time in some areas than others. And what it gives you is a waveform that exactly matches the, the experiments in which we've trapped an atom inside of a corral. And because it is the, um, uh, the, the it's the waveform that is resonant with that gap. And, uh, and that is just one of, uh, many different uh, ways in which it, I mean, there's quantum tunneling, there's all, basically every one of the quantum effects are uh, shown to have an analog in this fluid. Well, so remember what I was talking about was with relativity, you have a fluid dynamical way in which things work. And I started talking about pilot wave theory because that's what this is. It describes the way in which what we thought when we, you know, the, what, the reason why people do not like pilot wave theory is because of the fact that there is this, this, um, Non-local components, one of the uh, the components to it, as well as this uh, the the pilot wave itself. In other words, like the the whole universe seems to contribute to the way in which this you know a single particle uh, works, and so this it seems very confusing to people. But now we have the tools and have for you know I think it's been they've been doing this work and advancing it for nearly twenty years now, I believe. But uh, but really a lot recently, you know. I, and like I said, here in the U.S., it's uh, it's John Bush and. Uh, and so this gives us an alternative way to view what is happening and, and how it is that particles may exist in a fluid environment. So uh, the, the story here that I want to, 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 to tell in, in as short a form as possible, because there's really a tremendous number of other things I can get into here, is that there is a way in which we have a mechanical deterministic system that uh, where there may be a structured space time that has additional details in it and can be engineered. And so instead of it being space time, and, and unfortunately, that while that that is the word that has inundated our vocabulary, there's some subtleties there that you have to navigate in understanding what a um, uh, an ether based um, version of relativity would look like. And that's just instead of ether, but that word, once again, it's, you know, uh, I hate to it's it's the best word for it in my opinion, but it does does not act you know accurately reflect 
what you're referring to when you say ether, which is only that theory which matches special relativity uh, mathematically. And that is the ether theory only after, after 1887. So this, um, this system then gives us a reasoning by which the, we should select the pilot wave interpretation as the, the appropriate interpretation and a deterministic background for all of these stochastic effects that we seem to see. And, uh, and by using this system, we can see how it is that things like the, the dual slit experiment, the uh, wave particle duality, all of those things start to make a lot more sense. And then we start to understand a way by which we can look at these ideas of engineering space and that there may be a structure in space itself that uh, that is actually present and uh, relevant to this engineering process. So that was a, the the short of it, and uh, I could go tremendously long on this, but uh, I think I'd like to go to a Q&A uh, session so that we can uh, go over it a little bit more, because I think a Q&A session will actually, you know, bring up some of the things that people might have when it comes to questions, contentions, uh, et cetera. So I hope some of the guys there are in the background and uh, and they've got some, some good questions queued up, some hard questions, because I'd really love to uh, to go through that and uh, and talk about how the history of the hydro hydrodynamic interpretation of modern physics can work at every level all the way, you know, going back 200 years right up to the present. And of course, there's my paper that you uh, put there in the um, uh, in the display that will uh, that people can use as a starting point. It's a very concise version, but there are other uh, <laughs> that I can give as well. Awesome. Shiva, thank you, man. Thank you. So the first thing I want to do is I want to bring everybody in. We need to give you an applause. That was that was one heck of a lecture. I did add your paper and just to kind of have it there, but it, lo it looks like you didn't reference it that much. So everybody, Shiva Miyuchi, that was tremendous, man. And that was all from memory too, which is insane. So thank you. Um, so yeah, if you guys have questions, let me know. You know, start. Uh, yeah, I questions. got one. <laughs> You got whoever can go first. I can wait. Yeah, Dan, why don't you go first, sir? Uh, so, wasn't there just uh, just kind of kind of a two part question? Wasn't there uh, just a, an experiment recently in the, like the last couple of years? It might have been two thousand and one. I don't recall the the name of it exactly. I'll have to, I'll have to do some research on it to to find the exact one. Um, but didn't it uh, debunk um, pilot wave theory in essence? And tacking onto that, what is your what are your thoughts on the statement that pilot wave theories are just uh, many worlds in denial? Okay, that's great. Yeah, you're talking about the the article. I actually, keeping uh, in touch with uh, with John Bush occasionally, uh, he uh, he puts up with my emails, and uh, and you're talking about the article that came out in uh, Quanta Quanta magazine, and it was a uh, the and it was a report by the uh, by the grandchild of Bohr, who of course Bohr is the is the father of Copenhagen interpretation, and this is his grandchild who did an experiment, and uh, he it was said that he replicated the uh, the experiments uh, of the the pilot wave walkers, and uh, and and Bush has uh, refuted that. Nine ways to Sunday, and basically that is a, a, a pop science version versus a real science version. In other words, uh, Bush has, has has shown that this is an absolutely ridiculous uh, non-replication where they tried to test one thing and didn't do it properly, and uh, and they just did they just didn't cover anything at all. And of course, like I, I mentioned, I'm sorry. The truth of the matter is there are. Um, sociological effects in science that are very, very direct and unambiguous. And as I said, this is Moore's grandchild uh, defending the legacy of his grandfather. Um, so th that, that would be one thing. And then the other thing, the idea of many worlds in denial, uh, I would say that that is uh, kind of ridiculous because uh, what many worlds uh, uh, postulates is additional real actual reality splitting off. Uh, whereas, okay, so this is, there's uh, two it's different ways. In which you function. Uh, say again? It just postulates the wave function evolving smoothly with no Heisenberg cut. Well, it's saying uh, okay. So many worlds is that there there is a uh, there is a world which matches every possible outcome of the the wave function. In other words, instead of having a collapse, you instead have a different world that comes off of it. So there are infinite worlds, and in, in, in any infinitesimal slice of time, there are infinite additional worlds being created uh, for every 
particle. Uh, it yeah, is the infinite book, sure. It's yeah, okay, well, nearly. It's it's nearly there, but uh, but the uh, let's let's not strand it out there. But the uh, the idea that there are all of these additional worlds, there's two different ways in which you can understand the idea of uh, of additional dimensionality in fluid dynamics. We treat a system like one of my favorite uh, experiments and is one of David Bohm's experiments, favorite experiments is the uh, reversible laminar flow experiment. And in it, you can take a vat of, of uh, glycerin, put dots in it, you know, of ink, wind it m many times. So it's completely looks like it's perfectly mixed. And then you unwind it and it's the, the, the dots are restored. And, uh, and this reversibility is a, uh, a way in which you can understand the idea of why we use additional dimensions in treating fluid dyna dynamics. And that is not external realities, that is different ways of slicing the current pot. So higher dimensional, um, they're, they're, whenever you're using higher dimensional math uh, mathematics, you don't need to be talking about things that are external to this, but a different way of slicing this one thing. And that's the way in which fluid dynamics uses those additional dimensions. It is not something outside of our current reality, additional to it, higher than it, et cetera. It is just a different different way of viewing it. In other words, the droplets, even when they are, they look like they're completely mixed in, they still exist in a different dimension because you can recover them, right? So, the, uh, so that is the idea of dimensionality that is important to understand would be preserved and yeah, you could have an idea of, of, of other dimensions existing within this one in that manner. And you could say that that could give you a view that it's sort of many worlds like with pilot wave, but it would be fundamentally different in the in in character. Okay. Awesome. Wow. You guys are getting heavy really quick. Okay, so let me go to Curtis next. My my brain hurts, by the way. Like <laughs> it seriously hurts. I need Advil. I really enjoyed your talk. And one of the things that I have always wondered is why did Einstein include um, the symmetries that he did, right? So that's something I haven't gotten. I don't I don't know that you have the answer, but uh, uh, when you talked about the sociological situation, I can see why he would maybe subconsciously make that mistake or or bring in uh, such assumptions that are more uh, were more standard at the time. Uh, because at the time the mathematics was developed for um, for for the full Einstein group that Sachs uses, the quaternion uh, type group. Um, and it's not like he didn't know that that was there, but, uh, you know, I don't know. Do you, do you know why he he went that way? It, there's, you know, uh, uh, there's some of it that has to do with the, I don't know if you're part of the whole problem. There were, there were a lot of different developments uh, preceding general relativity that were where he was trying to, uh, solve covariance, and it's uh, it, it, it gets a little too too heady to to really comment on uh, in any cogent way, in my opinion. But uh, but a lot of the the idea of symmetry that um, that is built in, as as I said before, the the um, what's occurring. Okay, in, in the the view that I am saying that that is the superior view, which is a you know a substance of space view. Uh, there is that that preservation of Lorentz symmetry. In other words, there is a uh, a shortening that will happen that is exactly equivalent to motion through the ether, and uh, and how that that's carried out. And there's a there's a variety of questions you guys are going to come back to me with uh, if, if you don't think I'm not. You're going to be asking, well, what about the 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 Michelson null? Shouldn't it have been non-null in that case? Uh, I can give you details about that. There's a, you know, there's a variety of things that are going to occur to you, and I hope we continue this conversation because I'd like to answer those questions for you as they come up. But when it comes to the to the symmetry, there is a symmetry that is preserved because there's an uh, the when you when you look at it from the advanced ether theory that is kind of going by different names. Everything uh, from you know, uh, you know, what's it called the the quantum uh, vacuum foam, uh, you know, there's there's a variety of ways in which they treat the uh, space that all are kind of, that come from those developments during that, that period from 1887 to 1905. And you can trace the, the developments specifically of Kelvin uh, up through what is uh, uh, the Cosserat work, which is called micropolar elasticity. I mean, I use it in material science, uh, science but the uh, micropolar elasticity was originally just an ether theory. In other words, it was a way in which we could look at the way that uh, rotational elasticity worked. And so there's, these, there's all this work with Thompson and Tate 
Lord Kelvin. And, you know, when it comes to developing a model of elasticity that works and they had a problem with, with Maxwell's equations when it came to the way in which elasticity is working and all of that got resolved right after 1887. Uh, Kelvin actually resolved the physicality of it in 1889 as well with the, uh, what was it called? The, um, yeah, the gyrostat, uh, what's it called? The adynamic gy gyrostatic theory of ether. I don't, I forget what it was called, but it, it, the, uh, you can, I can, you know, give you the paper. I think I will refer to it in my paper then. But, but basically, it shows the way in which this very counterintuitive uh, uh, motion that can occur in what is basically a superfluid. In other words, we have to understand that any kind of version of ether actually has to have, it has to be an inviscid fluid. And, uh, and Ricasserac continua actually are a, it's a version of superfluid before we knew superfluids actually existed at all. And so that was, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I am kind of bunny trailing here and I'm, I'm no longer on your question. I do that sometimes, but so no, let me, let me that's, tell other that's, that's okay. I, I just, as a follow-up, I wanted to, see what your impression is of, of the fact that sat, sat middle sax theory um, taking, you know, from those kind of simple axioms, not simple, but, you know, a couple axioms develops, you, you have uh, a quaternion formulation of general relativity, a matter field. So it's, a, it's, it's kind of related to pilot wave theory, but, you know, more taking it as, okay, it's a matter field. But using that theory, you derive these background pair this background pair gas that you know recovers this whole ether idea and you know explain and because it's so tightly coupled it explains the fact that it's not easy to detect you know, it's not hidden deep in uh you know in the zero point energy um I, i'm just kind of wondering what your impression of that that whole methodology is well the the, the thing is whatever we're it's you know i actually have a background in programming one of the things that that occurs is that as you start to use more and more abstract languages you can't keep your eye on the ball of what you're using the language to do and so the same thing is true of mathematics the in other words there's a point at which i can write a program right now that you can show me the 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 real ones and zeros or you can even show me assembler code format i would have no clue what my program is really doing you know i know what it is doing at a higher level because I'm taking the tools and making them work in a certain way. Well, mathematics is the same way. You are taking tools, putting them together in particular ways that we know work, like a machine. So there are this, part, this part of the machine works, this part of the machine works, we ram it together and it does something else. And so that's kind of the way in which theories continue to progress without necessarily having a very good um, theoretical background that we can intuitively understand in, 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 in any really good way so what i would say is that there is a that you're probably coming to 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 mathematical truths that are where you're re representing one part here and another part there and because the theory doesn't necessarily uh, match the truth that you're actually retrieving it's hard to understand that connection so that is that's one of i, I think what is stymied progress for the past 100 years is that we we are working with an analogy uh, i you know i'm, I'm saying that the hydrodynamic view is the superior view that will allow us to understand what our mathematics are doing, and and we'll be able to because of what with the, our developments in in uh, just fluid dynamics, etc., we'll be able to apply some of those lessons learned there to our our current theory and be able to start making advances that that you know that are workable. Yep, that's amazing. I'm just writing in chat here how stupid you guys make me feel, but like in a good way. <laughs> You know, but like it's there. It's like, damn, now I feel really stupid. So just the entire world knows that you guys are really, really smart. So, yeah, right, so so, you know, this is absolutely wonderful. Alex, I think you'd started to say something, right? You, you had a question earlier or. Yeah. Uh, um, well, I had a uh, an aside for Shiva. Or do you have an eidetic memory? Because it seems like you do. Jesus. The amount well, of information. Uh, <laughs> it's 20 years of doing this. So that's, you know, you're going to go over the same, same material a lot. You end up, you can't help but remember all of it. Um, one thing, uh, you know, I, I would say that uh, I, I forgot to add to this that I think is very, that everybody's going to come to this question later on is the, uh, how is it that if there was an ether that it wasn't detected at all by the, the, the Michelson, and it's going to come to some details. And this, this is why I actually tell the story going back to uh, the, the Zoe experiment. So 
uh, some of the things, something I'll send you guys off with that, that you might want to look into is uh, Dayton Miller was given the 1923 Newcomb Cleveland Prize for the detection of the ether. And uh, and he is the reason why Einstein did not ever get a Nobel for relativity, but instead only got a Nobel for uh, the photoelectric effect. Uh, it's specifically him that, that blocked it uh, because of this the, these experiments that he did. He did tens of thousands of replications of the Michelson Morley experiment and uh, and dip with with and he actually he he created a double blinding um, type of methodology in this physical science where the person reading the interferometer as it spun around was talking to a person in the other room and they were just writing it down that way they couldn't have any bias about where the person is what direction they're facing and uh, and you know years later th this data was so voluminous that uh, Maurice Allais who is a uh, Nobel winning economist actually looked at the data and found correlations that they, with the, the side wheel day, with the, um, the, 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 the position of the earth with respect to the sun, all of these things in the, in these interferometer experiments. And so you have to say, well, isn't what you're saying that a, a, an experiment, that an interferometer experiment should be exactly null. And I, and this is the point at which it's very important. And that is the, the, uh, the, the, Index of refraction in the air is going to have a very minute effect according to the um, um, Fizeau experiment. In other words, so the, the index of refraction, which which uh, Fresnel called that the um, was the coefficient of ether draft. So this partial effect, and it's going to be based upon the 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 material substance. So therefore, any uh, any experiment in a vacuum should be null. But an experiment that is in a gas should have a non-null uh, result. Go look at the original Michelson-Morley experiment of 1887. The data. Plot it yourself. Now all you have to do is just well, it, it, it goes all the way when it goes in a full circle. So you just need to make, change that the temperature variation, and what you'll see is a dual sine wave of readings. That is exactly what you would expect of an ether wind. In other words, you expect an ether wind. But there's a nonlinear relationship between the size of the uh, of the result and the speed that it means. The wind speed of the original 1887 Michelson Morley experiment was between eight and twelve kilometers per second, which is only a third of what you would uh, expect of the Earth going around the sun. So the 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 lesson here that I want to tell you, whenever because you're going to go back and you're going to think about some of this, is that trying to navigate from North America to Africa by putting a little paddle wheel underneath your boat and measuring how far you go uh, is not going to ever work. You're going to be hopelessly lost because there are various currents at various different scales that are going to radically change what you get as you navigate through it. The same thing would be true of an ether like we were talking about. There's a relativistic ether. There would be very different currents in different places. And so there's, like I said, very long story. You're going to have questions for me later. You're going to say, what about this? What about that? And like I said, I've been doing this 20 years. I, I do have answers for all of those. And this is something I want to, uh, you know, let people know this is not my thing. This is, this is history. This is, they already had these things worked out. We just selected one thing over the other because of sociological reasons. Okay. Um, let me go to Dan really quick and then Curtis and Michael, if that's okay. Oh, sorry. Yeah. So Dan, if you can go quick. In your opinion, is the the cosmological constant a version of an ether theory? The, uh, well, it's too deeply embedded to call it that. Um, you know, there are things like the... Um, there are various analogies. Dark matter, for instance, the the reason why. Okay, one of the aspects of this ether theory that that I sort of uh, why I talk about going back two hundred years to Fresnel is his his uh, way of explaining the index of refraction. So wave speed has to do with density and 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 rigidity. And so increased density slows the wave. Uh, increased uh, rigidity increases the speed, and so you have to do a calculation based on those things. He assumed that there was increased density inside of a, uh, a material object, and that is what caused the index of refraction. If you merely say, uh, think that it is reduced rigidity, and so, and so in other words, simply change one for the other, the math comes out exactly the same, but your whole perspective of the universe turns inside out, and you end up seeing that 
matter is instead the foam at the edge of the universe. And what we're looking at is, is material bodies are the, they're, they're more holes than they are the, the thing. And the thing is the, the ether itself. In other words, the, the, the vacuum is the primary substance and the and matter itself it becomes the effect. Now this is going it's back sort to the polarizable elements. vacuum model. Say again. So it's sort of like a polarizable vacuum model. Well, this goes uh, uh, back to uh, uh, Kelvin's ring vortex. Uh, you know, is, is not which goes to not theory. It, his ring vortex atom actually works especially well once you start to understand the mechanics that Bell and, and I mean not Bell, excuse me, um, that John Bush. And, and Kude did with the, the walkers, understanding the, the way in which both the, the wave interacts with the, the droplet. In other words, the discontinuity in the system, the droplet, the way in which the wave interacts with those things actually um, is the, it, it, well, you know, I'm not sure exactly where I was going on there. Your smile threw me off. <laughs> but um, the, uh, Lost the train of thought. Oh, it's okay. Let, let me go to let me go to Michael really quick. And again, we're we're pushing up against the top of the hour, and we have to do lab time. Uh, Michael, yep, go yep. for it, sir. So she's a very very good, spot on with all of this. It looks like indeed there are a bunch of papers on Google Scholar that they say they measure the one way speed of light, and then not many people really cite them. But that uh, that may indeed be more due to sociological reasons than uh, clear thinking. Um, one thing that you might be excited to hear is, uh, at least the, with the model that I'm working on, maybe Todd Desiato also has a similar model, Professor Tejinder, all, all of these models were looking at, well, even like spontaneous symmetry breaking in the vacuum, mm -hmm. you can think of it as a, a material phase change. So mm -hmm. when you have virtual particles close enough together in large enough quantities, so when you have enough energy density in the vacuum, then the virtual particles overlap and you get the electroweak unification. And it's due to that overlapping. Um, it, it, it's it's identical to like a phase change, like from liquid to gas or, or well, in this case, gas to liquid more like uh, or, or liquid to solid. Uh, but you're cre the creating a particle. You, you have like a, a droplet of a different phase in the vacuum in a sense. Yep, exactly. And, yeah. uh, and I, I explained this through the idea of cavitation. In other words, if you, if you've seen a, uh, a cavitation in a, a fluid uh, that is a, it's basically a hole ripped in the fluid. Uh, well, one of the things that will occur, like say, for instance, you have a vortex in a fluid that it, it is, it's already starting to, um, it hasn't reached the threshold yet, but a wave which traverses the center of that vortex will then cause it to cavitate because of the additional energy uh, increases the speed of the rotation, which then, you know, would give you the idea of here's a particle created. It is emergent uh, by the way in which the wave and the vortex interact. And so there's there's a wave vortex. Uh, wave vortex duality is actually something that's fairly well known in, in uh, fluid dynamics and especially in, in plasma physics. And uh, like I said, uh, there's too many things I can I can bunny trail on. And so we got to kind of. Yeah, sure. that's fair. But yeah, it's yeah. exciting because uh, you get this phase change and uh, I mean that yeah you can just look at even like with the strong force then you look at like neutrons and protons and you can think of them as particles that have a non-zero conduction because of the quark model so like you can imagine the the charges moving around on the particle surface so you can think of these as conducting plates and then you see that in fact you can uh if you if you see what the Casimir force is at that size scale it's equivalent to the strong force so, like, it 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 it, map, it matches really nicely all of this stuff. Absolutely, yeah. yeah and that, that wasn't that wasn't my idea to begin with. I think another uh, researcher th thought of that idea. But yeah, uh, this um, the the material medium approach is the right way to go. And the Michelson Morley experiment got it wrong simply because people assumed that if something didn't have a reference frame of its own, it couldn't possibly have material properties of its own. But we know that virtual particles don't have a well-defined position and momentum. So if you make a material out of virtual particles, it could very well be generally covariant. Well, also part of the, the reasoning is they kind of had a Stokes model that they that they use. In other words, like a grid type of ether instead of one that could flow against itself. Uh, yeah, of course, a solid yeah. instead of a liquid. Yeah. It's well, more, we know it, 
obvious moves as a super fluid. And it's made, yeah. space does move against itself. And so the, the, because of that idea that the universe is this one grid thing, their, their expectations of what speed you should get were ridiculous. And then he also, yeah. he also he looked at the left, the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the readings for East West. He didn't pay attention to what was the highest readings and lowest readings and the fact that it was a dual sine wave exactly as as would be expected of that experiment and so you know there, there's a variety of things like that but the funny thing is it's an accidental advancement in other words the the looking at the effect in a vacuum is actually what leads us to relativistic ether which is the you know we, we do need relativity and so the the it's it's so weirdly serendipitous that it was reported as null but anyhow yeah. Okay. Well, let me see. We are at the top. We have one minute left. Uh, Curtis, do you think you could go super quick? And then yeah, uh, just real quick. Uh, I wanted to understand the mechanism for particle pa and antiparticle pair creation and annihilation in in the in the theory you're discussing discussing. Okay. So uh, if you if you go and you, I, I really recommend you learn a little bit about uh, Kelvin's, uh, Kelvin's ring vortex model. Uh, but then there is uh, something called the the Faraday uh, wave mode of a cavity. So um, you, there's a there's a variety of different things in fluid mechanics that are at play here, but there is the the creation of um, laminar flow layers that can occur, and then whenever something is is a uh, a standing wave, uh, one of the things that will occur, like say for instance, you have a you, you create a wave pool that has a checkerboard of standing waves. Underneath those standing waves will be, will vortices will then appear. Uh, but then there are also the various, like if you've ever seen cymatics experiments, basically what they're looking at is the the um, Faraday wave modes where you have, you know, you'll have a an octagon, a hexagon. Like for instance, we see the the uh, there's a there's a, uh, a hexagon on, on the, uh, the North Pole of Saturn, and then there's a five-sided and eight-sided uh, figure of, of vortices on the top of uh, and bottom of Jupiter, and they're persistent. And, uh, and so the understanding of the way in which uh, waves and vortices interact and the way in which they can, there can it be a spontaneous sort of creation of a, a virtual cavity can make it such that there's a, there's are these stable vortex structures that are interacting and pumped by the, the the waves that are occurring in them. And so when, when we're talking about this spontaneous emergence of a, an electron, for instance, as a as this you know, this fluid that is not a perfect flow, of course, it's going to be it's going to have various uh, you know subtle changes in the flow of the, the fluid within the, this cavity that has a stable uh, wave mode, and, and there's going to have a certain number of vortices. Well, as the waves cross the vortices, they will be spun up and then cavitate, and that would create your, your particle. And so in other words, the cavitation, the momentary existence that you, that's one of the things that we see whenever we're looking at electrons, for instance, this kind of momentary existence, the momentary existence of it would be mediated by this interaction of the wave and the vortex where there is a uh, wave vortex duality. And of course, there's there's issues of non-linearity at, at the quantum scale when it comes to a fluid dynamical approach and how this would lead to solitons. And, you know, and I, like I said, these are, I'm just talking about, th these are things that I've done research where there are a wide variety of people who dare not call it ether and who have been doing this research for many, many years. And they're, they've been publishing papers and not being noticed. And they're out there right now. And that's why I, I've been, I'm just referring to this as the, the neoclassical interpretation because, you know, there's neoclassical physics.org, I think, that's not my, was, was there before me. And the, this guy who actually is the English translator of the Klosserat, uh book from 1909. Awesome. Oh, uh, if Guys. I may add one thing regarding the uh, soliton models. Um, I've been studying those recently. I'm starting to catch up uh, with the, even, even just with the KDV equation, you can see as solitons move through each other, they change their motion speed. So with physical particles, um, you can think of the, uh, if, if, if physical particles are solitonic, you can think of the, uh, if you compare the, like the standard two-way wave equation, so for waves instead of particles, uh, and you calculate what the refractive index of the particles would be based on the KDV data, then uh, you, you find that the fine structure constant is just the, the refractive index of these particles. Yeah, awesome. there's, there's okay. a lot of fun stuff that pops out. Yeah. Awesome. So, guys, let's put our hands together again. Giant thank you, Shiva. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. 
And I, I hope to invite you back and have you share more and we'll, we'll have a little bit more time then. So for today, what I want to do is I'm actually, I'm going to go to Mark Sokol. We're going to start with lab time now. And uh, again, guys, thank you so much. Today has been absolutely tremendous. Our conference just keeps getting better and better and better. <coughs> so let, let me go over to Mark. And I think Mark, you're the co-host, right? So I am. Yes. 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 And Mark is okay. The whole time today, but. I'm just going to take everybody off the screen and Mr. Sokol, the ship is yours. Dun, dun, dun. Okay. So as we sail away, um, we have some, some updates for you guys. As you can see, the traveling wave tube amplifier for our Alcipon experiments taken apart. Um, there was a, uh, um, something happened to it. They were still trying to figure out why it's not working, but that happened in the middle of an experiment that gave us some very interesting, um, I would say nearly conclusive results that we're seeing some weight loss relating to this experiment, and I will be showing to them to you shortly right here. So what you're seeing is a screenshot. Um, looks like it's chopped off on the side a little bit. Um, no, that's, that's how it comes. Okay. So what you're looking at is um, on the X axis is time and it's about, five and a half hours. So it's a pretty long length of time. The red line over here that goes up and down, that's the magnetic field strength. Um, and the yellow line that follows kind of with it is what the computer is telling the magnetic field to be at. Um, you can see over here on the seventh uh, run that is visible, um, something happened with the electromagnet. That's happened sometimes. Sometimes it voltages out because uh, it's voltage uh, regulated. But uh, the bright green you see over here is the weight of the sample. And what we are seeing, um, besides these little two little bumps in the beginning, which seem to follow on almost every single run, we're seeing a constant weight loss about halfway through the magnetic field sweep. So it starts at around, uh, that's around 4,000. It peaks and then it reaches its lowest at around 5,200 or so. Um, and this happens on every single run. Um, but what happened over here towards the end on the right is something happened to the traveling wave tube amplifier. Um, I think it overheated uh, in some form and it went into error mode. So all this uh, purple, which you see is the signal, um, signal coming back, that all you know, zeroed out. And the, the weight loss did not continue at that spot. It, it, it is a bit noisy. I'll give you that. It is noisy. Um, and, and this sharp swipe over here is probably a relay switching inside the, um, it, inside the traveling wave tube amplifier. That's probably what that is. But um, you can clearly see that the, the, uh, the magnet was not the um, what was not the contributing factor to this weight loss because the magnet continued to doing its sweep that was doing before um, after the the RF shut off and yet we still saw we only saw the weight loss when both components were running so that acted as a control test um, I, I have seen uh, such weight losses before this isn't a, a very significant amount of weight loss what's What's significant here is the repeatability. We have eight times in a row we're seeing a weight loss in a sample, which was aluminum uh, powder mixed in with some iron powder in a uh, encapsulated in epoxy hanging inside of the waveguide, which is inside the electromagnet's uh, magnetic field. So uh, this sort of proves that Alzafon is, um, you know, th there is some sort of connection there. Um, Next thing, we're going to fix the traveling wave tube amplifier and um, get some more repeatable tests like we see here. And we're going to add in our um, triplet state electrons with the uh, with the, the pulsing light or laser method as well. With the pentacene crystal that we've talked about earlier. And hopefully we'll be able to increase this signal and uh, see some more weight loss. So any questions, I'll, I'll leave this up here for a moment and um, continue the conversation. This, this, 
This is the same data that I have. If anyone wants to look through the raw data, meaning the Excel sheet, that this is derived, uh, I'm willing to share it. Mark, so th that's awesome, man. Can I bring, Drew was asking if he could come in. I'm not sure if anybody oh, else wants to come in too. Uh, should I, let me yeah, see, Drew, on. and does anybody else want to come in there? <clears throat> Looks like Curtis turned on his camera. Hey, Curtis. There's there's Curtis. Okay, hey there. we're Drew. squeezing in tight here. Yeah, Drew. So I uh, finally got my lab view running, and this is our first run. We got awesome. Uh, just in just in case you want uh, need any help, um, Joe said he'd be happy to jump in there, and he's our he's our lab view genius on our end. Yeah, I'm, I might take you up on that, but um, for just now, contact him directly. He, he, he'll oh, wow. jump right in there and, you know, if he can, if he can unscramble whatever you have scrambled or if he can help, he, he's, he's happy to. He's out in yeah, Texas. This was about two months of work with, I was working with a lab view guy out in Pakistan um, to put this all together. Many of these things, he had to write the drivers uh, by hand manually. Mm. It was, it was a very 30 year old equipment. Oh man, I, I would love to learn how to write drivers. Is that the the guy from like the guy from Pakistan? The... Yeah, yeah, he's working with Jared now too. Um, well, I, I would just pay him to teach me how to write drivers. That's awesome. That's a Michael, skill. I don't I don't know if you have the time for it, but it um it did yeah, involve maybe. finding the programming manual too. Uh, just question. Uh, well, yeah, no, but uh, yeah, writing drivers is a manual. useful skill, like for yeah. all of these old piece of equipment yeah yeah okay. anyway i better head out for the night but awesome stuff mark now we're getting good data on this i'd like to see a bunch more of these so we can average them out and see with a we can get better error bars on this and stuff like that and, you know yeah I, i'm i'm so mark i'm as as i tell you all the time i am so excited i mean this it's becoming real right and it's not just the results it's like the professional test apparatus, the methodology you're using, the way you're arriving at samples, you know, and, and it's not just what you're doing. I mean, like right below me on the screen there is Drew, right? And it's the same thing. It's little bits. It's every day, every day, every day. Everyone here is doing that, is moving forward. And for, for me, from kind of like a, you know, because I'm not doing the experiments, I'm like an onlooker. And as an onlooker, dude, this is seriously exciting. I mean, I cannot congratulate you guys enough. This is it. It's hey, Mark. happening. Mark, yes. can can you can you just walk through them little green squiggles again slowly? And and because okay. I'm I want to get excited for you, man, but I, I don't I don't understand what the green squiggles mean. Okay, so if there's two different anything. shades of green. There's a there's the light, bright green. That's the weight of the sample. Uh the darker green on top is the weight of the test chamber itself. So the test chamber is on a pivot and you're able to weigh it separately because of the pivot joint. Um, but the, 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 the test chamber is made out of copper. We haven't seen much of a weight loss in that. Um, there might be, I, I haven't seen it out of the data. So what we're seeing here is the magnetic field and the RF. Uh, the RF is going into the, magne into the uh, chamber. Some of it's bouncing back. What bounces back goes to a spectrum analyzer, and uh, the peak of the of the energy coming back would go into the purple line over there, which is really thick because the RF is pulsing on and off, and the spectrum analyzer isn't reading it fast enough. So sometimes it catches it when it's on, sometimes it catches it when it's off. So you see the full the full gamut, either the on and the off all together as one big fat line. But what really matters with the uh, with the purple line is the line on the bottom of it, the uh, the edge on the bottom. Um, the magnetic field strength is the red line. Now, <clears throat> so as the magnetic field strength is changing, with RF is staying constant, um, the RF that's coming back from the chamber is changing. That's because of electron paramagnetic resonance. Um, as you the Larmor precession of different electrons that are in the, uh, in, the, in the sample change the sounding wave ratio of the entire apparatus, hence bringing you back more RF. And you, you know that that's correct because we have eight repetitions here, and almost every one of them has the exact same line on the bottom of the purple. Um, 
The next thing you see is the green squiggly line is losing weight at about the three-quarter mark of every single test. It's losing a consistent amount of weight almost every single time. And not only that, there's there's some uh, smaller signals in in the towards the beginning of the test. There's two like little drops and peaks um, that are also replicated in every single run. Um, now these equate to about one percent of the weight of the sample. Sample being one point seven five grams roughly. So we're talking milligrams over here, which I normally wouldn't get excited about. Um, but the fact that we're seeing it con consistently at the same point of every sweep, uh, and it's not just following the sweep. If, if it was just a, a ferrous effect that would be following the magnetic field, you know, th th that would be taken into as, um, as, as a standard error. It's not. It's the weight loss is happening about three quarters of the way into each sweep. Magnetic field is sweeping, I think, between 2,000. 2,000 and uh, yeah, it goes from 2,000 to 5,430 gauss. So as you align everything, it gets lighter. And then as yes. it springs yes. back, it gets heavier. And yes. then at the next pulse, it aligns and then it springs back. Then it gets lighter and lighter and lighter. But we're not actually staying in one spot. In order to actually amplify this effect, I would have to pick out from the data where the signal was the strongest, uh, where I was getting the most weight loss, and just keep it there or in a very small range of that with magnetic kind field. Kind of for like a resonance or something? Yeah, it needs to stay in that resonance spot for a long time. Uh, with, with this setup, I'm jumping between different resonances. We're, go, we're, we're getting a spectrum of the weight of the sample as it changes. Damn. All right. Um, we expect it to be slightly different for each sample, depending on what, what's in there, because um, EPR, electron paramagnetic resonance, it depends which, which valence band of electrons you're dealing with. Um, Bismuth, we expect to have a lot of noise. We expect to have a lot of different uh, peaks and stuff. Um, and uh, we expect with lithium metal to have uh, the sharpest peaks. Um, that's based on just what some NMR, EPR people told me. But um, I'm still wor working with just these al um, aluminum iron sample. Um, and right now our RF uh, amplifier is broke, so we got to fix that. Okay. Well, Mark, if that's if that's everything, let me take that screen down. I'm going to bring everybody in. We need to give you. Let's give Mark an applause. He is doing the work, getting the results. This is coming together. This is coming together, man. I, I, I congratulations, congratulations. Um, if it's okay, let me go to Curtis Horn. Curtis, you were going to share a video. Here, I'll, I'll take everybody else out. Sure. It, it, do you want me to share that for you, or do you want to um, try to share it? my screen? Yeah. Yeah, go for it. Uh, let's see here. Let's see which screen. I'm not sure which screen you guys can see. Okay. Uh, yeah, so you, you go into the – it's the present button and then slides. Oops. So present, screen share, and it'll show your tabs. And if you have one open for YouTube, it'll let you share that. Okay. Entire screen. There we go. And okay, can you guys see my screen now? No, not yet. Not no. yet. Let's okay. see. Here, I'll, I'll stay with you until it's up. Um, yes. Yeah, so oh, again, hold on. Uh, I I need to give uh, I need to give Chrome permission. Apparently. Ah. Okay. So let's see here. Yeah, Bernie, Bernie Conkin is the person who got us on StreamYard, and you know I, I really do love it. It grows on you. It, it's it's got some really nice fluid features to it. It's got a share of quirks, but I'm I'm gonna have to uh, um to change the setting. I'm gonna have to come back in, so I'll be right back. Okay.
Oh, and Mark just left. Okay. Yeah. So we are waiting for Cur what? Ah, oh, th there we go. Okay. Uh, Cur Cur yeah, Mark. I'm, dude. You guys. I know you guys think I'm just like a brown noser, but like I'm seriously stoked. I'm seriously. Oh, there we go. Okay, Curtis, you're all set. Yeah. So let's see if I can share my screen now. Share screen. Okay. Wonderful. And you, I know you're doing awesome mm -hmm. stuff too. You were getting results too. Everybody is right now. There we go. Yeah. There we go. All right. So this is um, one of the runs from uh, the 13th of January, and I'll put it full screen here. And so what you're gonna what you're gonna see is uh, in here you can see the device. It's mounted uh, in a way where it's uh, free to move on these bearings. And what you have here on the right is a, um, a brass reaction mass. On the left is aluminum, an aluminum cap. So the brass is, you know, heavier and, and larger. Um, and in between them is the, is the piezoelectric core. And so basically what will happen is as this, as this moves, if the, you know, if the uh, mock effect uh, is working as intended, it should be able to push this, this, uh, um, um, uh, this side. So you, you, you have, we have some registration uh, points here for uh, video analysis, but this is uh, rigidly connected to a torsion arm, so it can move left and right. So I'll go ahead and play it. And oh, and by the way, the squiggly lines on the, on the left, I'll describe as it's going along. So uh, the bottom left is um, um, basically showing some uh, where the resonances are. Um, in, in this uh, middle layer, there's different squiggly lines doing different things. The blue one is the, the waveform of the energy that's going in. And then up here, the red line is the actual position that measured uh, on the other side of this torsion arm of, of, you know, how far that torsion arm is getting pushed. So you can see that basically this guy is moving and he's pushing it off to the, to the right. And really, there's not a lot of swing back and forth. And, and in the past, we've had it so that, you know, it, it'll swing back and forth and look a lot like noise. And you see there, there are some lar very large um, reactions that happened here. And this was at uh, 1.4 10 to the minus 4 uh, tor. So uh, basically, there's almost, you know, there's very little, very little air or atmosphere in there. Um, that that was not the, the best. Um, that was not the best run. I think the best one run was number four, which is what that graph I showed in the presentation was. Let me, let me mute that. That's the um, that's one of the pumps. And you can see this one immediately just kept on pulsing and kicking off the entire run. So so you're we're getting a lot of movement here, and, and it's actually overranging um, uh, in uh, the um, the measurement. So you know you can see this is going up to five volts. So this this is this is really um, was really a, a, a really good run, and um, uh, throughout that day that that was that was working. Now we have since put this back on here, and um, it, while it does it does do the same thing, it's kind of binding. Uh, unfortunately, these these bearings sometimes um, um, because there's so much vibration and energy happening, they sometimes uh, uh, start binding. Uh, on on the metal rods so um, yeah we're, we're getting we're getting good um, good effects and uh, let me stop sharing here um, we're we're hoping to get at least three more uh, um, art, test articles and be able to repeat it repeat this uh, you know repeat it reliably and once we do that uh, uh, we might need a, a replication so yeah, that's where we're at. Awesome. Awesome. I, I may get a little echo here because I had to take my earpods off to charge them up. I just ran out of juice, but uh, let me see. So, Curtis, thank you, sir. Thank you. Let's go to uh, Drew. Do you have an update for us? I think Drew does. Yes. Oh, okay. Um, and I don't want to sound cryptic, but I have to sanitize this because this this test is only like an hour and a half old. 
Oh, okay. Um, do, do you want? Do, so should we come back in a moment? Yeah, just yeah, if you can give me two minutes, and I'll be okay. ready. So go on Good to the deal. next person, and I'll be I'll be right here. Okay. Yeah. Well, Curtis, thank you, man. Thank you. I, sure, I'm not no going to force you guys. I'm not going to force everybody to clap like every time for lab time because it'll drive you nuts, and I'll get I'll get beat up. Wait, there's Jared. Jared's okay. We'll we'll clap. <laughs> Well, Tim, yeah, I, I have. Love... Oh yeah, D I, Jared... I have a, a little twenty-second clip to show. Okay, okay, let let me do that then. Yeah, and again, it's uh, if you present, share screen, and then yep. pick the yeah. Uh, all right, we can all see it. I hope so. Charles Crawford and I had a meeting with Alexei Chekhov, the uh, oh, uh, Jared, the inventor. Jared, I'm, oh. I'm sorry, sir. It's not. It's not showing. It's not. It's not showing. There we go. Now it's showing. Okay, okay. I had to give it some some time. All right. So we got uh, my partner Charles and I uh, had a meeting with Alexei Chekhov, the inventor of the gravel flyer, um, just uh, within the last week or two, and he built a whole nother device for us just so he could do a live demonstration for us uh, of his entire tuning process. And here is a little clip for everybody to see. This is three and a half hours watching him go through three rounds of tuning because he hadn't actually tested this prior to our meeting. So it wasn't necessarily tuned perfectly to be able to lift off straight up. So instead, since it, the spacing of these rotors is a little bit off from what they should be to be perfectly tuned, uh, the thing just tips over like it does in some of his other videos. But three three tries, and he managed to make the thing actually do the thing. So I'll just do that a couple of times here. So he's pulsing the ultrasound here when he already has everything else already tuned up right. And it ends up creating some kind of standing wave, but because that standing wave is offset off to the side, it uh, it ends up tip, tipping itself over. But it was the first and only live demonstration he's ever done uh, for this device. And along with it, he gave us really good tuning instructions. So now Charles and I are quickly working through that to try to replicate his his results that he showed us wow this is this is amazing jared really this is like okay. confirmation that everything you're working on is real yes absolutely so up until this point because no one had ever actually seen him do it there had always been kind of a question mark as to you know how legit is this thing how legit is this guy but after Charles and I got to watch him go through the process three times over three and a half hours, trying to get it tuned just right. Cause if, if he hits that button and he misses the, the, the moment where everything is, is in resonance, he has to turn it all off and start again. And it takes about 30 to 45 minutes each time you want to go through the process of getting it up to the point where it's in this perfect resonance state that you can pulse it on and catch that. And then it'll lift up. So the fact that it wasn't you know the, the what's he flicking that button that he's pushing is turning off the ultrasound buzzer so just a little quick rundown on this thing you got two spinning discs you got a center disc that doesn't spin and then you got a ultrasound buzzer on top so you got high voltage on the spinning discs from dc you got an ac high voltage rf one megahertz ish on the center plate and then you got uh this piezoelectric buzzer on the top. And that button that he's pushing is what turns off the piezoelectric buzzer. So he's going through this tuning process, simultaneously tuning the ultrasound frequency and the uh, RF frequency and amplitude of the uh, center plate there. So as he's doing all of that for 20 minutes or so, um, finally he'll find this sweet spot where everything is is resonating just right and he lets it th sit there for a few seconds and then he turns off the ultrasound by holding down that button it turns it off i have observed with all of my equipment here 
that when you turn off the ultrasound, about three to 10 seconds later, there's an RF release. Like there's this huge pulse of RF energy that gets released all at once. Like it's storing up this energy in some kind of, I don't know, RF standing wave or something. And then when you turn off the ultrasound after a few seconds, that that Q factor is low enough that 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 dissipates. But it it dissipates very rapidly. And so you get this pulse of RF energy. So I think what he's doing is he pushes the button that turns off the ultrasound. He holds it down for a few seconds. He lets it off. It builds up the field again. He pushes it again and then it collapses it and he starts pushing it faster and faster and faster. And then usually within the third to fifth push, uh, it'll, it'll pop up off the ground. So it's, it's a weird deal. Like it's a very complicated tuning process and it's a very artistic rendition of trying to, you know, find that sweet spot. Cause as you saw in that video, he doesn't have any screens. He doesn't have any like test equipment or anything. He's doing it all just by sound of the, the sound of the beat frequency for the speed differences of the two spinning discs, as well as um, the physical, uh, the vertical motion of those discs all create a bunch of different um, vibrational sounds that you can hear as well. I've picked them up at about 420 hertz, 610 hertz, 50 hertz. There's there's a lot of lower frequency mechanical vibration sounds. So you start listening for those too. And he's doing it all by ear. But yeah, so it's it's an ultrasound off button that he's holding and then pulsing faster and faster. Wow. Question, has this, this been uh, um, uh, done in a vacuum? Uh, no. In fact, I don't necessarily know that <coughs> it will work in a vacuum. Uh, I have this spreadsheet that I've made that takes all of the different materials into account to include the air. Uh, and it shows the, the correlations between the sizes of the discs he used, the thickness of the discs he used, the frequencies that he used for each of these different components. And it suggests also in that um, that three and a half hours we had with him, I asked him how does temperature affect stuff? Cause that'll tell you a lot. If cold air or hot air changes your frequencies or changes the spacing, that tells you a lot about what's going on. And he said that uh, colder air uh, made it so the discs had to be closer and the frequency had to be lower. Hotter air meant farther apart discs and higher frequencies. So there is a, there is an atmospheric component to it, which, makes me think that it's creating some kind of standing wave beneath it. Um, just yesterday, I was observing those acoustics that I was talking about, those 600 hertz thing, and there's there's gaps. So you'll hear it at like a foot and a half, three feet, seven feet, 12 feet, and you won't hear it anywhere in between there, right? And this isn't yeah. like ultrasound that's super directional. This is a low frequency, so you should hear it everywhere. So it's creating some kind of acoustic standing wave. Uh, low frequencies. I actually had a uh, customer who came here for the hybrid battery shop way back when, um, who worked at a top secret acoustic laboratory in Poland for, or, or was it in Russia or something like that? And he said he was working with infrasound and they had the exact same effect that there was sounds that you could only hear or feel at certain points in the room. There was peaks and troughs and uh, it was very noticeable because especially at those fr low frequencies, um, you know, sound is, the wavelengths are pretty freaking long. But uh, uh, Jared, I just want to point out one thing, uh, which uh, uh, a question actually, do you think it's possible for it to work in a vacuum? Like if you changed all the parameters to, to account for no air? I don't feel comfortable saying one way or another yet. I want it to be able to work in a vacuum, <laughs> but uh, the fact that we're dealing with acoustic sounds, right? That he's listening for these things uh, the fact that my spreadsheet suggests that it's using uh, certain standing waves uh, in air, like it's using an even number of standing waves on the on the top and an odd number on the bottom, maybe it's vice versa. But either way, he's using an asymmetric number of uh, standing wave nodes in air uh, for the top and bottom. Um, if you had all of that self-contained into, you know, a a disc, a flying saucer that would encapsulate this thing. I don't necessarily see yet how that could be propellantless propulsion if it's relying upon an air medium. So assuming Charles and I can get it going, 
which I have every confidence now at this point that we're going to get it going. Um, the next step after that is to go back to Kepler and do more uh, vacuum testing with it to see if it, it's still possible. And I, I would you, suggest smoke testing too, you know, because you, that's going to tell of, you. Lots of smoke testing already. And, and the smoke testing doesn't really show much in the way of a Kuanda effect or anything. Uh, and it doesn't really show much in the way of these uh, pressure waves that I'm, I'm hearing. So, well, in, in the videos, what's interesting. Oh, I'm sorry, Curtis. Go, go ahead. Go ahead. I, I was just thinking in the videos, you see it, he puts his body over the top and he puts his hands and stuff underneath and you don't see airflow moving the cords. And so uh, maybe there's a standing wave, but, but a lot of the things that would be indicators of airflow aren't there, which is kind of interesting. So so yesterday uh, I was doing some mechanical resonance testing and I noticed the uh, extra low sound, the uh, 50 Hertz and the 400 Hertz sounds coming directly underneath the center of this thing. So there's two, two places around this thing where you can hear the sound. It's directly beneath the center and it's uh, slightly angled upward above the horizontal plane of the center disc there. Uh, that's like the only two places where you can actually hear any of these low vibration sounds it's quite odd so um my experience was two years ago when i started full time with the uh, working with jim woodward and on the mock effect drive they had it at the time out in the air on a pendulum and uh, uh that you know it was it was moving and uh i was very wary of that and I expressed that it took a few months to convince everybody to hey, put some baffles or, or you know, uh, take a step back. And it turned out, yes, that it, it was the air effect. And it's a very similar thing because that, that that device is driven uh, between 40 and 20 hertz. Just depends on the mechanical resonance. And, uh, you know, you got a piezo stack. You're putting in a voltages, uh, pretty high volt. You know, I don't know, not that high. 100 plus volted volts at that frequency. And so you got you you have a very similar um, device it sounds like, and uh, you would expect if it's working to interact with the air. So you would expect you should get air effects. So anybody that does a mock effect type experiment and doesn't see anything, they're doing it wrong. Because if you're doing it in air, you're going to get a push from the air. Now, once you put it in a vacuum, the thing is, we're, what we're trying to I mean, with the mock effect. Is trying to do is, is coax out the mock effect some kind of a, a way for you know propulsion uh, using that using uh, uh, pushing uh, you can call it pushing against the ether whatever the way whatever way you want to look at it um, and uh, ironically that is kind kind of starting to come out now that we don't have the air in there so um, it, it's almost like maybe it was you know, it's dampening the effect or you know, hiding the effect, but those kind of devices, because they're uh, this cut, this the mock effect drive is dependent on the vibration. Um, it it needs the air to to not be uh, uh, in there or to not work against its 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 force. There there is one way in which that it can work in a vacuum because there's multiple theories for how this thing works, right? Um, one of the theories is that it is using that little ultrasound buzzer as an electromechanical coupling for some of these RF standing waves. And so when he's finding the right frequency with that thing, it has very little to do with the air. I mean, it, it, you could still keep it encapsulated in air, but you might be able to use a better medium than air, just as long as there's some way to mechanically couple the vibration of that thing to the mechanical vibration of the rest of the discs, and then couple back the RF, right? So a medium that transfers the mechanical energy without impeding the RF uh, reflection. Um, but if that's the case, then uh, that electromechanical coupling, I think might work similar to the asymmetric damping of the mega drive um, where, I mean, it's the, it's the same thing in a different, you know, in a different box. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. It, may, it might be a combination of the um, mega drive and the MLT drive, right? The Mox Lorenz. Um, mm -hmm. Cause you get in that drive, you get, have a spinning magnetic field. So there, there could be something there, but yeah, definitely uh, try to do the testing in the vacuum. Um, and, and, you know, it, it's, it's, it's kind of weird because like some of the same uh, things that advanced doing it in air 
could could uh, work in the vacuum as well. But uh, some things could work against you. Where if you optimize an error, you might not get you might not get the um, effect that you really want, which is to work in the vacuum. Uh, one other thing that uh, one of the um, uh, collaborators in, in 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 our group has mentioned is that. Uh, what what she because what she's doing uh, Michelle what she's doing is she has uh, uh, an air sled basically with the rod and some air bearings and she has the device encapsulated mm. so that uh, she's trying to block the air effects but she doesn't have it in a vacuum so what she's considering doing is putting things like helium or argon because they'll have different um, effects in terms of like uh, you know how how they how they move but ideally you would want a really good vacuum. That, that's that's the ultimate way to go awesome well guys if it's okay let me go to drew now and uh and then actually man we're just like we're on the hour every hour today but that that's awesome that's awesome um yeah and again jared you guys are doing amazing work as well this is just this is the year you know this it's all happening uh drew go for it sir yeah, I'm just trying to figure out which button to push to share my screen. Here, I'll, I'll take everybody out. I'm just admiring Mark's coat too in the background. Is it? He had that hood on a minute present, ago. Present, yeah. Is it present? Present. It, oh, share screen. Okay. Yeah, the present button and the share screen. Oh, share screen, screen sharing, looking, looking, some screen, screen sharing to share screen. I don't know what the hell it is. Okay. Uh, present, share screen. It, it'll make you pick I truly your window. Truly hate computers. Okay, uh, you're seeing in something that looks like a graph? Maybe? N not not yet, not yet. There it is. Okay, Maybe? perfect. Okay, um uh the only thing I can tell about this to tell you about this experiment is um it, it sounds like we always have success, we don't. This was a particularly miserable day in my life. Um things that should have worked didn't and things that shouldn't have worked didn't and things that have never failed did um and then i called charlie and blamed him for everything so um this was a, a an interesting step forward where i i, I kind of went away from my core bread and butter work for the last six six months and just chose a plate chemistry that i was happy with and stuck three of them in the chamber at some distance apart um, and I apologize for the blurriness of the image, but I had to knock it down some because um, we have enemies in the world, apparently. So I don't want to share the magic with the whole world yet. Um, but basically, these are three plates, and this test example is the center plate. And basically, it starts down here at zero. Um, this is uh, in millinewtons, and this is basically because I have um, a real system, it has mechanical drift. So this is the first, whatever that is, maybe the first 40 or 50 or 60 seconds of operation. And it's got a little tiny drift to it, maybe probably 20, 20 micronewtons per 100 seconds or something like that. Um, then hit the power button and drop the voltage. And it's dropped in steps so that it doesn't short the plates. Um, because the plates don't like to be hit with high voltage all at once. And the thrust immediately comes up until it hits about 1.5 millinewtons. Again, this is only the center plate that's being energized of the three plates. Um, run it for a little while to see what it's going to do. Is it going to bleed off? Is it fake? Is it real? Does the machine get bored and spit out some garbage? Um, in this case, it was very steady. Turn off the power. Thrust drops down to here takes about a hundred seconds, give or take, to bleed these plates down because they're starting to act like big ass capacitors, um, which is what they are. Um, so then some time else, turn on the power again. And in this case, I just, just, you know, here's, here's power off. This is, this is zero volts. And then hit power, drop it down, whatever, 7,500. And the thrust immediately comes up. Drop the power, drop the, or here's the, the power on, and there's the off. And as the, as you can see, as the voltage comes up, 
or I'm sorry, as the um, voltage goes to zero, the thrust drops off to zero again for the most part. Um, a little bit below. There's there's some there's some interference between the plates or something. I don't really understand because the drift of the system is positive, but they ended up about a hundred micronewtons below zero. So that means I'm stealing charge from one of the other plates, or it's getting screwed up and put somewhere else. I don't know. I'll let Charlie figure it all out. Um, but the one the one cool thing I wanted to show here is that somebody. Somebody said that I can't be, I can't, there's no way this thing can work at the power levels that we're talking about. This is real current over here. Um, and this is measured off of the power supply. So this is what the power supply is putting into the system. Um, and as you can see, these numbers are, you know, here's, here's, it's kind of tough to see, but there's the little aqua colored stuff. So at, at, maximum thrust you can see the aqua colored line is buried down inside this purple line well, the purple line is the power supply um the uh it's it's a it's a it's a we burned out our six thousand uh, dollar amperage um detector a couple of months ago so we took it offline but i haven't gotten it out of the software yet but the the aqua colored line is buried underneath here that's the actual power supply and the power supply's um, output is still very accurate. So as you can see, the power consumption, while it's on, is in the noise. It's like it's like less than one, it's like less than 0.1 microamps. And it's 7,500 volts. That works out to something like, I don't know, 600 microwatts. And this is running three plates. Or a, a, I'm sorry, it's, it's it's powering one plate, but it's the same numbers when you run three plates or 300 plates. It doesn't really matter. So it's an electrostatic engine. It's an electrostatic propulsion device. So it's not like we're pumping energy in to make thrust come out. So some other fundamental physics is going on. Um, Charlie and I are differ on what we think is going on. I think we're stealing momentum from the universe. One little wink in. I think we're throwing up a wall in in space, and someday if somebody wants to come over and and have a cup of coffee, I'll explain all the the full details of it. Um, but I think we're when the when the particle comes into existence, boink, it comes into existence with momentum and velocity and I don't know Higgs or whatever, whatever all the crap that it comes into in the universe with, and it slams into this wall that we throw up in space and then it imparts a little of its momentum to the wall well the wall is attached to the plastic plates which is attached to the force meter so wink in slam into the wall wink out or whatever particles do that don't hang around long and the net result is it pushes against the plate this that is what i believe is going on so we're still tuning a couple of the problems um we got some 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 issues with plates and they're not acting quite right but um i'm very happy with 1500 micronewtons for you know, 10 square inches um it's about uh it's about 50 percent of um uh earth unity um because that plate only weighs uh 360 micro or 360 milligrams and it's making 150 milligrams right now of uh, thrust. So I'm very happy with it uh, overall. Um, the, the things that are going wrong are, are very wrong. So I got to fix all that. But, you know, it's just it's a it's a typical Saturday here in the shop. Um, two steps, you know, one step forward and 22 steps backwards. And then we play catch up for the next couple of weeks trying to figure out all the things that are wrong with this test so that's what it's like in the real world i wish i really hope the rest of y'all have better success to failure ratios than i do because this is maddening the stuff that goes wrong on a regular basis anyhow any questions drew that is awesome man that is truly truly awesome i have a question i got a question too 
have, have you considered uh um it sounds like you're you're measuring force with some kind of a, a cell um have you considered uh putting it on bearings and letting it move or putting it on a um, a torsion arm or something oh yeah we've done that we've built spinners we've built the uh, torsion things and and yes this is definitely being measured by a force meter but the digital force meter is accurate down to about 10 micronewtons give or take maybe plus or minus 10 micronewtons in any given test um because we sample 250 times a second and the the actual force meter is only accurate to 0.1 millinewtons that's 100 micronewtons but we sample 250 times a second so when you take the average of that it it truly does give you a much higher resolution so instead of instead of 100 micronewtons it's probably plus or minus 10 or 20 micronewtons so you just can't beat that kind of reproduction of uh, of, of accuracy and data um, right. But we've done the whole thing. We've done the thing where it's hanging down and we turn it on and it moves a, a couple of millimeters. And I guess how much the thing weighs and I guess the short, the small angle theory. And, you know, we do the math and we're, we're accurate to within, I don't know, 20, 30% usually, but it's all guessing because you don't really know where the center of gravity is. You don't know really how much drag you have in the system. You don't know what the bearings are eating up. You don't know what the inertia is, is doing. Um, this is the answer. The answer is put it on a digital force meter and run the test hundreds of times and use the same setup. I mean, we use the same ITO box. We use the same exact the same exact pendulum thing that's hanging there. We use the same little piece of string that ties it to the force meter. Um, right before I run the test, I thump the chamber. Not too hard because otherwise you throw the electromags off and then your turbo goes into scream mode. Um, but but there's mechanical stress in the in that's stored up in the string. You wouldn't think that until you run the test a hundred times. But you know, you, you do the same exact thing every time, and the only thing that's changing is the data. So this may not be a great um uh we'll call it uh this this isn't this isn't probably the greatest um well what, what do we call this? Uh, it's it's not like it's exactly 1,550 micronewtons. I mean, it's, that, that's probably accurate to within 100 micronewtons or so. But that 1,550, you can I, mean, I guarantee you that this crest and this crest are at the same they're at the same accuracy. So if this crest is 1,550 and or 1,500 and this crest is you know 150, then I start looking for what the hell did this thing do wrong. You know, I can get accuracy between tests. So I go for deltas. I go, hey, you know, did this plate work well? Test after test after test after test versus I throw the next plate in there. And since I know the accuracy of the system is relatively the same between major tests, I get a high degree of accuracy that I can say, hey, this, this chemistry is better than that chemistry. Let's, let's move forward or this chemistry is worse than that chemistry. Let's go figure out some other, what we do wrong or this plate spacing is wrong or this voltage is wrong or um, the thing shorted out. So that's probably bad. So you got to be real careful when you start just putting stuff and, and watching it wiggle or, or whatever. It's all about reproducibility of the uh, accuracy. So, did I answer any question? Did I answer your question? Yeah, it sounds like you've done those tests. Thanks. Yeah, got the videos. Hundreds of them. Uh, Drew, what's the uh, pressure? Oh, it's uh, six. Uh, let's see. I, I hate that I have to do it in log, but otherwise the, the, the thing don't record worth a squat. Um, so I'm down around... This was uh, this was early on. This was probably I'm going to say maybe nine or maybe eight eight and a half times ten to the uh, negative six. So probably eight eight point probably somewhere between eight and nine times ten to the minus six tor. So um 
Uh, I, I wanted to make sure I was fully shielded because I didn't want this thing shorting out because of how close this stuff was. So I threw an extra layer of, um, of Kapton on there. And what that did was it trapped a little pocket of air. So I ran the vacuum for, I don't know, 24 hours and uh, to get it all out of there. So it, it, it took a long time because the, there was air trapped. You know, molecules don't like to come out when they're trapped between two sheets of plastic. And there's just this little tiny slit where there's no tape. So it took a long time. And in fact, today when I re-ran this thing, um, I got it down to, because I ran this about 20 different times. Um, but uh, I had it down to 4.5 times 10 to the minus 6, and it was given the same results. This was an early on test. Went on when, when's the 19th? That was yesterday. So this was uh, 2100, so that was sometime last night. So, yeah, it was good vacuum. Um, it doesn't work in atmosphere. It shorts out. We, we're losing energy to the, I don't know what, probably the edge effects where the where the metallization just just sends the atmosphere into corona you know it's only a couple of microns thick the metal that we're laying down it's real easy to send air into uh corona when you got a couple of micron thick metal edge at you know high voltage real 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 easy for that to happen so that's uh, it that's all i got Awesome. Well, I think, and we're, I think we're about the top of the hour. Should we go to open discussion guys? We have uh, Lou Elizondo and uh, Jeremy Corbell in the live chat, but I'm not sure if they're real or if they're puppet accounts. Jeremy, you want to chime in on that? You, you got it. You got to unmute yourself. No, I've seen these guys on a bunch of other, uh, they they go around on a lot of different live streams and troll dude. They look hilarious. <laughs> I've seen them on Steve Cambion's show and um they were on Thomas Fessler one night too. Uh anyways, um yeah, no if we I mean if those guys do want to come on the show, the offer is always on the table if you guys are, are listening or watching. Uh, but but um, you know, before we do open discussion, I, I think we should do at least one more hand for all of our lab experimenters today. I, I want to do that. You guys are kicking serious butt. Serious butt. This is this is one hell of a year. Brian Brian says he suspects imposters. The, for them or for the lab guys? It's oh, not no, really no. Mark. I've never seen Mark in a coat like that before. It's cold. Imposter. I've never seen anybody in a coat like that before. Imposter. I think that's a cool coat. It's, it's, hard to be an it's, in it's 47 man. degrees in my shop. That's why I'm not out there. It's freezing out there. <laughs> Look at that. That's <laughs> hard. What do you say? Man. 27 degrees? 47. If it was 27, I'd have to shoot the weather guy. Over here, it's 20 degrees outside. Yeah, we're we're warming acceptable. back up. Our, our area, we got two feet of slush, which is, in a weird way, even more disgusting than snow. You know, it's it's you can't really do anything with it. It's like snow where, that hasn't left yet. You're just waiting for it to where leave. Where are you at, Tim? I'm in the Seattle area. I'm up in a little town called Blaine, right yeah. at the border. We're right next to the ocean, though, so it usually doesn't stay cold that long. Every once in a while, they punish me and send me out to Kent. Okay, yeah, this is just south of Seattle. Mm -hmm. I've got a couple of uh, <clears throat> vids uh, that I could uh, show that are a uh, kind of demonstration of some of the things I was talking about. If any point you guys want to check that out, I can share those. Uh, you know, just trying to, you know, just things we want to discuss, etc. Yeah, yeah, if you want to. And then, actually, who who else was... Uh oh, and Dan, Dan, you wanted to do a quick shout out for Maya's paper, also. Yeah, so if you guys haven't, no, yeah, I'm unmuted. If so you want to put it up, right. I can put it up. Let's do that real quick. Yeah, we, we this won't won't take long. I'm not going to go in, in too depth with it. Do you want me to sh screen share it or do? Yeah, it? yeah, go for it. Or yeah, so that's to? Maya Benowitz. Dan emailed me about her uh, a few days ago, and she's having. She has some personal stuff that she is a little distracted with, but we hope to see her. 
And she's pretty cool. She has the TARDIS on her Twitter feed, all sorts of time travel stuff. And the math that she does okay. is like, it just hurt looking at it. Can you guys see this? Uh, here, I'll, I'll, there we go. All right. Is this up? Yeah. Yeah, it's up now. Okay. Okay. So I, I just can't see it on my screen. So uh, this came out on uh, the, the beginning of the week. Um, she put out this paper. Um, I'm not going to go too in depth in it um, other than she's basically beat me to what I've been doing um, with the, like the, the poly multi, polar multiverse dimension and finding um, uh, Einstein's equation in, uh, in a, from the wave function in an Everettian context. And it's really actually genius what she's doing here because she's assuming or she's starting with the Wheeler DeWitt equation instead of the regular um, non relativistic Schrodinger equation, which is very interesting. And I, I'm not going to waste you guys' time going too in depth in this, other than say that you guys should really go and read this, this paper. Um, and I'll just, at, I'll kind of highlight here what what she kind of comes to in her conclusion. The Everettian field theory does not prohibit a traversial multiverse. This begs the profound question, can we split time in two different directions? Um, is, is assuming the, the decoherence of timelines uh, with a fine-tuned antimatter reaction, which kind of speaks to um, uh, like uh, the polarizable vacuums of matter, and matter pairs that a lot of you guys are working with, uh, to warping the quantum nature of a uh, uh, of space-time into shapes of our design to explore the many worlds. Will humanity one day uh, find a world out there? Or uh, will we one day find our way to them? If quantum universality is true and the multiverse exists, then there exist worlds where future humans master the quantum nature of space-time to travel, quote-unquote, past adjacent light cones and uh, a form of time travel within the multiverse. So if this is possible... And where are they? So you can kind of see where she's starting to extend the, the where she's. I, I think she's going to be extending the, the the Fermi paradox to um, UAP in the the multiversal context here, which is, if if you guys saw my talk last month, uh, is basically what I've been doing um, is uh, working out a way for uh, warp drive navigation. Um, if we're taking multiverse, yeah, if we're taking. Uh, Superluminal travel seriously. Uh, how, how do you get around um, the, the different paradoxes that are assumed to that? And that, again, just go go and read this paper. Uh, for those of you who are well enough versed to be able to keep up with the math, it's she's she's on the right track. I will stop sharing it there. So yeah, then that, that that's all that's all I got. Wanna I'll go more into it when I have a better understanding of things. Awesome. Thank you, Dan. Yeah, well, I guess it's open discussion now. So if anybody has anything. And if you guys don't have anything, we can close it down for the evening too. This has been one heck of a day. Uh, I got an old video from, from yeah. a couple of years ago if anybody want to watch early days of the Drew and Charlie show. Yeah, I'd say go for it, man. And then Shiva, do you have some videos you wanted to show? Yeah, I was just going to demonstrate a couple of the different things I had mentioned during my talk that, uh, you know, are better, you know, taken well, in when they're... <laughs> yeah, I would say, do you, do you know how to share? Do you know how to do a yeah, screen share? Yeah, I'm sharing one right now. And then we'll we'll do Drews after that. Sure. Should be able to see it there anyway. I got about four different little videos here that are uh, great for demonstrating the uh, various things I was mentioning. Mm. Is it showing up there for you? Not yet. Well, I, I do have it in sharing. I can stop it and restart it. Let's do that. See if that yeah, try, try that. Boring. 
Maybe it's a browser permissions thing. It should tell you. Oh, it, it's showing it down there for me. Uh, let's see. Let me just reshare it and maybe it'll pop up for you. There we go. Uh, all right. That's, let's see. You're showing there? Okay, let me hit the play on that. So yeah, no, uh, this no. is a video I put out by uh, John Bush and my team and uh, just kind of demonstrating some of the, uh, the effects of the uh, silicone walkers and uh, some of the history behind it. This is the most um, like succinct video they put out about the the walkers. And uh, he's going to show a little video here where he just takes out the frames. And so it looks like it's hovering. It's not actually hovering. It's just not every other, um, you know, if, every few frames, it's just showing the, the top of the bounce. But uh, but basically, this is showing how these these walkers will uh, infinitely bounce on top of a fluid. And uh, as part of the, the, the fluid dynamics, when the when there is a... Um, a pool that's driven and so it's, it's pushed along by its guiding wave so this is a demonstration of the way in which a uh, pilot wave works where there is uh, there's both a um an energy in the bath itself and then the the waves that are created by the the walkers bouncing uh, are all part of the part and parcel in the system the way in which they they uh determine their own future uh and so it's a it's a really interesting uh way in which determinism kind of shows this this implication of the unit in uh, the in determining, the, you know, what the future outcome will be. Now, here's the uh, here's the the walker as it just explores the corral. Looks completely random whenever you're watching it over a short period of time. However, as you watch it over a long enough period of time, the result of a superposition of the waves is that you end up seeing uh, you start seeing a, a pattern, and uh, and you see the the guiding wave field is the um, Faraday wave mode of the cavity. Um, so yeah, just those, it shows the uh, velocity fluctuations and here he's, um, showing the, you know, the uh, probability distribution. So in other words, the probability of finding the droplet in any one of those locations is the same thing as finding the, the, the probability of finding an electron within its electron cloud that is, you know, part of a, um, uh, you know, the, the shapes of these wave equations. And so that's, that's where he's drawing the analogy here. Now, this is a very early on and uh there's a lot more uh, that you can check out here but uh, he's just uh, you know got the most succinct um version of that now uh, if you allow me uh, three more videos if that's all right uh, i can show you some of these others real quick let me drop that one and pop in the next one oops not that it's the wrong button <laughs> share screen and uh let's show you so once you can pop that back up there for me, I'll um, show you what I'm talking about here with uh, standing waves inside of a um, inside of a single droplet. So let me uh, hit play on that. There we go. Okay, what we're looking at here is just a single droplet of water that um, is being vibrant. And then when you reach the right combination of frequency and amplitude, the droplet will start to resonate within its own cavity that it's that's created by the the uh, border that is you know defined by the droplet itself. So there's nothing really amazing about the you know the effect that you're seeing. However, what the the effects um, once you start to look at them, when you hit these these appropriate resonances, are that there is first of all there's rotation. So you see the toroidal rotation. If you look at the little, you can see a um, a bubble in there that's moving along with it. But there's not just a, a simple toroid inside this, as you'll see in just a moment. It's going to transition to an image where there are particles flowing within it. And what you'll see as the particles flow inside this is that it creates a uh, what looks like the d orbital of the uh, the electron in, uh, in hydrogen. And that's going to transfer here in just a moment. So if it gets to that, it's very interesting. So you'll see there are two, two vortices uh, like going like this, and then two vortices going like this. So there's there, there are multiple vortices within the, this, this toroidal figure that are embedded within it. And uh, then as uh, I'm going to go ahead and try to just move this along to a little bit later where you see some of the other uh, frequencies. Now he talks about some instabilities and how when you uh, hit certain frequencies that are not the appropriate uh, combination of frequency and amplitude. Uh, but then some of the things that you'll see are, you know, you can get any, any uh, variety of regular figures will show up here. And of course, inside this regular figure, there are vortices, which are uh, going alongside those, those regular, um, 
pulsations that you're seeing there. So this is the, the, the effect that I was talking about when it comes to wave vortex interaction and the, the creation of a cavity through these uh, these resonance effects. So that's, um, that is called the Faraday wave mode. That is what you're seeing there occurring is it's part of Faraday wave mode, but they, you know, they, in cymatics, they don't, they just call it a cymatic figure or something to that effect. So that, that you, you get, uh, I think you get the idea there. Um, then let's go ahead and switch to the next one, if you don't mind. And let me stop that and present another one. So, um, have you tried freezing water well under those vibrations? Have you tried like? I'm I'm not the experimenter that does that. There's a there's a few of them. That, that guy he's a, a German uh, experimenter. I've forgotten his name. But you he's have to flash well freeze it with liquid nitrogen or something. You know. Yeah, yeah there's some there's some neat uh, things that they've they've done with cymatics that they're not not relating to the the, the uh, pilot wave hydrodynamics model and so that's one of the, the parallels that i've been trying to make people see is that this you know you have in pilot wave hydrodynamics at mit with you know john bush and all that these these things that we're seeing is kind of a fringe science to where it was kind of artistic you know it's with cymatics they didn't really you know necessarily understand what it was that we're getting at here scientifically well here you have a a relationship between the two in the the faraday wave mode and understanding what it is that those the, that they're that they're creating and how it can uh, impact something that is meaningful when it comes to quantum mechanics, for instance. Uh, so here's the uh, reversible laminar flow experiment. There we go. Okay. Yeah. Sorry Perfect. about that. And uh, let me go ahead and hit the play button on it. So this is what I was talking about when conceiving of dimensions in other ways. And uh, and what we're going to see here is that they can put these these droplets in this fluid. Let's see if I can speed it up. I hope it, I hope it'll. It'll speed up for me if I hit these. Is it is it wanting to? Oh, I probably shouldn't have done that. Looks like sharing it and hitting these these things messed me up. Oh, there we go. Okay, so he'll put in these three droplets, red and blue and green, probably. This is a bit of a slow one, unfortunately. Uh, so I'm going to jump ahead and uh, get to where he's mixing it up. So you see him. He'll he start spinning this this thing. And there's a, there's a variety of these you can find out there in the re reversible laminar flow experiments. So the idea here that I want you to see, and then he'll, he'll reverse it. I don't want to take too much longer here, so I'm going to keep going through it. And as he reverses it, you'll see that the droplets are completely recovered. And uh, and so what I'm, what I'm talking about here is this is to demonstrate what uh, David Bohm called implicate and explicate order. And that is a different way of seeing the idea of additional dimensions, as that those droplets when they appeared mixed, were in they still existed just in a different dimension, and so that under, that understanding of dimensions that they are here and present and part of this reality simply is just a different mixture of this reality is a uh, is a way of seeing the um, that whole effect. So let me uh, change that over. Stop on that. And I got one more, and this is the uh, talking about the structure of the vacuum that a lot of people have never seen this it's a really neat little effect uh i discovered this fella uh who made the, these videos a while back and uh I've, I've never seen anybody else point this out so what he's done here is uh he's taken and created what are called heel shell plates where he's taken a ferro fluid and pressed it between two plates lit it from the side and what he's done is he's created a novel visualization of, uh, of magnetic fields. And, uh, and what I contend is what he's showing here that, uh, you know, I've seen that you can visualize it in a few other ways. And generally what you see are these um, uh, figures that are like, uh, I guess, you know, golden spirals, et cetera, uh, is that there is a, that there is a microstructure to space that was, you know, first talked about by, uh, you know, Maxwell, when he was describing Maxwell's equations, he talked about these, uh, that you have to have idle wheels. And what he's talking about there is whenever you have um, layers that are moving across each other in a fluid, and the, what will happen is the the vertical motion that is, you know, in other words, the what keeps them, what allows them to move against each other is that there has to be some sort of vertical motion that occurs. And that can be tremendously smaller than the than the laminar flow layers and so this is the this is what you know uh, big worlds lead to little worlds uh, sort of thing if you've ever heard that little ditty for uh, you know when it comes to hydrodynamics it uh, basically describes that um, uh, vortices will break down 
to the to smaller and smaller levels. But then there's also a mechanism by which vertices can add back together and become larger ones. And so it's just a it's just an interesting um, method of visualizing what may be a microstructure to the vacuum that uh, we might at some point be able to exploit in some way. So that was it. Awesome. Okay. Oh, there we go. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, this is really exciting stuff. And this, I've actually heard, I mean, very rudimentary variations on what you're talking about, Shiva. So this whole vortex dynamics, and then Einstein's unified field theory was based on torsion, right? Which is spin. So it all kind of comes back to spin. But... Okay. Well, guys, I think if if anybody doesn't have anything else, maybe we should consider shutting things down for this evening. This has been. Yeah, I, I actually, you guys wore me out. I'm exhausted, but in an amazing way. This is so much been drinking from the fire hose. So, Kim, let me uh, let me throw something up. Just, just thirty seconds. Oh yeah, yeah. Go go for it, Drew. Go for it. Okay. Theoretically, it's happening. Uh, hold hold on. There we go. Look. Okay. The, this was this was back in uh, 2019, and I'm gonna I I sped it up tenfold because otherwise it would you know painfully slow to watch this five minutes, but this is about a uh, hundred micronewtons worth of thrust, hanging from a wire, uh, self-contained power supply, that was actually working. Um, this was this was super early on. Like again, the, those two thrusters are making a total of about 100 micronewtons of thrust. And when it's on, it would go against the torsion. And when you turned it off, it would go right back to where it was. Anyhow. That's what got us excited, was a couple of pieces of uh, epoxy and some metal plates shoved against some styrofoam and we were off to the races that's amazing <clears throat> and you the stuff you're working with now is so much more efficient so much more powerful oh yeah we're we're in the 10 millinewton range now so yeah trip down memory lane wonderful well, guys, why don't we why don't we close things down for today? Then I think everybody's kind of slowed down. Um, this has been amazing, an amazing APEC presentation. Thank you all. Thank you so much, and thank you to everyone in the audience and everyone who's contributing ideas. And again, I mean, what what, what I've been seeing, kind of looking at it from a distance, is all of this is moving forward, and that's a tribute to your guys' hard work and perseverance and just dedication. So you're making this dream a reality, right? And it's like we're seeing it move forward every day, and that's that's so exciting. That is truly exciting. So so thank you. Thank you to everyone. Thank you. Yeah, yeah we definitely will, won't get there uh, listening to Neil deGrasse Tyson uh, or these, these celebrities. <laughs> No, I think, but I think Apparently we're you that. won't get I there. We are getting you that. won't get there waiting for NASA either. No, no, we got to do it on our okay. own. It will not happen. We're on the path. I'm going to close things, right. things down now. Night. Good night. All right, thanks.